Book One, Chapters One through Five of Against Genovianius by Saint Jerome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Very few days have elapsed since the Holy Brethren of Rome sent to me the treatises of a certain Jovinian with the request that I would reply to the follies contained in them, and would crush with evangelical and apostolic vigor the Epicurus of Christianity. I read them, but could not in the least comprehend them. I began, therefore, to give them closer attention, and to thoroughly sift not only words and sentences, but almost every single syllable, for I wished first to ascertain his meaning, and then to approve or refute what he had said. But the style is so barbarous, and the language so vile, and such a heap of blunders, that I could neither understand what he was talking about, nor by what arguments he was trying to prove his points. At one moment he is all bombast, at another he grovels. From time to time he lifts himself up, and then, like a wounded snake, finds his own effort too much for him. Not satisfied with the language of men, he attempts something loftier. The mountains labor, a poor mouse is born, that he's gone mad, even mad, Orestes swears. Moreover, he involves everything in such an inextricable confusion that the saying of Plautus might be applied to him. This is what none but a syllable will ever read. To understand him, we must be prophets. We must read Apollo's raving prophetesses. We remember, too, what Virgil says of senseless noise. Heraclitus also, surnamed the obscure, the philosophers find hard to understand, even with their utmost toil. But what are they compared with our riddle-maker, whose books are much more difficult to comprehend than to refute? although we must confess the task of refuting them is no easy one. For how can you overcome a man when you are quite in the dark as to his meaning? But not to be tedious to my reader, the introduction to his second book, of which he has discharged himself, like a sod after a night's debauch, will show the character of his eloquence, and through what bright flowers of rhetoric he takes his stately course. I respond to your invitation, not that I may go through life with a high reputation, but may live free from idle rumor. I beseech the ground, the young shoots of our plantations, the plants and trees of tenderness, snatched from the whirlpool of vice, to grant me audience and the support of many listeners. We know that the church, through hope, faith, charity, is inaccessible and impregnable. In it no one is immature. All are apt to learn. None can force a way into it by violence, or deceive it by craft. What I ask is the meaning of these portentous words, and of this grotesque description. Would you not think he was in a feverish dream, or that he was seized with madness and ought to be put into the straitjacket, which Hippocrates described? However often I read him, even till my heart sinks within me, I am still in uncertainty of his meaning. Everything starts from, everything depends on, something else. It is impossible to make out any connection, and accepting the proofs from Scripture, which he has not dared to exchange for his own lovely flowers of rhetoric, his words suit all manner equally well, because they suit no matter at all. This circumstance led me shrewdly to suspect that his object in proclaiming the excellence of marriage was only to disparage virginity. But when the less is put upon a level with the greater, the lower profits by comparison, but the higher suffers wrong. For ourselves, we do not follow the views of Marcion and Manichaeus and disparage marriage, nor deceive by the airy of Chation, the leader of the Ancretites, do we think all intercourse impure. He condemns and rejects not only marriage, but also food which God created for the use of man. We know that in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earthenware, and that upon the foundation Christ, which Paul the master builder laid, some build gold, silver, precious stones, others, on the contrary, hay, wood, straw. We are not ignorant of the words, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But we have read God's first command, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. But while we honor marriage, we prefer virginity, which is the offspring of marriage. Will silver cease to be silver if gold is more precious than silver? Or is despite done to tree and corn, if we prefer the fruit to root and foliage, or the grain to stock and ear. Virginity is to marriage what fruit is to the tree, or grain to the straw. 
although the hundredfold, the sixtyfold, and the thirtyfold spring from one earth and from one sowing, yet there is a great difference in respect of number. The thirtyfold has reference to marriage. The very way the fingers are combined, see how they seem to embrace, tenderly kiss, and pledge their troth either to other, is a picture of husband and wife. The sixtyfold applies to widows because they are placed in a position of difficulty and distress. Hence the upper finger signifies their depression, and the greater the difficulty in resisting the allurements of pleasure once experienced, the greater the reward. Moreover, give good heed, my reader, to denote a hundred. The right hand is used instead of the left. A circle is made with the same fingers, which on the left hand represent widowhood, and thus the crown of virginity is expressed. In saying this, I have followed my own impatient spirit, rather than the course of the argument. For I had scarcely left harbor, and had barely hoisted sail, when a swelling tide of words suddenly swept me into the depths of the discussion. I must stay my course, and take in canvas for a little while. Nor will I indulge my sword, anxious as it is to strike a blow for virginity. The farther back the catapult is drawn, the greater the force of the missile. To linger is not to lose, if by lingering victory is better assured. I will briefly set forth our adversary's views, and I will drag them out from his books like snakes from the holes where they hide, and will separate the venomous head from the writhing body. What is baneful shall be discovered, that when we have the power it may be crushed. He says that virgins, widows, and married women, who have been once passed through the laver of Christ, if they are on par in other respects, are of equal merit. He endeavors to show that they who, with full assurance of faith, have been born again in baptism, cannot be overthrown by the devil. The third point is that there is no difference between abstinence from food and its reception with thanksgiving. The fourth and last is that there is one reward in the kingdom of heaven for all who have kept their baptismal vow. This is the hissing of the old serpent. By counsel such as this, the dragon drove man from paradise, for he promised that if they would prefer fullness to fasting, they should be immortal, as though it were an impossibility for them to fall. And while he promises that they shall be gods, he drives them from paradise, with the result that they who, while naked and unhampered, and as virgins unspotted, enjoy the fellowship of the Lord, were cast down into the veil of tears, and sewed skins together to close themselves with all. But not to detain the reader any longer, I will keep to the division given above, and taking his propositions one by one, will rely chiefly on the evidence of Scripture to refute them, for fear he may chatter and complain that he was overcome by rhetorical skill rather than by force of truth. If I succeed in this, and with the aid of a cloud of witnesses from both testaments prove too strong for him, I will then accept his challenge, and adduce illustrations from secular literature. I will show that even among philosophers and distinguished statesmen, the virtuous are wont to be preferred by all to the voluptuous. That is to say, men like Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristides, to Aristippus, Epicurus, and Alcibiades. I entreat virgins of both sexes, and all such as are continent, the married also, and the twice married, to assist my efforts with their prayers. Jovian is the common enemy, for he who maintains all to be of equal merit does no less injury to virginity in comparing it with marriage than he does to marriage when he allows it to be lawful, but to the same extent as second and third marriages. But to diamists and trigamists also he does wrong, for he places on level with them whoremongers and the most licentious persons as soon as they have repented. For perhaps those who have been married twice or thrice ought not to complain, for the same whoremonger, if penitent, is made equal in the kingdom of heaven even to virgins. I will therefore explain more clearly, and in proper sequence, the arguments he employs and the illustrations he adduces respecting marriage, and will treat them in the order in which he states them. And I beg the reader not to be disturbed if he is compelled to read Jovian's nauseating trash. He will all the more gladly drink Christ's antidote after the devil's poisonous concoction. Listen with patience, ye virgins. Listen, I pray you, to the voice of the most voluptuous of preachers. Nay, rather, close your ears, as you would, to the siren's fabled songs, and pass on. For a little while you endure the wrongs you suffer, 
think you are crucified with Christ and are listening to the blasphemies of the Pharisees. First of all, he says, God declares that therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Unless we should say that this is a quotation from the Old Testament, he asserts that it has been confirmed by the Lord in the gospel. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And he immediately adds, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He next repeats the names of Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Mesuzalah, Lamech, Noah, and tells us that they all had wives, and in accordance with the will of God, begat sons, as though there could be any table of descent or any history of mankind without wives and children. There, says he, is Enoch, who walked with God and was carried up to heaven. There is Noah, the only person who, except his wife and his sons and their wives, was saved at the deluge, although there must have been many persons not of marriageable age, and therefore presumably virgins. Again, after the deluge, when the human race started as it were anew, men and women were paired together, and a fresh blessing was pronounced on procreation. Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Moreover, free permission was given to eat flesh. Every moving thing that liveth shall be food for you. As the green herb have I given you all. He then flies off to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who from the first had three wives, the second one, the third four, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpha. And he declares that Abraham, by his faith, merited the blessings which he had received in begetting his son. Sarah, typifying the church, when it had ceased to be with her after the manner of women, exchanged the curse of barrenness for the blessing of childbearing. We are informed that Rebekah went like a prophet to inquire of the Lord, and was told, Two nations and two peoples are in thy womb, that Jacob served for his wife, and that when Rachel, thinking it was in the power of her husband to give her children, said, Give me children, or else I die. He replied, I am in God's stead. Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So well aware was he that the fruit of marriage cometh from the Lord, and not from the husband. We next learn that Joseph, a holy man of spotless chastity, and all the blessed patriarchs had wives, and that God blessed them all alike through the lips of Moses. Judah also and Thamar are brought upon the scene, and he censures Onan, slain by the Lord, because he, grudging to raise up seed to his brother, marred the marriage rite. He refers to Moses and the leprosy of Miriam, who, because she chided her brother on account of his wife, was stricken by the avenging hand of God. He praises Samson, I may even say extravagantly panegorizes the exorious Nazarite. Deborah also and Barak are mentioned, because, although they had not the benefit of virginity, they are victorious over the iron chariots of Sisera and Jabin. He brings forward Jael, the wife of Herber, the Kenite, and extols her for arming herself with the stake, he says that there was no difference between Jephthah and his virgin daughter, who was sacrificed to the Lord. Nay, of the two, he prefers the faith of the father to that of the daughter, who met death with grief and tears. He then comes to Samuel, another Nazarite of the Lord, who from infancy was brought up in the tabernacle, and was clad in a linen ephod, or, as the words are rendered, in linen vestments. He too, we are told, begat sons without a stain upon his priestly purity. He places Boaz and his wife Ruth side by side in his repository, and traces the descent of Jesse and David from them. He then points out how David himself, with a price of two hundred foreskins and at the pearl of his life, was bedded with the king's daughter. What shall I say of Solomon, whom he includes in his list of husbands that represents as a type of the Savior? containing that of him it is written, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. And to him shall be given the gold of Sheba, and men shall pray for him continually. Then all at once he makes a jump to Elijah and Elisha, and tells us a great secret, that the spirit of Elijah rested on Elisha. Why he mentioned this he does not say. It can hardly be that he thinks Elijah and Elisha, like the rest, were married men. The next step is to Hezekiah, upon whose praises he dwells. And yet, I wonder why, 
forgets to mention that he said, Henceforth I will beget children. He relates that Josiah, a righteous man, in whose time the book of Deuteronomy was found in the temple, was instructed by Huldah, wife of Shalom. Daniel also and the three youths are classed by him with the married. Suddenly he betakes himself to the gospel and adduces Zechariah and Elizabeth, Peter and his father-in-law, and the rest of the apostles. His inference is thus expressed. If they idly urge in defense of themselves the plea that the world in its early stage needed to be replenished, let them listen to the words of Paul. I desire, therefore, that the younger widows marry, bear children, and marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled and a wife is bound so long time as her husband liveth but if the husband be dead she is free to be married to whom she will only in the lord and adam was not beguiled but the woman being beguiled hath fallen into transgression but she shall be saved through the childbearing if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with sobriety Truly we shall hear no more of the famous apostolic utterance, and they who have wives as though they had not. It can hardly be that you will say the reason why he wished them to be married was that some widows had already turned back after Satan, as though virgins never fell and their fall was not more ruinous. All this makes it clear that in forbidding to marry and to eat food which God created for use, you have consciousnesses seared as with the hot iron, and our followers of the Manichaeans. Then comes much more, which would be unprofitable to discuss. At last he dashes into rhetoric and apostrophizes virginity thus. I do you no wrong, virgin. You have chosen a life of chastity on account of the present distress. You determined on the course in order to be holy in body and spirits. Be not proud. You and your married sisters are members of the same church. End of Book 1, Chapters 1 through 5. Book 1, Chapters 6 through 10 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I have perhaps explained his position at too great a length and become tedious to my reader, but I thought it best to draw up in full array against myself all his efforts and to muster all the forces of the enemy with their squadrons and generals, lest after an early victory there should spring up a series of other engagements. I will not therefore do battle with single foes, nor will I be satisfied with skirmishes in which I meet small detachments of my opponents. A battle must be fought with the whole army of the enemy, and the disorderly rabble fighting more like brigands than soldiers must be repulsed by the skill and method of regular warfare. In the front rank I will set the Apostle Paul, and since he is the bravest of generals, will arm him with his own weapons, that is to say, his own statements. For the Corinthians asked many questions about this matter, and the doctor of the Gentiles and the master of the church give full replies. What he decreed we may regard as the law of Christ speaking in him. At the same time, when we begin to refute the several arguments, I trust the reader will give me his attention even before the Apostle speaks, and will not in his eagerness to discuss the most weighty points neglect the premises and rush all at once to the conclusion. Among other things, the Corinthians asked in their letter whether after embracing the faith of Christ they ought to be unmarried, and for the sake of continence put away their wives, and whether believing virgins were at liberty to marry. And again, supposing that one of the two Gentiles believed on Christ, whether the one that believed should leave the one that had believed not. And in case it were allowable to take wives, would the apostle direct that only Christian wives or Gentiles also should be taken? Let us then consider Paul's replies to these inquiries. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of fornications, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife her due, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be by consent for a season, that ye may give yourselves unto prayer, and may be together again, that Satan tempts you not because of your inconstancy. 
But this I say by way of permission, not of commandment. Yet I would that all men were, even as I myself. Howbeit each man hath his own gift from God, one after this manner, and another after that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, It is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they have not constancy, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Let us turn back to the chief point of evidence. It is good, he says, for a man not to touch a woman. If it is good not to touch a woman, it is bad to touch one, for there is no opposite to goodness but badness. But if it be bad and the evil is pardoned, the reason for the concession is to prevent worse evil. But surely a thing which is only allowed because there may be something worse has only a slight degree of goodness. He would never have added that each man have his own wife unless he had previously used the words, but because of fornications. Do away with fornication, and he will not say, let each man have his own wife. Just as though one were to lay it down, it is good to feed on wheaten bread, and to eat the finest wheat flour, and yet to prevent a person pressed by hunger from devouring cow dung, it may allow him to eat barley. Does it follow that the wheat will not have its particular purity, because such a one prefers barley to excrement? That is naturally good, which does not admit of comparison with what is bad. It is not eclipsed because something else is preferred. At the same time, we must notice the apostle's prudence. He did not say it is good not to have a wife, but it is good not to touch a woman, as though there were danger even in the touch, as though he who touched her would not escape from her who hunteth for the precious life, who causeth the young man's understanding to fly away. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk upon hot coals and his feet not be scorched? As then he who touches fire is instantly burned, so by the mere touch the particular nature of man and woman is perceived, and the difference of sex is understood. Heathen fables relate how Mithras and Erichthonius were begotten of the soil, in stone or earth, by raging lust. Hence it was that our Joseph, because the Egyptian woman wished to touch him, fled from her hands, and, as if he had been bitten by a mad dog and feared the spreading poison, threw away the cloak which he had touched. But because of fornications, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. He did not say, because of fornication, let each man marry a wife. Otherwise, by this excuse, he would have thrown the reins to lust, and whenever a man's wife died, he would have to marry another to prevent fornication but have his own wife. Let him, he says, have and use his own wife, whom he had before he became a believer, and whom it would have been good not to touch, and when once he became a follower of Christ, to know only as a sister, not as a wife, unless fornication should make it excusable to touch her. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. The whole question here concerns those who are married men. Is it lawful for them to do what our Lord forbade in the gospel, and to put away their wives? Whence it is, the apostle says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But inasmuch as he who is once married has no power to abstain, except by mutual consent, it may not reject an unoffending partner. Let the husband render unto his wife her due. He bound himself voluntarily that he might be under compulsion to render it. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be by consent for a season, that ye may give yourselves unto prayer. What, I pray you, is the quality of that good thing which hinders prayer, which does not allow the body of Christ to be received? So long as I do the husband's part, I fail in continency. The same apostle in another place commands us to pray always. If we are to pray always, it follows that we must never be in bondage of wedlock, for as often as I render my wife her due, I cannot pray. The Apostle Paul had experience of the bonds of marriage. See how he fashions the church, and what lesson he teaches Christians. Ye husbands, in like manner, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Give honor unto the woman, as unto the weaker vessel, as being also joint heirs of the grace of life, to the end that your prayers be not hindered. Observe that, as St. Paul before because in both cases the Spirit is the same, so St. Peter now, 
says that prayers are hindered by the performance of marriage duty. When he says likewise, he challenges the husbands to imitate their wives because he has already given them commandments. Beholding your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing jewels of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and the incorrupt apparel of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. You see what kind of wedlock he enjoins. Husbands and wives are to dwell together according to knowledge, so that they may know what God wishes and desires, and give honor to the weak vessel woman. If we abstain from intercourse, we give honor to our wives. If we do not abstain, it is clear that insult is the opposite of honor. He also tells the wives to let their husbands see their chaste behavior, and the hidden man of the heart in the incorruptible apparel of a meek and quiet spirit. Words truly worthy of an apostle and of Christ's rock. He lays down the law for husbands and wives, condemns outward ornament, while he praises continence, which is the ornament of the inner man, as seen in the incorrupt apparel of a meek and quiet spirit. In effect, he says this, Since your outer man is corrupt, and you have ceased to possess the blessings of incorruption, characteristic of virgins, at least imitate the incorruption of the spirit by subsequent abstinence, and what you cannot show in the body exhibit in the mind. For these are the riches, and these are the ornaments of your union which Christ seeks. The words which follow, that ye may give yourselves unto prayer, and may be together again, might lead one to suppose that the apostle was expressing a wish, and not making concession because of the danger of a great fall. He therefore at once adds, lest Satan tempt you for your inconstancy. It is a fine permission which is conveyed in the words, be together again. What it was that he blushed to call by his own name, and thought only better than a temptation of Satan, and the effect of incontinence. We take trouble to discuss as if it were obscure, although he has explained his meaning by saying, this I say by way of permission, not by way of command. And do we still hesitate to speak of marriage as a concession to weakness, not a thing commanded, as though second and third marriages were not allowed on the same ground, as though the doors of the church were not opened by repentance, even to fornicators? And what is more, to the incestuous, take the case of the man who outraged his stepmother. Does not the apostle, after delivering him in his first epistle to the Corinthians, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved, in the second epistle, take the offender back and strive to prevent a brother from being swallowed up by overmuch grief. The apostle's wish is one thing, his pardon another. If a wish be expressed, it confers a right. If a thing is only called pardonable, we are wrong in using it. If you wish to know the apostle's real mind, you must take in what follows. But I would that all men were as I am. Happy is the man who is like Paul. Fortunate is he who attends to the apostle's command, not to his own concession. This he says, I wish, this I desire, that ye be imitators of me, as I am also of Christ, who was a virgin born of a virgin, uncorrupt of her who was uncorrupt. We, because we are men, cannot imitate our Lord's nativity, but we may at least imitate his life. The former was the blessed prerogative of divinity. The latter belongs to our human condition and is part of human effort. I would that all men were like me, that while they are like me, they may also become like Christ, to whom I am like. For he that believeth in Christ ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Howbeit each man hath his own gift from God, one after this manner and another after that. What I wish, he says, is clear. But since in the church there is a diversity of gifts, I acquiesce in marriage, lest I should seem to condemn nature. At the same time consider that the gift of virginity is one, that of marriage another. For were the reward the same for the married and for virgins, you would never, after enjoining continence, have said, Each man hath his own gift from God, one after this manner and another after that. Where there is distinction in one particular, there is a diversity also in other points. I grant that even marriage is a gift of God, but between gift and gift there is great diversity. In fact, the apostle himself, speaking of the same person 
who had repented of his incestuous conduct, says, So that contrawise ye should rather forgive him and comfort him, and to whom ye forgive anything I forgive also. And that we might not think a man's gift contemptible, he adds, For what I also have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, for your sakes have I forgiven it, in the presence of Christ. There is diversity in the gifts of Christ. Hence it is that by way of type, Joseph has a coat of many colors. And in the 45th Psalm we read, At thy right hand doth stand the queen in a vesture of gold, wrought about with diverse colors. And the Apostle Peter says, As heirs together of the manifold grace of God. Where the more expressive Greek word, polikitis, i.e. varied, is used. Then come the words, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, It is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they have not constancy, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Having conceded to married persons the enjoyment of wedlock and pointed out his own wishes, he passes on to the unmarried and to widows, sets before them his own practice for imitation, and calls them happy if they so abide. But if they have not constancy, let them marry just as he said before, but because of fornications, and least Satan tempts you because of your incontinency. And he gives a reason for saying, If they have not continency, let them marry, viz. it is better to marry than to burn. The reason why it is better to marry is that it is worse to burn. Let burning lust be absence, and he will not say it is better to marry. The word better always implies a comparison was something worse, not a thing absolutely good and incapable of comparison. It is as though, he said, it is better to have one eye than neither. It is better to stand on one foot and to support the rest of the body with a stick than to crawl with broken legs. What do you say, apostle? I do not believe you when you say, though I be rude in speech, yet am I not in knowledge, as humility is the source of the sayings for I am not worthy to be called an apostle, and to me who am the least of the apostles, and as to one born out of due time. So here also we have an utterance of humility. You know the meaning of the language, or you would not quote Epimendus, Neander, and Aratus. When you are discussing continence and virginity, you say, It is good for a man not to touch a woman, and it is good for them if they abide even as I. And I think that this is good by reason of the present distress, and that it is good for a man so to be. When you come to marriage, you do not say it is good to marry, because you cannot then add than to burn. But you say, it is better to marry than to burn. If marriage in itself be good, do not compare it with fire, but simply say, it is good to marry. I suspect the goodness of that thing which is forced into the position of being only the lesser of two evils. What I want is not a smaller evil, but a thing absolutely good. So good, the first section has been explained. Let us now come to those which follow. But unto the married I give charge, yea, not I, but the Lord, that the wife depart not from her husband. But if she depart, let her husband remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband leave not his wife. But to the rest say I, not the Lord. If any brother hath an unbelieving wife, and she is content to dwell with him, let him not leave her. And so on to the words, As God hath called each, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all the churches. This passage has no bearing on our present controversy. For he ordains, according to the mind of the Lord, that accepting the cause of fornication, a wife must not be put away, and that a wife who has been put away may not, so long as her husband lives, be married to another, or at all events, that her duty is to be reconciled to her husband. But in the case of those who are already married at the time of conversion, that is to say, supposing that one of the two were a believer, he enjoins that the believer shall not put away the unbeliever. And after stating his reason, viz., that the unbeliever, who is unwilling to leave the believer, becomes thereby a candidate for the faith. He commands, on the other hand, that if the unbeliever reject the faithful one on account of the faith of Christ, the believer ought to depart, lest husband or wife be preferred to Christ. 
In comparison with him, we must hold even life itself cheap. At the present day, many women despising the apostles' command are joined to heathen husbands and prostitute the temples of Christ to idols. They do not understand that they are part of his body, though indeed they are his ribs. The apostle is lenient to the union of unbelievers who, having believing husbands, afterwards come to believe in Christ. He does not extend this indulgence to those women who, although Christians, have been married to heathen husbands. To these elsewhere, he says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness and iniquity? Or what communion hath light with darkness? In what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what portion hath a believer with an unbeliever? In what agreement hath a temple of God with idols? For we are a temple of the living God. Although I know that crowds of matrons will be furious against me, although I know that just as they have shamelessly despised the Lord, so they will rave at me who am but a flea and the least of Christians, yet I will speak out what I think. I will say what the apostle has taught me, that they are not on the side of righteousness, but of iniquity, not of light, but of darkness, that they do not belong to Christ, but Belial, that they are not temples of the living God, but shrines and idols of the dead. And if you wish to see more clearly how utterly unlawful it is for a Christian woman to marry a Gentile, consider what the same apostle says. A wife is bound for so long time as her husband liveth. But if a husband be dead, she is free to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord, that is, to a Christian. He who allows second and third marriages in the Lord forbids first marriages with a Gentile. Once Abraham also makes his servant swear upon his thigh, that is, on Christ, who was to spring from his seed, that he would not bring an alien born as a wife for his son Isaac. And Ezra checked an offense of this kind against God by making his countrymen put away their wives. And the prophet Malachi thus speaks, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loveth, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, him that teacheth and him that learneth out of the tents of Jacob, and him that offers an offering unto the Lord of hosts. I have said this, that they who compare marriage with virginity may at least know that such marriages as these are on a lower level than bigamy and triamy. End of Book 1, Chapters 6 through 10. Chapters 11 through 15 of Against Novianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the above discussion, the Apostle has taught that the believer ought not to depart from the unbeliever, but remain in marriage as the faith found them, and that each man, whether married or single, should continue as he was then baptized into Christ. And then he suddenly introduces the metaphors of circumcision and uncircumcision, of bond and free, and under those metaphors treats of the married and unmarried. Was any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let each man abide in the calling wherein he was called. Was thou called being a bondservant? Care not for it. Then even if thou canst become free, use it rather. For he that was called in the Lord, being a bondservant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he that was called being free is Christ's bondservant. Ye were bought with a price. Become not bondservants of men. Brethren, let each man, wherein he was called, therein abide with God. Some, I suppose, will find fault with the apostles' way of reasoning. I would therefore ask first what we are to infer from his suddenly passing in a discussion concerning husbands and wives to a comparison of Jew and Gentile, bond and free, and then returning when this point is settled to the question about virgins, and telling us, concerning virgins I have no commandment from the Lord. What has the comparison of Jew and Gentile, bond and free, to do with wedlock and virginity? In the next place, how are we to understand the words, hath any been called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. 
can a man who has lost his foreskin restore it again at his pleasure? Then, in what sense are we to explain? For he that was called in the Lord, being a bondservant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he that was called being free is Christ's bondservant. Fourthly, how is it that he who commanded servants to obey their masters according to the flesh now says, Become not bondservants of men? Lastly, how are we to connect with slavery or with circumcision his saying, Brethren, let each man wherein he was called therein abide with God, which even contradicts his previous opinion. We heard him say, Become not bondservants of men. How can we then possibly abide in the vocation wherein we were called? When many at the time they became believers had masters according to the flesh, whose bondservants they are now forbidden to be. Moreover, what has the argument about our abiding in the vocation wherein we were called to do with circumcision? For in another place, the same apostle cries aloud, Behold, I, Paul, tell you, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. We must conclude, therefore, that a higher meaning should be given to circumcision and uncircumcision, bond and free, and that these words must be taken in close connection with what has gone before. Was anyone called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. If he says, at the time you were called and became a believer in Christ, if I say you were called being circumcised from a wife, that is, unmarried, do not marry a wife, that is, do not become uncircumcised, lest you lay upon the freedom of circumcision and chastity the burden of marriage. Again, if anyone was called an uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. If you had a wife, he says, when you believed, do not think the faith of Christ a reason for disagreement, because God has called us in peace. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. For neither celibacy nor marriage availeth anything without works. Since even faith, which is specially characteristic of Christians, if it have not works, is said to be dead. And vestal virgins and Juno's widows might upon these terms be numbered with the saints. Let each man, in the vocation wherein he was called, therein abide, whether he had or had not a wife when he believed. Let him remain in that condition in which he was when called. Accordingly, he does not so strongly urge virgins to be married as forbid divorce. And as he debars those who have wives from putting them away, so he cuts off from virgins the power of being married. Thou wast called being a slave? Heed it not. But even if thou canst become free, use it rather. Even if you have, he says, a wife, and are bound to her, and pay her due, and have not power over your own body, or if, to speak more clearly, you are the bondservant of your wife, be not sad upon that account, nor sigh for the loss of your virginity. But even if you can find some cases of discord, do not for the sake of thoroughly enjoying the liberty of chastity seek your own welfare by destroying another. Keep your wife a while, and do not go too fast for her lagging footsteps. Wait till she follows. If you are patient, your spouse will become a sister. For he that was called in the Lord, being a bondservant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he that was called being free is Christ's bondservant. He gives his reasons for not wishing wives to be forsaken. He therefore says, I command that Gentiles who believe on Christ do not abandon the married state in which they were before embracing the faith. For he who had a wife when he became a believer is not so strictly devoted to the service of God as virgins and unmarried persons. But, in a manner, he has more freedom, and the reins of his bondage are relaxed, and while he is the bondservant of a wife, he is, so to speak, the freedman of the Lord. Moreover, he who, when called by the Lord, had not a wife, and was free from the bondage of wedlock, he is truly Christ's bondservant. What happiness to be the bondservant, not of a wife, but of Christ, to serve not the flesh, but the spirit. For he who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. There was some fear that by saying, Wast thou called being a bondservant, care not for it. But even if thou canst become free, use it rather. He might seem to have flouted continence, and to have given us up to the slavery of marriage. 
He therefore makes a remark which removes all cavil. Ye were bought with a price, become not servants of men. We have been redeemed with the most precious blood of Christ. The Lamb was slain for us, and having been sprinkled with hyssop and the warm drops of his blood, we have rejected poisonous pleasure. Why do we, at whose baptism Pharaoh died, and all his host was drowned, again turn back in our hearts to Egypt, and after the manna, angel's food, cipher the garlic and the onions and the cucumbers and Pharaoh's meat? Having discussed marriage and continency, he at length comes to virginity and says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, but I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I think, therefore, that this is good by reason of the present distress, namely, that it is good for a man to be as he is. Here our opponent goes utterly wild with exultation. This is his strongest battering ram with which he shakes the wall of virginity. See, he says, the apostle confesses that as regards virgins, he has no commandment of the Lord. And he who had with authority laid down the law respecting husbands and wives does not dare to command what the Lord has not enjoined. And rightly too, for what is enjoined is commanded, and what is commanded must be done. And that which must be done implies punishment if it be not done. For it is useless to order a thing to be done and yet leave the individual free to do it or not to do it. If the Lord had commanded virginity, he would have seemed to condemn marriage and to do away with the seed plot of mankind, of which virginity itself is a growth. If he had cut off the root, how was he to expect fruit? If the foundations were not first laid, how was he to build the edifice and put on the roof to cover all? Excavators toil hard to remove mountains. The bowels of the earth are pierced in the search for gold. And when the tiny particles, first by the blast of the furnace, then by the hand of the cunning workman, have been fashioned into an ornament, men do not call him blessed who has separated the gold from the dross, but him who wears the beautiful gold. Do not marvel, then, if, placed as we are, amid temptations of the flesh and incentives to vice, the angelic life be not exacted of us, but merely recommended. If advice be given, a man is free to proffer obedience. If there be a command, he is a servant bound to compliance. I have no commandment, he says, of the Lord, but I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. If you have no commandment of the Lord, how dare you give judgment without orders? The apostle will reply, Do you wish me to give orders where the Lord has offered a favor rather than laid down a law? The great creator and fashioner, knowing the weakness of the vessel which he made, left virginity open to those whom he addressed. And shall I, the teacher of the Gentiles, who have become all things to all men, that I might seek gain? So I lay upon the necks of weak believers, from the very first, the burden of perpetual chastity. Let them begin with short periods of release from the marriage bond, and give themselves unto prayer. And when they have tasted the sweets of chastity, they may desire the perpetual possession of what, wherewith, they were temporarily delighted. The Lord, when tempted by the Pharisees, and asked whether, according to the law of Moses, it was permitted to put away a wife, forbade the practice altogether. After weighing his words, the disciples said to him, If the case of the man is so with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, but they to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs which are so born from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs which are made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs which made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. The reason is plain why the apostles said, Concerning virgins I have no commandment of the Lord. Surely because the Lord had previously said, All men cannot receive the word, but they to whom it is given. And he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. The master of the Christian race offers the reward, invites candidates to the course, holds in his hand the prize of virginity, points to the fountain of purity, and cries aloud, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. He does not say, You must drink, you must run, willing or unwilling. But whoever is willing and able to run and to drink, he shall conquer he shall be satisfied. 
And therefore, Christ loves virgins more than others, because they willingly give what was not commanded them. And it indicates greater grace to offer what you are not bound to give than to render what is exacted of you. The apostles, contemplating the burden of a wife, exclaimed, If the case of a man is so with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. Our lords thought well of their view. You rightly think, said he, that it is not expedient for a man who is hastening to the kingdom of heaven to take a wife. But it is a hard matter, and all men do not receive the saying, but they to whom it has been given. Some are eunuchs by nature, others by violence of men. Those eunuchs please me who are such not of necessity, but of free choice. Willingly do I take them into my bosom, who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, and in order to worship me, have renounced the condition of their birth. You must now explain the words, those who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. If they who have made themselves eunuchs have the reward of the kingdom of heaven, it follows that they who have not made themselves such cannot be placed with those who have. He who is able, he says, to receive it, let him receive it. It is a mark of great faith and of great virtue to be the pure temple of God, to offer oneself a whole burnt offering, and according to the same apostle, to be holy both in body and in spirit. These are the eunuchs, who, thinking themselves dry trees because of their impotence, hear by the mouth of Isaiah that they have a place prepared in heaven for sons and daughters. Their type is Elbed Melek, the eunuch in Jeremiah, and the eunuch of Queen Candace in the Acts of the Apostles, who, on account of the strength of his faith, gained the name of a man. These are they to whom Clement, who was the successor of the Apostle Peter, and of whom the Apostle Paul makes mention, wrote letters directing almost the whole of his discourse to the subject of virgin purity. After them, there is a long series of apostolic men, martyrs, and men illustrious no less for holiness than for eloquence, with whom we may very easily become acquainted through their own writings. I think, therefore, he says, that it is good for the present distress. What is this distress which, in contempt of the marriage tie, longs for the liberty of virginity? Woe well, unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. We have not here a condemnation of harlots and brothels. Of those damnation there is no doubt, but of the swelling womb and the wailing infancy, the fruit as well as the work of marriage. For it is good for a man so to be. If it is good for a man so to be, it is bad for a man not so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Each one of us has his appointed bounds. Let me have what is mine and keep your own. If thou art bound to a wife, give her not a bill of divorce. If I am loosed from a wife, I will not seek a wife, as I do not dissolve marriages once contracted. So you should not bind what is loosed. And at the same time, the meaning of the words must be taken into account. He who has a wife is regarded as a debtor, and he is said to be uncircumcised to be the servant of his wife, and like bad servants, to be bound. But he who has no wife in the first place owes no man anything, then is circumcised, thirdly is free, and lastly is loosed. Let us run through the remaining points, for our author is so voluminous that we cannot linger over every detail. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. It is one thing not to sin, another to do good. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Not that the virgin who has once for all dedicated herself to the service of God, for should one of these marry, she will have damnation, because she made of no account her first faith. But if her adversary objects that this saying relates to widows, we reply that it applies with still greater force to virgins, since marriage is forbidden even to widows whose previous marriage had been lawful. For virgins who marry after consecration are rather incestuous than adulterous. And for fear he should by saying, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned, again stimulate the unmarried to be married, he immediately checks himself by introducing another consideration, and validates his previous concession. Yet, says he, such shall have tribulation in the flesh. 
Who are they who shall have tribulation in the flesh? They to whom he had before indulgently said, But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Yet such shall have tribulation in the flesh. We, in our inexperience, thought that marriage had at least the joys of the flesh. But if they who are married have tribulation even in the flesh, which is imagined to be the sole source of their pleasure, what else is there to marry for, when in the spirit and in the mind and in the flesh itself there is tribulation? But I would spare you. Thus he says, I allege tribulation as a motive, as though there were not greater obligations to refrain. But this I say, brethren, the time is shortened, that henceforth both those that have wives may be as though they had none. I am by no means now discussing virgins, of whose happiness no one entertains a doubt. I am coming to the married. The time is short. The Lord is at hand. Even though we lived nine hundred years, as did men of old, yet we ought to think that short which must one day have an end and cease to be. But as things are, it is not so much the joy as the tribulation of marriage that is short. Why do we take wives whom we shall soon be compelled to lose? And those that weep, and those that rejoice, and those that buy, and those that use the world as though they wept not, as though they rejoice not, as though they bought not, as though they did not use the world, for the fashion of this world passes away. If the world which comprehends all things passes away, yea, if the fashion and intercourse of the world vanishes like the clouds, amongst the other works of the world, marriage too will vanish away, for after the resurrection there will be no wedlock. But if death be the end of marriage, why do we not voluntarily embrace the inevitable? And why do we not, encouraged by the hope of the reward, offer to God that which must be wrung from us against our will? He that is unmarried is careful for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married is careful for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and is divided. Let us look at the difference between the cares of the virgin and those of the married man. The virgin longs to please the Lord, the husband to please his wife, and that he may please her, he is careful for the things of the world, which will, of course, pass away with the world. And he is divided, that is to say, he is distracted with manifold cares and miseries. This is not the place to describe the difficulties of marriage and to revel in rhetorical commonplaces. I think I delivered myself fully as regards this point in my argument against Alvidius and in my book which I address to Eustochium. At all events, Tertullian, while still a young man, gave himself full play with this subject, and my teacher, Gregory of Nazianus, discussed virginity and marriage in some Greek verses. I now briefly beg my reader to note that in the Latin manuscripts we have the reading, there is a difference also between the virgin and the wife. The words, it is true, have a meaning of their own, and have by me, as well as by others, been so explained as showing the bearing of the passage. Yet they lack apostolic authority, since the apostles' words are as we have translated them. He is careful for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. Having laid down this, he passes to the virgins and the continents, and says, The woman that is unmarried and the virgin thinks of the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in body and spirit. Not every unmarried woman is also a virgin, but every virgin is, of course, unmarried. It may be that regard for elegance of expression led him to repeat the same idea by means of another word and speak of a woman unmarried and a virgin, or at least he may have wished to give to unmarried the definite meaning of virgin so that we might not suppose him to include harlots united to no one by the fixed bonds of wedlock among the unmarried. Of what then does she that is unmarried and a virgin think? The things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. Supposing there were nothing else, and that no greater reward followed virginity, this would be motive enough for her choice to think of the things of the Lord. But he immediately points out the contents of her thoughts, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. For there are virgins in the flesh, not in the spirit, whose body is intact, their soul corrupt. 
But that virgin is a sacrifice to God, whose mind has not been defiled by thought, nor her flesh by lust. On the other hand, she who is married thinks of the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Just as the man who has a wife is anxious for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, so the married woman thinks of the things of the world, how she may please her husband. We are not of this world, which lieth in wickedness, the fashion of which patheth away, and concerning which the Lord said to the apostles, If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. Unless perchance someone might suppose that he was laying the heavy burden of chastity on unwilling shoulders. He at once adds his reasons for persuading to it, and says, And this I say for your profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is seemly, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. The Latin words do not convey the meaning of the Greek. What words shall we use to render prosto ev kiron kai ev prostotron to kirio ape restarius? The difficulty of translation accounts for the fact that the clause is completely wanting in Latin manuscripts. Let us, however, use the passage as we have translated it. The apostle does not lay a snare upon us, nor does he compel us to be what we do not wish to be, but he gives his advice as to what is fair and seemly. He would have us attend upon the Lord and ever be anxious about that service, and await the Lord's will, so that like active and well-armed soldiers, we may obey orders, and may do so without distraction, which, according to Ecclesiastes, is given to men of this world that they may be exercised thereby. But if any one considers that his virgin, that is his flesh, is wanton and boiling with lust, it cannot be brittled. And he must do one of two things, either take a wife or fall. Let him do what he will. He does not sin if he marry. Let him do, he says, what he will, not what he ought. He does not sin if he marries a wife, yet he does not well if he marry. But he that standeth fast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power as touching his own will, and hath determined this in his own heart to keep his own virgin shall do well. So then, both he that giveth his own virgin in marriage doeth well, and he that giveth her not in marriage shall do better. With marked propriety, he had previously said, He who marries a wife does not sin. Here he tells us, He that keepeth his own virgin doeth well. But it is one thing not to sin, another to do well. Depart from evil, he says, and do good. The former we forsake, the latter we follow. In this last lies perfection. But whereas he says, And he that giveth his virgin in marriage doeth well, it might be supposed that our remark does not hold good. He therefore forthwith detracts from this seeming good and puts it in the shade by comparing it with another and saying, And he that giveth her not in marriage shall do better. If he had not intended to draw the inference of doing better, he would never have previously referred to doing well. But where there is something good and something better, the reward is not in both cases the same. And where the reward is not one and the same, there, of course, the gifts are different. The difference, then, between marriage and virginity is as great as that between not sinning and doing well. Nay, rather, to speak less harshly, as great as between good and better. He that has ended his discussion of wedlock and virginity, and has carefully steered between the two precepts without turning to the right hand or to the left, he has followed the royal road and fulfilled the command not to be righteous over much. Now again he compares monogamy with digogamy, and as he had subordinated marriage to virginity, so he makes second marriages inferior to the first, and says, A wife is bound for so long time as her husband liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is free to be married, to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she abide as she is, after my judgment. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. He allows second marriages, but to such persons as wish for them and are not able to contain, lest... Having waxed wanton against Christ, they desire to marry 
having condemnation because they have rejected their first faith. And he makes the concession because many had already turned aside after Satan. But, says he, they will be happier if they abide as they are. And he immediately adds the weight of the apostolic authority, after my judgment. And that an apostle's authority might not, like that of an ordinary man, be without weight, he added, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. When he incites to continence, it is not the judgment or spirit of man, but by the judgment and spirit of God. When, however, he grants the indulgence of marriage, he does not mention the spirit of God, but weighs his judgment with wisdom and adapts the severity of the strain to the weakness of the individual. In this sense, we must take the whole of the following passage. For the woman that hath an husband is bound by law to the husband while he liveth. But if the husband dies, she is discharged from the law of the husband. So then, if, while the husband liveth, she be joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she be joined to another man. And similarly, the words to Timothy, I desire, therefore, that the younger widows marry, bear children, rule the household, give none occasion to the adversary for reviling, for already some are turned aside after Satan, and so on. For as on account of the danger of fornication, he allows virgins to marry and makes that excusable, which in itself is not desirable, so to avoid this same fornication, he allows second marriages to widows. For it is better to know a single husband, though he be a second or third, than to have many paramours. That is, it is more tolerable for a woman to prostitute herself to one man than to many. At all events, this is so if the Samaritan woman in John's Gospel, who said that she had her sick husband, was reproved by the Lord because he was not her husband. For where there are more husbands than one, the proper idea of a husband who is a single person is destroyed. At the beginning, one rib was turned into one wife, and they too, he says, shall be one flesh not three or four. Otherwise, how can they be any longer two if they are several? Lamech, a man of blood and a murderer, was the first who divided one flesh between two wives. For natricide and digamy were abolished by the same punishment, that of the deluge. The one was avenged seven times, the other seventy times seven. The guilt is as widely different as are the numbers. What the holiness of a second marriage is, appears from this, that a person twice married cannot be enrolled in the ranks of the clergy, and so the apostle tells Timothy, let none be enrolled as a widow under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. The whole command concerns those widows who are supported on the alms of the church. The age is therefore limited, so that those only may receive the food of the poor who can no longer work. And at the same time, consider that she who has had two husbands, even though she be a widow, decrepit, and in want, is not a worthy recipient of the church's funds. But if she be deprived of the bread of charity, how much more is she deprived of that bread which cometh down from heaven, and of which if a man eat unworthily, he shall be guilty of outrage offered to the body and the blood of Christ. The passages, however, which I have adduced in support of my position, and in which it is permitted Two widows, if they so desire to marry again, are interpreted by some concerning those widows who had lost their husbands and were found in that condition when they became Christians. For supposing a person baptized and her husband dead, it would not be consistent if the apostle were to bid her marry another when he enjoins even those who have wives to be as though they had them not. And this is why the number of wives which a man may take is not defined, because When Christian baptism has been received, even though a third or fourth wife has been taken, she is reckoned as the first. Otherwise, if after baptism and after the death of the first husband a second is taken, why should not a sixth after the death of the third, fourth, and fifth, and so on? For it is possible that through some strange misfortune or by the judgment of God, cutting short repeated marriages, a young woman may have several husbands, while an old woman may be left a widow by her first husband in extreme age. The first Adam was married once, the second was unmarried. 
but the supporters of second marriages show us as their leader a third Adam who was twice married. But granted that Paul allowed second marriages, upon the same grounds it follows that he allows even third and fourth marriages, or a woman may marry as often as her husband dies. The apostle was forced to choose many things which he did not like. He circumcised Timothy and shaved his own head, practiced going barefoot, let his hair grow long, cut it at Centurie. And he had certainly chastised the Galatians and blamed Peter because, for the sake of Jewish observances, he separated himself from the Gentiles. As then in other points connected with the discipline of the church, he was a Jew to the Jews, a Gentile to the Gentiles, and was made all things to all men, that he might gain all. So too he allowed second marriages to incontinent persons, and did not limit the number of marriages in order that women, although they saw themselves permitted to take a second husband, in the same way as a third or fourth was allowed, might blush to take a second. At least they should be compared to those who were three or four times married. If more than one husband be allowed, it makes no difference whether he be a second or third, because there is no longer a question of single marriage. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. I do not condemn second nor third, nor pardon the expression eighth marriages. I will go still further and say that I welcome even a penitent whoremonger. Things that are equally lawful must be weighed in an even balance. End of chapters 10 through 15 of book 1. Book 1, chapters 16 through 20 of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But he takes us to the Old Testament and, beginning with Adam, goes on to Zacharias and Elizabeth. He next confronts us with Peter and the rest of the apostles. We are therefore bound to traverse the same course of argument and show that chastity was always preferred to the condition of marriage. But as regards Adam and Eve, we must maintain that before the fall they were virgins in paradise. But after they sinned and were cast out of paradise, they were immediately married. Then we have the passage, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall become one flesh. In explanation of which the apostle straightway adds, This mystery is great, but I speak in regard of Christ and of the church. Christ in the flesh is a virgin, in the spirit he is once married, for he has one church, concerning which the same apostle says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. If Christ loves the church wholly, chastely, and without spot, let husbands also love their wives in chastity, and let every one know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, as the Gentiles who know not God. For God called us not for uncleanness, but in sanctification, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his doings, and have put on the new man, which is being renewed unto knowledge, after the image of him that created him, where there cannot be male and female, Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bodman, freeman, but Christ is all and in all. The link of marriage is not found in the image of the Creator. When difference of sex is done away, and we are putting off the old man and putting on the new, then we are being born again into Christ a virgin, who was both born of a virgin and is born again through virginity. And whereas he says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, it was necessary first to plant the wood and to let it grow, so that there might be an aftergrowth for cutting down. And at the same time, we must bear in mind the meaning of of the phrase, replenish the earth. Marriage replenishes the earth. Virginity fills paradise. This too we must observe, at least if we would faithfully follow the Hebrew, that while the scripture on the first, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth day relates that, having finished the works of each, God saw that it was good. On the second day, it admitted this altogether, leaving us to understand that two is not a good number because it destroys unity and prefigures the marriage compact. Hence it was that all the animals which Noah took into the ark by pairs were unclean. Odd numbers denote cleanness, and yet by the double number is represented another mystery, that not even in the beasts and unclean birds is second marriage approved. For unclean animals went in two and two, and clean ones by sevens, so that Noah, 
after the flood, might be able to immediately offer to God sacrifices from the latter. But if Enoch was translated and Noah was preserved at the deluge, I do not think that Enoch was translated because he had a wife, but because he was the first to call upon God and to believe in the Creator. And the Apostle Paul fully instructs us concerning him in the epistle to the Hebrews. Noah, moreover, was preserved as a kind of second root for the human race, must, of course, be preserved together with his wife and sons. Although in this there is a scripture mystery. The ark, according to the Apostle Paul, was a type of the church in which eight souls were saved. When Noah entered into it, both he and his sons were separated from their wives. But when he landed from it, they united in pairs, and what had been separated in the ark, that is, in the church, was joined together in the inner course of the world. And at the same time, if the ark had many compartments and little chambers, and was made with second and third stories, and was filled with different beasts, and was furnished with dwellings, great or small, according to the kind of animal, I think all this diversity in the compartments was a figure of the manifold character of the church. He raises the objection that when God gave his second blessing, permission was granted to eat flesh, which had not, in the first benediction, been allowed. He should know that just as divorce, according to the Savior's word, was not permitted from the beginning, but on account of the hardness of our heart was the concession of Moses to the human race, so too the eating of flesh was unknown until the deluge. But after the deluge, like the quails given in the desert to the murmuring people, the poison of flesh meat was offered to our teeth. The apostle writing to the Ephesians teaches that God had purposed in the fullness of time to sum up and renew in Christ Jesus all things which are in heaven and on earth. Whence also the Savior himself in the Revelation of John says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. At the beginning of the human race, we neither ate flesh nor gave bills of divorce nor suffered circumcision for a sign. Thus we reached the deluge. But after the deluge, Together with the giving of the law, which no one could fulfill, flesh was given for food, and divorce was allowed to hard-hearted men, and the knife of circumcision was applied, as though the hand of God had fashioned us with something superfluous. But once Christ has come in the end of time, and Omega passed into Alpha and turned the end into the beginning, we are no longer allowed to divorce, nor are we circumcised, nor do we eat flesh. For the Apostle says, it is good not to eat flesh, nor to drink wine. For wine, as well as flesh, was consecrated after the deluge. What shall I say of Abraham, who had three wives, a Juvenianius says, and received circumcision as a sign of his faith? If we follow him in the number of his wives, let us also follow him in circumcision. We must not partly follow, partly reject him. Isaac, moreover, the husband of one wife, Rebekah, prefigures the church of Christ and reproves the wantonness of second marriage. And if Jacob had two pairs of wives and concubines, and our opponent will not admit that blear-eyed Leah, ugly and prolific, was a type of the synagogue, but that Rachel, beautiful and long barren, indicated the mystery of the church, let me remind him that when Jacob did this thing, he was among the Assyrians and in Mesopotamia, in bondage to a hard master. When he wished to enter the Holy Land, he raised on Mount Galid a heap of witness, in token that the Lord of Mesopotamia had failed to find anything among his baggage, and there swore that he would never return to the place of his bondage. And when, after wrestling with the angel at the brook of Jabbok, he began to limp, because the great muscle of his thigh was withered, he at once gained the name of Israel. Then the wife whom he once loved and for whom he had served was slain by the son of sorrow near Bethlehem, which was destined to be the birthplace of our Lord, the herald of virginity, and the intimacies of Mesopotamia died in the land of the gospel. But I wonder why he said Judah and Tamar before us for an example, unless perchance even harlots give him pleasure, or Onan, who was slain because he begrudged his brother's seed, does he imagine that we approve of any sexual intercourse except for the procreation of children? As regards Moses, it is clear that he would have been in peril at the inn if Sephira, which is by interpretation a bird, had not circumcised her son and cut off the foreskin of marriage with the knife which prefigured the gospel. 
This is that Moses, who when he saw a great vision and heard an angel, or the Lord speaking in the bush, could not by any means approach to him without first loosing the latchet of his shoe, that is, putting off the bonds of marriage. But we need not be surprised at this in the case of one who was a prophet, lawgiver, and the friend of God, seeing that all the people when about to draw nigh to Mount Sinai and to hear the voice speaking to them were commanded to sanctify themselves in three days and keep themselves from their wives. I am speaking out of order in violating historical sequence, but I may point out that the same thing was said by Abimelech, the priest to David, when he fled to Nob. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered, Of a truth, about these three days. For the showbread, like the body of Christ, might not be eaten by those who rose from the marriage bed. And in passing, we ought to consider the words, If only the young men have kept themselves from women. The truth is that, in view of the purity of the body of Christ, all sexual intercourse is unclean. In the law also, it is enjoined that the high priest must not marry any but a virgin, nor must he take to wife a widow. If a virgin and a widow are on the same level, how is it that one is taken and the other rejected? And the widow of a priest is bidden by and in the house of her father and not to contract a second marriage. If the sister of a priest dies in virginity, just as the priest is commanded to go to the funeral of his father and mother, so must he go to hers. But if she be married, she is despised, as though she belong not to him. He who has married a wife, and he who has planted a vineyard, an image of the propagation of children, is forbidden to go to the battle. For he who is the slave of his wife cannot be the Lord's soldier. And the laver in the tabernacle was cast from the mirrors of the women who fasted, signifying the bodies of pure virgins. And within, in the sanctuary, both the cherubim and the mercy seat, and the ark of the covenant, and the table of showbread, and the candlestick, and the censer, were made of the purest gold, for silver might not be brought into the holy of holies. End of chapters 16 through 20 from Book 1Book 1, chapters 21 through 25, of Against Jovinianus by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I must not linger over Moses, but my purpose is at full speed to lightly touch on each topic and to sketch the outline of a proper knowledge of my subject. I will pass to Joshua the son of Nun, who was previously called Aus, or better in the Hebrew, Osi, that is, Savior. For he, according to the epistle of Jude, saved the people of Israel and led them forth out of Egypt and brought them into the land of promise. As soon as this Joshua reached the Jordan, the waters of marriage, which had ever flowed in the land, dried up and stood in one heap. And the whole people, barefooted and on dry ground, crossed over and came to Gilgal. And there was a second time circumcised. If we take this literally, we cannot possibly stand. For if we had two foreskins, or if another could grow after the first was cut off, there would be room for the speaking of a second circumcision. But the meaning is that Joshua circumcised the people who had crossed the desert with the gospel knife, and he circumcised them with a stone knife, that what in the case of Moses' son was befigured in a few might under Joshua be fulfilled in all. Moreover, the very foreskins were heaped together and buried and covered with earth. And the fact that the reproach of Egypt was taken away, in the name of the place Gilgal, which is by interpretation Revelation, show that while the people wandered in the desert, uncircumcised, their eyes were blinded. Let us see what follows. After this gospel circumcision and the consecration of twelve stones at the place of Revelation, the Passover was immediately celebrated. A lamb was slain for them, and they ate the food of the Holy Land. Joshua went forth and was met by the prince of the host, sword in hand, that is, either to show that he was ready to fight for the circumcised people or to sever the tie of marriage. And in the same way that Moses was commanded, so was he, loose thy shoe, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. For if the armed host of the Lord was represented by the trumpets of the priests, we may see in Jericho a type of the overthrow of the world 
by the preaching of the gospel, and pass over endless details, for it is not my purpose now to unfold all the mysteries of the Old Testament. The five kings who previously reigned in the land of promise and opposed the gospel army were overcome in battle with Joshua. I think it is clearly to be understood that before the Lord led his people from Egypt and circumcised them, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch had the dominion. And that to these, as to the five princes, everything was subject. And when they took part in the cave of the body and in the place of darkness, Jesus entered the body itself and slew them, that the source of their power might be the instrument of their death. But it is now time for us to raise the standard of Joshua's chastity. It is written that Moses had a wife. Now Moses is interpreted both by our Lord and by the Apostle to mean the law. They have Moses and the prophets, and death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression. And no one doubts that in both passages, Moses signifies the law. We read that Moses, that is the law, had a wife. Show me then in the same way that Joshua, the son of Nun, had either wife or children. And if you can do so, I will confess that I am beaten. He certainly received the fairest spot in the division of land of Judah and died in the twenties, which are ever unlucky in scripture. But them are reckoned by the years of Jacob's service, the price of Joseph and sundry presents, which Esau, who was fond of them, received. But in the tens, whose praises we have often sung, and he was buried in tamnoth Sar, that is, most perfect sovereignty, or among those of a new covering, to signify the crowds of virgins covered by the Savior's aid on Mount Ephraim, that is, the fruitful mountain, on the north of the mountain of Gaash, which is being interpreted disturbance. For Mount Zion is on the sides of the north, the city of the great king, is ever exposed to hatred, and every trial says, but my feet had well nigh slipped. The book which bears the name of Joshua ends with his burial. Again in the book of Judges we read of him as though he had risen and come to life again, and by way of summary his works are extolled. We read too, so Joshua sent the people away, every man unto his inheritance, that they might possess the land. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and so on. There immediately follows, and Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. Moses, moreover, only saw the land of promise. He could not enter, and he died in the land of Moab. And the Lord buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher until this day. Let us compare the burial of the two. Moses died in the land of Moab, Joshua in the land of Judah. The former was buried in a valley over against the house of Fogor, which is being interpreted reproach. For the Hebrew Forgor corresponds to Priapos, the latter in Mount Ephraim on the north of Mount Gaash. And in the simple expressions of the sacred scriptures, there is always a more subtle meaning. The Jews gloried in children and in childbearing, and the barren woman who had not offspring in Israel was accursed. But blessed was he whose seed was in Zion and his family in Jerusalem. And part of the high blessing was, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine in the innermost parts of thy house, thy children like olive plants round thy table. Therefore his grave is described as placed in a valley over against the house of an idol, which was in a special sense consecrated to lust. But we who fight under Joshua, our leader, even to the present day, know not where Moses was buried. For we despise Fogor and all his shame, knowing that they who are in the flesh cannot please God. And the Lord before the flood had said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for that he also is flesh. Wherefore, when Moses died, the people of Israel mourned for him, but Joshua, like one on his way to victory, was unmourned. For marriage ends at death, virginity thereafter begins to wear the crown. Next he brings forward Samson, and does not consider that the Lord's Nazarite was once shaven, bald by a woman. 
And although Samson continued to be a type of the Savior because he loved a harlot from among the Gentiles, which harlot corresponds to the church, and because she slew more enemies in his death than he did in his life, yet he does not set an example of conjugal chastity, and he surely reminds us of Jacob's prophecy. He was shaken by his runaway steed, bitten by an adder, and fell backwards. But why he enumerated Deborah and Barak, and the wife of Herber the Kenite, I am at a loss to understand. For it is one thing to draw up a list of military commanders in historical sequence, another to indicate certain figures of marriage, which cannot be found in them. And whereas he prefers the fidelity of the father Jephthah to the tears of the virgin daughter that makes for us, for we are not commending virgins of the world so much as those who are virgins for Christ's sake. And most Hebrews blame the father for the rash vow he made. If thou wilt indeed deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, it shall be for the Lord, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Supposing, they say, a dog or an ass had met him, what would he have done? Their meaning is that God so ordered events that he who had and providently made a vow, should learn his error by the death of his daughter. And if Saul, who was brought up in the tabernacle, married a wife, how does that prejudice virginity? As if at the present day also there were not many married priests, and as though the apostle did not describe a bishop as the husband of one wife, having children with purity, at the same time we must not forget that Samuel was a Levite, not a priest or high priest, Hence it was that his mother made for him a linen ephod, that is, a linen garment to go over the shoulders, which was the proper dress of the Levites and of the inferior order. And so he is not named in the Psalms among the priests, but among those who call upon the name of the Lord. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. For Levi begat Kohath, Kohath begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Korath, Korath begat Asir, Asir begat Elkanah, Elkanah begat Zoph, Zoph begat Tahath, Tahath begat Eliel, Eliel begat Jerome, Jerome begat Elkanah, Elkanah begat Samuel. And no one doubts that the priests sprang from the stock of Aaron, Eleazar and Phinehas. And seeing that they had wives, they would be rightly brought against us, if led away by the error of the Anchorites, we were to maintain that marriage deserves censure. And our high priests were not after the order of Melchizedek, without father, without mother, agene loetis, that is, unmarried. And much fruit truly did Samuel reap from his children, he himself pleased God, but begat such children as displeased the Lord. But if in support of second marriage he urges the instance of Boaz and Ruth, let him know that in the church, St. Matthew chapter 1, 6, to typify the church, even Rahab, the harlot, is reckoned among our Lord's ancestors. He boasts that David bought his wife for two hundred foreskins, but he should remember that David had numerous other wives, and afterwards received Michal, Saul's daughter, whom her father had delivered to another, and when he was old got heat from the embrace of the Shumanite maiden. Now, I do not say this because I am bold enough to disparage holy men, but because it is one thing to live under the law, another to live under the gospel. David slew Uriah the Hittite and committed adultery with Bathsheba, and because he was a man of blood, the reference is not, as some think, to his wars, but to the murder. He was not permitted to build the temple of the Lord. But as for us, if we cause one of the least to stumble, and if we say to a brother Raka, or use our eyes improperly, if it were good that a millstone were hanged about our neck, we shall be in danger of Gehenna, and a mere glance will be reckoned to us for adultery. He passes on to Solomon, through whom wisdom itself sang its own praises. Seeing that, not content with dwelling upon his praises, 
He calls him Auxurius. I am surprised that he did not add the words of the canticles. There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines and maidens without number, and those of the first book of kings. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and others without number. These are they who turned away his heart from the Lord. And yet before he had many wives, he fell into sins of the flesh. At the beginning of his reign, and in his early years, he built a temple to the Lord. For every one is judged not by what he will be, but for what he is. But if Jovinianus approves the example of Solomon, he will no longer be in favor of second and third marriages only, but unless he has seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, he cannot be the king's antitype or attain to his merit. I earnestly again and again remind you, my reader, that I am compelled to speak as I do, and that I do not disparage our predecessors under the law, but am well aware that they served their generation according to their circumstances, and fulfilled the Lord's command to increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And what is more, they were figures of those that were to come. But we to whom it is said, the time is shortened, that henceforth those who have wives be as though they had none, have a different command. And for us, virginity is consecrated by the virgin Savior. What folly it was to include Elijah and Elisha in the list of married men is plain without a word from me. But since John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and John was a virgin, it is clear that he came not only in Elijah's spirit, but also in his bodily chastity. Then the passage relating to Hezekiah might be adduced, although Jovinianus, with his wanton stupidity, did not notice it, in which, after his recovery, and the addition of fifteen years to his life, he said, Now I will beget children. It must be remembered, however, that in the Hebrew texts, the passage is not so, but runs thus. The father to the children shall make known thy faithfulness. Nor need we wonder that Huldah, the prophetess, and the wife of Shalom, was consulted by Josiah, the king of Judah, when the captivity was approaching, and the wrath of the Lord was falling upon Jerusalem since it is the rule of Scripture when holy men fail to praise women to the reproach of men. And it is superfluous to speak of Daniel. For the Hebrews to the present day affirm the three youths were eunuchs in accordance with the declaration of God, which Isaiah uttered to Hezekiah. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And again in Daniel we read, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring in certain of the children of Israel, even of the seed royal, and of the nobles, youth in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skilled in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science. The conclusion is then, if Daniel and the three youths were chosen from the seed royal, and if scripture foretold, that there should be eunuchs of the seed royal, these men were those who were made eunuchs. If he meets us with the argument that in Ezekiel it is said that Noah, Daniel, and Job in a sinful land could not free their sons and daughters, we reply that the words are used hypothetically. Noah and Job were not in existence at that time. We know that they lived many ages before. And the meaning is this. If there were such and such men in a sinful land, they shall not be able to save their own sons and daughters, because the righteousness of the father shall not save the son, nor shall the sin of one be imputed to another. For the soul that sinneth, it shall die. This too must be said, that Daniel, as the history of his book shows, was taken captive with King Joachim at the same time that Ezekiel was also led into captivity. How then could he have sons who was still a youth, and only three years had elapsed when he was brought in to wait upon the king? Let no one suppose that Ezekiel at this time remembers Daniel as a man, not as a youth. For it came to pass, he says, in the sixth year, that is of King Jehoiakim, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, and as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, 
Yet on that same day it was said to him, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, Daniel was therefore a youth and known to the people, either on account of his interpretation of the king's dreams, or on account of the release of Susanna, and the slaying of the elders. And it is clearly proved at the time these things were spoken of Noah, Daniel, and Job, Daniel was still a youth and could not have had sons and daughters whom he might save by his righteousness. So far concerning the law. End of Book 1, Chapters 21 through 25. Book 1, Chapters 26 through 30 of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coming to the Gospel, he sets before us Zacharias and Elizabeth, Peter and his mother in law, and with a shamelessness to which we have now grown accustomed, fails to understand that they too ought to have been reckoned among those who served the law. For the gospel had no being before the crucifixion of Christ. It was consecrated by his passion and by his blood. In accordance with this rule, Peter and the other apostles, I must give Juvenionius something now and then out of my abundance, had indeed wives. But those which they had taken before they knew the gospel, but once they were received into the apostolate, they forsook the offices of marriage. For when Peter, representing the apostles, says to the Lord, Lo, we have left all and followed thee, the Lord answered him, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or wife, or brethren, or parents, or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this time, and in the world to come eternal life. But if, in order to show that all the apostles had wives, he meets us with the words, Have we no right to lead about women or wives? For gene in Greek has both meanings. Even as the rest of the apostles and Cephas and the brethren of the Lord, let him add what is found in the Greek copies. We have no right to lead about women that our sisters are wives. This makes it clear that the writer referred to other holy women who, in accordance with Jewish custom, ministered to their teachers of their substance, as we read was the practice with even our Lord himself. Where there is a previous reference to eating and drinking, and the outlay of money, and mention is afterwards made of women that are sisters, it is quite clear, as we have said, that we must understand not wives, but those women who ministered of their substance. We read in the same accounts in the Old Testament of the Shumanites, who was wont to welcome Elisha, and to put for him a table and bread and a candlestick, and the rest. At all events, if we take Ganekos to mean wives, not women, the addition of the word sisters destroys the effect of the word wives, and shows that they were related in spirit, not by wedlock. Nevertheless, with the exception of the Apostle Peter, it is not openly stated that the Apostles had wives, and since the statement is made of one while nothing is said about the rest, we must understand that those of whom Scripture gives no such description had no wives. Yet Juvenianius, who has arrayed against us Zacharias and Elizabeth, Peter and his wife's mother, should know that John was the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth that is, a virgin was the offspring of marriage, the gospel of the law, chastity of matrimony, so that by a virgin prophet, the virgin Lord, might both be announced and baptized. We might say concerning Peter that he had a mother-in-law when he believed, and no longer had a wife, although in the sentences we read of both his wife and daughter. But for the present, our argument must be based wholly on Scripture, he has made his appeal to the apostles because he thinks that they who hold the chief authority in our moral system and are the typical Christian teachers were not virgins. If then we allow that they were not virgins, and with the exception of Peter, the point cannot be proved. Yet I must tell him that it is to the apostles that the words of Isaiah relate. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So then, they who were by birth Jews, 
could not under the gospel recover the virginity which they had once lost in Judaism. And yet John, one of the disciples, who was related to have been the youngest of the apostles, and who was a virgin when he embraced Christianity, remained a virgin, and on that account was more beloved of our Lord, and lay upon the breast of Jesus. And what Peter, who had a wife, did not dare ask, he requested John to ask. And after the resurrection, when Mary Magdalene told them that the Lord had risen, they both ran to the sepulchre, but John outran Peter. And when they were fishing in the ship on the lake of Gennesaret, Jesus stood upon the shore, and the apostles knew not who it was they saw. The virgin alone recognized a virgin, and said to Peter, It is the Lord. Again, after hearing the prediction that he must be bound by another, and led whither he would not, and must suffer on the cross, Peter said, Lord, what shall this man do? Being unwilling to desert John, with whom he had always been united, our Lord said to him, What is that to thee? if I wish him so to be. Whence the saying went abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Here we have a proof that virginity does not die, and that the defilement of marriage is not washed away by the blood of martyrdom. But virginity abides with Christ, and its sleep is not death, but a passing to another state. If, however, Jovinianius should obstinately contend that John was not a virgin, whereas we have maintained that his virginity was the cause of the special love our Lord bore to him, let him explain, if he was not a virgin, why it was that he was loved more than the other apostles. But you say the church was founded upon Peter, although elsewhere the same is attributed to all the apostles, and they all received the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and the strength of the church depends upon them all alike. Yet one among the twelve is chosen, so that when a head has been appointed, there be no occasion for schism. But why was not John chosen, who was a virgin? Deference was paid to age, because Peter was the elder. One who was a youth, I may say almost a boy, could not be set over men of advanced age. And a good master, who was bound to remove every occasion of strife among his disciples, and who had said to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, and he that is greater among you, let him be the least of all, would not be thought to afford cause of envy against the youth whom he had loved. We may be sure that John was then a boy because ecclesiastical history most clearly proves that he lived to the reign of Trajan, that is, he fell asleep in the 68th year after our Lord's Passion, as I have briefly noted in my treatise on illustrious men. Peter is an apostle, and John is an apostle, but the one a married man, the other a virgin. But Peter is an apostle only. John is both an apostle and an evangelist and a prophet. An apostle because he wrote to the churches as a master, an evangelist because he composed a gospel, a thing which no other apostles except Matthew did, a prophet, for he saw in the island of Patmos to which he had been banished by the emperor Domitian as a martyr for the Lord, an apocalypse concerning the boundless mysteries of the future. Tertullian, moreover, relates that he was sent to Rome, and that having been plunged into a jar of boiling oil, he came out fresher and more active than when he went in. But this very gospel is widely different from the rest. Matthew, as though he were writing of a man, begins thus, The Book of the Generation of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Luke begins with the priesthood of Zacharias, Mark with the prophecy of the prophets Malachi and Isaiah. The first has the face of a man, on account of the genealogical table, the second the face of a calf, on account of the priesthood, the third the face of a lion, on account of the voice of one crying in the desert, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. But John, like an eagle, soars aloft and reaches the Father himself, and says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and so on. The virgin writer expounded mysteries which the married could not. And to briefly sum up all, and to show how great was the privilege of John, or rather of virginity in John, the virgin mother was entrusted by the virgin Lord to the virgin disciple. 
But we toil to no purpose, for our opponent urges us against the apostolic sentence, and says, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not beguiled, but the woman being beguiled hath fallen into transgression. But she shall be saved through the childbearing. If they continue in faith and love and sanctification with sobriety. Let us consider what led the apostle to make this declaration. I desire, therefore, that the men pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. But in due course he lays down rules of life for the women, and says, in like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair, and gold or pearls, or costly raiment, but which becometh women professing godliness, through good works. Let a woman learn in quietness with all subjection, but I permit not a woman to teach, nor have dominion over a man, but to be in quietness, and that the lot of the woman might not seem a hard one, reducing her to the condition of a slave to her husband. The apostle recalls the ancient law, and goes back to the first example, that Adam was first made, then the woman out of his rib, and that the devil could not seduce Adam, but did seduce Eve, and that after displeasing God, she was immediately subjected to the man, and began to turn to her husband, and he points out that she who once tied with bonds of marriage was reduced to the condition of Eve, might blot out the old transgression by the procreation of children, provided, however, that she bring up the children themselves in the faith and love of Christ, and in sanctification and chastity, and we must not adapt the faulty reading of the Latin text, sobrietas and Castateus, that is, Sophronthroni, you should see how you are mastered by the witness of this passage also, and cannot be driven to admit that what you thought was on the side of marriage tells in favor of virginity. For if the woman is saved in childbearing, and the more the children, the greater the safety of the mothers, why did he add, if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with chastity? The woman will then be saved if she bear not children who will remain virgins. If what she has herself lost, she attains in her children and makes up for the loss and decay of the roots by the excellence of the flower and fruit. Above and passing, when our opponent adduced to Solomon, who, although he had many wives, nevertheless built the temple, I briefly replied that it was my intention to run over the remaining points now that he may not cry out that both Solomon and others under the law, prophets and holy men, have been dishonored by us. Let us show what this very man, with his many wives and concubines, thought of marriage. For no one can know better than he who suffered through them what a wife or woman is. Well then, he says in the Proverbs, the foolish and bold woman comes to want bread. What bread? Surely that bread which cometh down from heaven, and he immediately adds, The earthborn perish in her house, rush into the depths of hell. Who are the earthborn that perish in her house? They, of course, who follow the first Adam, who is of the earth, and not the second, who is from heaven. And again, in another place, like a worm in wood, so a wicked woman destroyeth her husband. But if you assert that this was spoken of bad wives, I shall briefly answer, what necessity rests upon me to run the risk of the wife I marry proving good or bad? It is better, he says, to dwell in a desert land than with a contentious and passionate woman in a wide house. How seldom we find a wife without these faults. He knows who is married. Hence that sublime orator, Marius Caminus, says well, The man who does not quarrel is a bachelor. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a contentious woman in a house in common. And a house common to husband and wife makes a wife proud and breeds contempt for the husband. How much more if the wife be the richer of the two, and the husband but a lodger in her house? She begins to be not a wife, but a mistress of the house. And if she offend her husband, they must part. A continual dropping on a wintry day turns a man out of doors, and so will a contentious woman drive a man from his own house. 
She floods his house with her constant nagging and daily chatter and ousts him from his own home, that is, the church. Hence the same Solomon previously commands, My son flows forth beyond. And the apostle, writing to the Hebrews, says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the thing spoken, lest haply we flow forth beyond. But who can hide from himself that is thus enigmatically expressed? The horse leech had three daughters, dearly beloved, but they satisfied her not, and the forge is not satisfied when you say enough. The grave, the woman's love, and the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire that saith not enough. The horse leech is the devil, the daughters of the devil are dearly beloved, and they cannot be satisfied with the blood of the slain. The grave and the woman's love, and the earth dry and scorched with heat. It is not the harlot, nor the adulteress who is spoken of, but woman's love in general is accused of ever being insatiable. Put it out, it bursts into flame, give it plenty, and it is again in need. It invenerates a man's mind, and engrosses all thought except for the passion which it feeds. What we read in the parable which follows is to the same effect. For three things the earth doth tremble, and four for which it cannot bear. For a servant when he is king, and a fool when he is filled with meat. For an odious woman when she is married to a good husband, and an handmaiden that is heir to her mistress. See how a wife is classed with the greatest evils. But if you reply that it is an odious wife, I will give you the same answer as before. The mere possibility of such danger is in itself no light matter. For he who marries a wife is uncertain whether he is marrying an odious woman or one worthy of his love. If she be odious, she is intolerable. If worthy of love, her love is compared to the grave, to the parched earth and to fire. Let us come to Ecclesiastes and adduce in a few corroborative passages from him also. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. We brought forth young under the law with Moses. Let us die under the gospel with Christ. We planted in marriage. Let us by chastity pluck up that which was planted. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. And at the same time, he warns us not to prefer the law to the gospel, nor to think that virgin purity is to be placed on a level with marriage. Better, he says, is the end of the thing than the beginning thereof. And he immediately adds, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. And he gives the reason why the latter days are better than the former, for wisdom with an inheritance is good. Under the law, carnal wisdom was followed by the sword of death. Under the gospel, an eternal inheritance awaits spiritual wisdom. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Behold, this only have I found, that God made man upright, that they have sought out many inventions, he says that he had found man upright. Consider the force of the words. The word man comprehends both male and female, but a woman, he says, among all these have I not found. Let us read the beginning of Genesis, and we shall find Adam, that is man, called both male and female. Having then been created by God, good and upright, by our own fault we have fallen into a worse condition and that which is in paradise has been upright. When we left paradise was corrupt. If you object that before they sinned, there was a distinction in sex between male and female, that they could not without sin have come together, it is uncertain what might have happened, for we cannot know the judgments of God and anticipate his sentence as we choose. What really happened is plain enough, that they who were in paradise remained in perpetual virginity, that they were expelled from paradise, were joined together. Or if paradise admits of marriage, and there is no difference between marriage and virginity, what prevented their previous intercourse even in paradise? 
they are driven out of paradise, and what they did not there, they do on earth, so that from the various early days of humanity, virginity was consecrated by paradise, and marriage by earth. Let thy garments always be white. The eternal whiteness of our garments is the purity of virginity. In the morning we sowed our seed, and in the evening let us not cease. Let us who serve marriage under the law serve virginity under the gospel. I pass to the Song of Songs, and whereas our opponent thinks it makes altogether for marriage, I shall show that it contains the mysteries of virginity. Let us hear what the bride says before that the bridegroom comes to the earth, suffers, descends to the lower world, and rises again. We will make forth the likeness of gold with ornaments of silver while the king sits at his table. Before the Lord rose again and the gospel shone, the bride had not gold but likeness of gold. As for the silver, however, which she professes to have at the marriage, she not only had silver ornaments, but she had them in variety, in widows, in the continent, and in the married. Then the bridegroom makes answer to the bride, and teaches her that the shadow of the old law has passed away, and the truth of the gospel has come. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. This relates to the Old Testament. Once more he speaks of the gospel and of virginity. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the pruning of vines has come. Does he not seem to you to say the very same thing that the apostle says? The time is shortened, and henceforth both those that have wives may be as though they had none. And more plainly does he herald chastity. The voice, he says, of the turtle is heard in our land. The turtle, the chastest of birds, always dwelling in lofty places, is a type of the Savior. Let us read the works of naturalists, and we shall find it is the nature of the turtle dove, if it lose its mates, not to take another. And we shall understand that the second marriage is repudiated even by dumb birds. And immediately the turtle says to its fellow, The fig tree hath put forth its green figs. That is, the commandments of the old law have fallen, and the blossoming vines of the gospel give forth their fragrance. Whence the apostle also says, We are a sweet savor of Christ. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the steep place. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Whilst thou coverest thy countenance like Moses, and the veil of the law remained, I neither saw thy face, nor did I condescend to hear thy voice. I said, Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. But now with unveiled face behold my glory, and shelter thyself on the cleft and steep places of the solid rock. On hearing this, the bride disclosed the mysteries of chastity. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth his flock among the lilies, that is, among the pure virgins. Would you know what sort of throne our true Solomon, the Prince of Peace, has, and what his attendants are like? Behold, he says, it is the litter of Solomon. Three score mighty men are about it, of the mighty men of Israel. They all handle the sword, and are expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh. They who are about Solomon have their sword upon their thigh, like Ehud, the left-handed judge, who slew the fattest of foes, a man devoted to the flesh, and cut short all his pleasures. I will get me, he says, to the mountain of myrrh, to those, that is, who have mortified their bodies, and to the hill of frankincense, to the crowds of pure virgins, and I will say to my bride, Thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. Whence to the apostle, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride, with me from Lebanon, Thou shalt come and pass on from the beginning of faith, from the top of Sinar and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Lebanon is, being interpreted, whiteness. Come then, fairest bride, concerning whom 
It is elsewhere said, Who is she that cometh up all in white, and pass on by the way of this world, from the beginning of faith and from Senar, which is by interpretation God of light? As we read in the psalm, Thy word is a lantern unto my feet, and a light unto my path, and from Hermon, that is, consecration, and flee from the lion's den, and the mountains of the leopards who cannot change their spots. Flee, he says, from lion's dens, flee from the pride of devils, that when thou hast been consecrated to me, I may be able to say unto thee, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. What he says is something like this. I do not reject marriage. You have a second eye, the left one, which I have given you on account of the weakness of those who cannot see the right. But I am pleased with the right eye of virginity, and if it is blinded, the whole body is in darkness. But that we might not think he had in view carnal love and bodily marriage, he at once excludes this meaning by saying, Thou hast ravished my heart, my bride, my sister. The name sister excludes all suspicion of unhallowed love. How fair are thy breasts with wine, those breasts considering which he had said above, My beloved is mine, and I am his. Betwixt my breast shall he lie. That is, in the princely portion of the heart, where the word of God has its lodging. What wine is that which gives beauty to the breasts of the bride, and fills them with the milk of chastity? That forsooth of which the bridegroom goes on to speak. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends. Yea, drink and be drunken, my brethren. Hence the apostles also were said to be filled with new wine. With new, he says, not with old wine, because new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and they did not walk in oldness of the letter, but in newness of the spirit. This is wine wherewith, when youths and maidens are intoxicated, they at once thirst for virginity, they are filled with the spirit of chastity, and the prophecy of Zechariah comes to pass. At least if we follow the Hebrew literally, for he prophesied concerning virgins, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. For what is his goodness, and what is his beauty, but the corn of the elect, and the wine that giveth birth to virgins? They are virgins of whom it is written in the 45th Psalm. The virgins, her companions, that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be led. They shall enter into the king's palace. End of chapters 26 through 30 from book 1. Book 1, chapters 31 through 35 of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Then follows, A garden shut up is my sister, my bride. A garden shut up, a fountain sealed. That which is shut up and sealed reminds us of the mother of our Lord, who was a mother and a virgin. Hence it was that no one before or after our Savior was laid in his new tomb, hewn in the solid rock. And yet she that was ever a virgin is the mother of many virgins. For next we read, Thy shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with precious fruits. By pomegranates and fruits is signified the blending of all virtues in virginity. My beloved is white and ruddy, white in virginity, ruddy in martyrdom, because he is white and ruddy. Therefore, it is immediately added, his mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. The virgin bridegroom, having been praised by the virgin bride, in turn praises the virgin bride, and says to her, How beautiful are thy feet in sandals, O daughter of Abinadad, which is, being interpreted, a people that offer itself willingly. For virginity is voluntary, and therefore the steps of the church in the beauty of chastity are praised. This is not the time for me, like a commander, to explain all the mysteries of virginity from the Song of Songs. I have no doubt that the fastidious reader will turn up his nose at what has already been said. Isaiah tells of the mystery of our faith and hope. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. I know that the Jews are accustomed to meet us with the objection that in Hebrew word Alma does not mean a virgin, but a young woman. And to speak truth, a virgin is properly called Bethula, but a young woman or girl is not Alma, but Nahara. What then is the meaning of Alma? A hidden virgin, that is, not merely a virgin, but a virgin in something more, because not every virgin is hidden, shut off from the occasional sight of men. Then again, Rebecca, on account of her extreme purity, and because she was a type of the church, which is represented in her own virginity, is described in Genesis as Alma, not Bethula, as may clearly be proved from the words of Abraham's servant, spoken by him in Mesopotamia. And he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the fountain of water, and let it come to pass that the maiden which cometh forth to draw, to whom I shall say, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of this pitcher to drink. And she shall say to me, Both drink thou, and I will draw for thy camels. Let the same woman be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed for my master's son. Where he speaks of the maiden coming forth to draw water. The Hebrew word is Alma, that is, a virgin secluded and guarded, by her parents with extreme care. Or, if this be not so, let them at least show me where the word is applied to married women as well, and I will confess my ignorance. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. If virginity not be preferred to marriage, why did the Holy Spirit choose a married woman or a widow? For at the time of Anna, the daughter of Phanael, of the tribe of Asher, was alive, distinguished for purity, and always free to devote herself to prayers and fasting in the temple of God. If the life and good works and fasting without virginity can merit the advent of the Holy Spirit, she might well have been the mother of our Lord. Let us hasten to the rest. The virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. To her whom he called daughter, the prophet also gave the title virgin, for fear that if he spoke only of a daughter, it might be supposed that she was married. This is the virgin daughter whom elsewhere he thus addresses. Sing, O barren, thou that dost not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud. Thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of a desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. This is she of whom God by the mouth of Jeremiah speaks, saying, Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Concerning her, we read of a great miracle in the same prophecy, that a woman should compass a man, and that the father of all things should be granted in a virgin's womb. Granted, says Jovinianius, that there is a difference between marriage and virginity. What have you to say to this? Suppose a virgin and a widow were baptized, and continued as they were. What difference will there be between them? What we have already said concerning Peter and John, Anna and Mary, may be of service here. For if there is no difference between a virgin and a widow, both being baptized, because baptism makes a new man, upon the same principle, harlots and prostitutes, if they are baptized, will be equal to virgins. If previous marriage is no prejudice to a baptized widow, the past pleasures and the exposures of their bodies to public lust are no detriment in the case of harlots. Once they have approached the laver, they will gain the rewards of virginity. It is one thing to unite with God a pure mind and free from any stain of memory, another to remember the foul and forced embraces of a man, and in recollection to act a part which you do not in person. Jeremiah, who was sanctified in the womb and was known in his mother's belly, enjoyed the high privilege because he was predestined to the blessing of virginity. And when all were captured, and even the vessels of the temple were plundered by the king of Babylon, he alone was liberated by the enemy, knew not the insults of captivity, and was supported by the conquerors. And Nebuchadnezzar, though he gave Nebuzaradan no charge concerning the Holy of Holies, did give him charge concerning Jeremiah. For that is the true temple of God, and that is the Holy of Holies, which is consecrated to the Lord by pure virginity. On the other hand, Ezekiel, 
who was kept captive in Babylon, who saw the storm approaching from the north and the whirlwind sweeping all before it, says, My wife died in the evening, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. For the Lord had previously told him that in that day he should no longer open his mouth and speak, and no longer keep silence. Mark well that while his wife was living, he was not at liberty to admonish the people. His wife died, the bond of wedlock was broken, and without the least hesitation, he constantly devoted himself to the prophetic office. For he who is called being free is truly the Lord's bondservant. I do not deny the blessedness of widows who remain such after their baptism, nor do I disparage those wives who maintain their chastity in wedlock. But as they attain a greater reward with God, the married women who pay the marriage due, let widows themselves be content to give the preference to virginity. For if a chastity which comes too late, when the glow of bodily pleasure is no longer felt, makes them feel superior to married women, why should they not acknowledge themselves inferior to perpetual virginity? All that goes for nothing, says Jovinianius, because even bishops, priests, and deacons, husbands of one wife, and having children, were appointed by the apostle. Just as the apostle says, he has no commandment respecting virgins, and yet gives his advice as one who has obtained mercy from the Lord, and is anxious throughout the whole discussion to give virginity the preference over marriage, and advises what he does not venture to command, lest he seem to lay a snare and to put a heavier burden upon man's nature than it can bear. So also in establishing the constitution of the church, inasmuch as the elements of the early church were drawn from Gentiles, he made rules for fresh believers somewhat lighter, that they may not in alarm shrink from keeping them. Then again the apostles and the elders wrote letters from Jerusalem, that no heavier burden should be laid on Gentile believers than that they should keep themselves from idolatry and fornication and from things strangled, as though they were providing for infant children. They gave them milk to drink, not solid food, nor did they lay down rules for continence, nor hint at virginity, nor urge to fasting, nor repeat the directions given in the gospel to apostles, not to have two tunics, nor script, nor money in their girdles, nor staff in their hand, nor shoes on their feet, and they certainly did not bid them, if they wished, to be perfect, go and sell all that they had and give to the poor, and come follow me. For if the young man who boasted of having done all that the law enjoins, when he heard this went away sorrowful, because he had great possessions, and the Pharisees derided an utterance such as this from our Lord's lips, how much more would the vast multitudes of Gentiles, whose highest virtue consisted in not plundering another's goods, have repudiated the obligation of perpetual chastity and continence. When they were told in the letter to keep themselves from idols and from fornication, seeing that fornication was heard of among them, and such fornication as was not even among the Gentiles, but the very choice of a bishop makes for me. For he does not say, let a bishop be chosen who marries one wife and begets children, but who marries one wife and has children in subjection and well-disciplined. You surely admit that he is no bishop who during his episcopate bears children. The reverse is the case, for he will be discovered. He will not be bound by the ordinary obligations of a husband, but will be condemned as an adulterer. Either permit priests to perform the work of marriage with the result that virginity and marriage are on par, or if it is unlawful for priests to touch their wives, they are so far holy that they imitate virgin chastity, but something more follows. A layman or any believer cannot pray unless he abstains from sexual intercourse. Now a priest must always offer sacrifices for the people. He must therefore always pray. And if he must always pray, he must always be released from the duties of marriage. For even under the old law, they who used to offer sacrifices for the people not only remained in their houses, but purified themselves for the occasion by separating from their wives nor would they drink wine or strong drink, which are wont to stimulate lust. That married men are elected to the priesthood, I do not deny. The number of virgins is not so great as that of the priests required. 
Does it follow that because all the strongest men are chosen for the army, weaker men should not be taken as well? All cannot be strong. If an army were constituted of strength only, and the numbers went out for nothing, the feebler men might be rejected. As it is, men of second or third rank strength are chosen, that the army may have its full numerical complement. How is it, then, you will say, that frequently at the ordination of priests a virgin is passed over and a married man taken, perhaps because he lacks other qualifications in keeping with virginity, or it may be that he is thought a virgin and is not, or there may be a stigma on his virginity, or at all events virginity itself makes him proud, and while he plumes himself on mere bodily chastity, he neglects other virtues, he does not cherish the poor, he is too fond of money, it sometimes happens that a man has a gloomy visage, a frowning brow, a walk as though he were in a solemn procession, and so offends the people, who, because they have no faults to find with his life, hate his mere dress and gait. Many are chosen not out of affection for themselves, but out of hatred for another. In most cases, the election is won by mere simplicity, while the shrewdness and discretion of another candidate elicit opposition as though they were evils. Sometimes the judgment of the commoner people is at fault, and in testing the qualities of the priesthood, the individual inclines to his own character, with the result that he looks not so much for a good candidate as for one like himself. Not unfrequently it happens that married men who form the larger portion of the people in approving married candidates seem to approve themselves, and it does not occur to them that... The mere fact that they prefer a married person to a virgin is evidence of their inferiority to virgins. What I am going to say will perhaps offend many, yet I will say it. And good men will not be angry with me, because they will not feel the sting of conscience. Sometimes it is the fault of the bishops, who choose into the ranks of the clergy, not the best, but the cleverest men, and think the more simple as well as the innocent ones incapable or as though they were distributing the office of an earthly service, they give posts to their kindred and relations, and they listen to all the dictates of wealth. And worse than all, they give promotion to the clergy who besmear them with flattery. To take the other view, if the apostle's meaning be that marriage is necessary in a bishop, the apostle himself ought not to have been a bishop, for he said, Yet I would that all men were even as I myself and John will be thought unworthy of this rank in all the virgins in the continent, the fairest gems that give grace and ornament to the church. Bishop, priest, and deacon are not honorable distinctions, but names of offices. And we do not read, If a man seeketh the office of a bishop, he desireth a good degree. But he desireth a good work, because by being placed in the higher order, an opportunity is afforded him if he choose to avail himself of it, for the practice of virtue. The bishop, then, must be without reproach, so that he is the slave of no vice, the husband of one wife, that is, in the past, not in the present, sober, or better, as it is in the Greek, vigilant, that is, nephalero, chaste, for that is the meaning of sophronoa, distinguished both by chastity and conduct, hospitable so that he imitates Abraham in with strangers, nay, rather, in strangers entertains Christ, apt to teach, for it profits nothing to enjoy the consciousness of virtue unless a man be able to instruct the people entrusted to him, so that he can exhort in doctrine and refute the gainsayers. Not a drunkard, for he who is constantly in the Holy of Holies and offers sacrifices will not drink wine and strong drink, unless the wine is a luxury. If a bishop drink at all, let it be in such a way that no one will know whether he has drunk or not. No striker, that is, a striker of men's consciousnesses. For the apostle is not pointing out what a boxer, but a pontiff, ought not to do. He directly teaches what he ought to do, but gentle, not contentious, no lover of money, one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all chastity. See what chastity is required in a bishop. If his child be unchaste, he himself cannot be a bishop, and he offends God in the same way as did Eli the priest, 
who had indeed rebuked his sons, but because he had not put away the offenders, fell backwards, and died before the lamp of God went out. Women in like manner must be chaste, and so on. In every grade and in both sexes, chastity has the chief place. You see, then, that the blessedness of a bishop, priest, or deacon does not lie in the fact that they are bishops, priests, or deacons, but in their having the virtues which their names and offices imply. Otherwise, if a deacon be holier than his bishop, his lower grade will not give him a worse standing with Christ. If it were so, Stephen the deacon, the first to wear the martyr's crown, would be less in the kingdom of heaven than many bishops, and then Timothy and Titus, whom I venture to make neither inferior nor yet superior to him. Just as in the legions of the army there are generals, tribunes, centurions, javelmen, and light-armed troops, common soldiers, and companies, but once the battle begins, all distinctions of rank are dropped, and the one thing looked for is valor. So, too, in this camp and in this battle, in which we contend against devils, not names but deeds are needed, and under the true commander, Christ, not the man who has the highest title has the greatest fame, but he who is the bravest warrior." End of chapters 31 through 35, book 1. Book 1, chapters 36 through 40 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But you will say, if everybody were a virgin, what would become of the human race? Like shall here beget like. If everyone were a widow, or continent in marriage, how will mortal men be propagated? Upon this principle there will be nothing at all for fear that something else may cease to exist. To put a case, if all men were philosophers, there would be no husbandmen. Why speak of husbandmen? There would be no orators, no lawyers, no teachers of other professions. If all men were leaders, what would become of the soldiers? If all were the head, whose head would they be called, when there were no other members? You are afraid that, if the desire for virginity were general, there would be no prostitutes, no adulteresses, no wailing infants in town or country. Every day the blood of adulterers is shed, adulterers are condemned, and lust is raging and rampant in the very presence of the laws and the symbols of authority in the courts of justice. Be not afraid that all will become virgins. Virginity is a hard matter, and therefore rare, because it is hard. Many are called, few are chosen. Many begin, few persevere. And so reward is great for those who have persevered. If all were able to be virgins, our Lord would never have said, He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And the apostle would not have hesitated to give his advice. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Why then, you will say, were the organs of generation created? And why were we so fashioned by the all-wise creator that we burn for one another and long for natural intercourse? To reply is to endanger our modesty. We are, as it were, between two rocks. The simplicades of necessity and virtue on either side and must make shipwreck of either our sense of shame or the cause we defend. If we reply to your suggestions, shame covers our face. If shame secures silence, in a matter we seem to desert our post, and yet to leave the ground clear to the raging foe. Yet it is better, as the story goes, to shut our eyes and fight like the blindfold gladiators than not to repel with the shield of truth the darts aimed at us. I can indeed say, our hinder parts, which are banished from sight, and the lower portions of the abdomen, which perform the functions of nature, are the Creator's work. But inasmuch as the physical conformation of the organs of generation testifies to difference in sex, I shall briefly reply, are we never then to forego lust for fear that we may have members of this kind for nothing? Why then should a husband keep himself from his wife? Why should a widow persevere in chastity, if we were only born to live like beasts? Or what harm does it do me if another man lies with my wife? 
For as the teeth were made for chewing, and the food, masticated, passes into the stomach, and a man is not blamed for giving my wife bread, similarly, if it was intended that the organs of generation should always be performing their office, when my vigor is spent, let another take my place, and, if I may so speak, let my wife quench her burning lust where she can. But what does the apostle mean by exhorting to continence, if continency be contrary to nature? What does our Lord mean when he instructs us in the various kinds of eunuchs? Surely the apostle who bids us to emulate his own chastity must be asked, If we are to be consistent, why are you like other men, Paul? Why are you distinguished from the female sex by a beard, hair, and other peculiarities of person? How is it that you have not swelling bosoms, and are not broad at the hips, narrow at the chest? Your voice is rugged, your speech is rough, your eyebrows more shaggy. To no purpose you have all these manly qualities, if you forego the embraces of women. I am compelled to say something, and to become a fool, but you have forced me to dare to speak. Our Lord and Savior, who, though he was in the form of God, condescended to take the form of a servant, and became obedient to the Father, even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. What necessity was there for him to be born with members which he was not going to use? He certainly was circumcised to manifest his sex. Why did he cause John the Apostle and John the Baptist to make themselves eunuchs through love of him, after causing them to be born men? Let us then who believe in Christ follow his example, and if we knew him after the flesh, let us no longer know him according to the flesh. The substance of our resurrection bodies will certainly be the same as now, though of higher glory. For the Savior, after his descent into hell, had so far the self-same body in which he was crucified, that he showed the disciples the marks of the nails in his hands and the wound in his side. Moreover, if we deny the identity of his body because he entered though the doors were shut, and this is not a property of human bodies, we must deny also that Peter and the Lord had real bodies because they walked upon the water, which is contrary to nature. In the resurrection of the dead, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but will be like the angels. What others will hereafter be in heaven that virgins begin to be on earth? If likeness to the angels is promised us, and there is no difference of sex among the angels, we shall either be of no sex, as are the angels, or at all events, which is clearly proved, though we rise from the dead in our own sex, we shall not perform the functions of sex. But why do we argue, and why are we eager to frame a clever and victorious reply to our opponent? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I will run through the utterances of the apostles, and as to the instances afforded by Solomon, I add short expositions to facilitate their being understood. So now I will go over the passages bearing on Christian purity and continence, and will make of many proofs a connected series. By this method I shall succeed in omitting nothing relating to chastity, and shall avoid being tediously long. Amongst other passages, Paul the Apostle writes to the Romans, What fruit then had ye at the time of the things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto sanctification, and the end eternal life. I suppose, too, that the end of marriage is death, but the compensating fruit of sanctification fruit belonging either to virginity or to continence, is eternal life. And afterwards, wherefore, my brethren, ye also were made dead to the law through the body of Christ, that ye should be joined to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were through the law, wrought in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we have been discharged from the law, having died to that wherein we were holden, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit, and not oldness of the letter. When he says, we were in the flesh, and not in the newness of the Spirit, but in the oldness of the letter, we did those things which pertain to the flesh, and bore fruit unto death. 
but now because we are dead to the law through the body of christ let us bear fruit to god that we may belong to him who rose from the dead and elsewhere having previously said i know that the law is spiritual and having discussed at some length the violence of the flesh which frequently drives us to do what we would not he at last continues o wretched man that i am who shall deliver me out of the body of this death i thank god through jesus christ our lord and again so then i myself with the mind serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin and there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in christ jesus who walk after the flesh for the law of the spirit in christ jesus made me free from the law of sin and death and more clearly in what follows he teaches the christians do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirits the things of the spirit for the mind of the flesh is death but the mind of the spirit is life and peace because the mind of the flesh is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can it be and they that are in the flesh cannot please god but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwelleth in you so then brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if you live after the flesh ye must die but if by the spirit ye mortify the deeds of the flesh ye shall live for as many as are led by the spirit of god these are sons of god if the wisdom of the flesh is enmity against god and they who are in the flesh cannot please god i think that they who perform the functions of marriage love the wisdom of the flesh and therefore are in the flesh the apostle being desirous to withdraw us from the flesh and to join us to the spirit says afterwards i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god to present your bodies to a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to god which is your reasonable service and be not fashioned according to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of god for i say through the grace that was given me to every man that is among you not to think of, of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think according to chastity not soberly as the latin versions badly render but think he says according to chastity for the greek words are esto sophroninen but let us consider what the apostle says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of god what he says is something like this god indeed permits marriage he permits second marriages and if necessary prefers even third marriages to fornication and adultery but we who ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is our reasonable service should consider not what god permits but what he wishes that we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of god it follows what he merely permits is neither good nor acceptable nor perfect and he gives his reasons for this advice knowing the season that now it is high time for you to awake out of sleep for now is salvation nearer to us than when we first believed the night is far spent and the day is at hand and lastly put ye on the lord jesus christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof god's will is one thing his indulgence another whence writing to the corinthians he says i brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in christ i have fed you with milk and not meat for heareth too ye were not able to bear it neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal he who is in the merely animal state and does not receive the things pertaining to the spirit of god for he is foolish and cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned he is not fed with the food of perfect chastity but with the coarse milk of marriage as through man came death so also through man came the resurrection of the dead as in adam all die so in christ we shall all be made alive 
Under the law we served the old Adam. Under the gospel let us serve the new Adam. For the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of heaven. As the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall now also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. This is so clear that no explanation can make it clearer. Flesh and blood, he says, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. If corruption attaches to all intercourse, and incorruption is characteristic of chastity, the rewards of chastity cannot belong to marriage. But we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal, in the heavens. For verily, in this we groan, longing to be clothed upon with our habitation, which is from heaven. We are willing to be absent from the body, and to be at home with the Lord. Wherefore also we make it our aim, whether in the body or out of the body, to be well-pleasing unto God. And by way of more fully explaining what he did not wish them to, to be, he says elsewhere, I espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But if you chose to apply the words to the whole assembly of believers, and in this brothel to Christ include both married women and twice married and widows and virgins, that also makes for us. For whilst he invites all to chastity, for whilst he invites all to chastity and to the reward of virginity, he shows that virginity is more excellent than all these conditions. And again, running to the Galatians, he says, Because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Among the works of the law is marriage, and accordingly, under it, they are cursed who have no children. And if under the gospel it is permitted to have children, it is one thing to make a concession to weakness, another to hold out rewards to virtue. Something else I will say to my friends who marry, and after long chastity and continence begin to burn, and are wanton as the brutes. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now perfected in the flesh? Did ye suffer so many things in vain? If the apostle in this case of many persons looses the cords of continence, and lets them have a slack rein, he does so on account of the infirmity of the flesh. This the enemy he has in view when he once more says, Walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. It is unnecessary now to speak of the works of the flesh. It would be tedious, and he who chooses can easily gather them from the letter of the Apostle. I will only speak of the Spirit and its fruits. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, meekness, continence. All the virtues of the Spirit are supported and protected by continence, which is, as it were, their solid foundation and crowning point. Against such there is no law, and they that are of Christ have crucified their flesh with the passions and the lusts thereof. If we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit let us also walk. Why do we who with Christ have crucified our flesh and its passions and desires again desire to do the things of the flesh? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth unto his own flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth unto the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. I think that he who has a wife, so long as he reverts to the practice in question, that Satan may not tempt him, as sowing to the flesh and not to the spirit. And he who sows to the flesh, the words are not mine but the apostles, reaps corruption. God the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and without spot before him. We walked in the lusts of the flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and were children of wrath, even as the rest. But now he has raised us up with him, and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that we may put away 
according to our former manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the lusts of deceit, and that blessings may be applied to us, which so finally concludes the mystical epistle to the Ephesians. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in uncorruptness. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. Whatsoever things then are true, whatsoever are chaste, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things pertain to purity, let us join ourselves to these, let us follow these. Christ hath reconciled us in his body to God the Father through his death, and has presented us holy and without spot and without blame before him, in whom we have been also circumcised, not with the circumcision made with hands, to the spoiling of the body of the flesh, but with the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, wherein also we rose with him. If then we have risen with Christ, let us seek those things which are above, for Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Let us set our affections on things above, not upon the things that are upon the earth. For we are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ our life shall appear, then we also shall appear with him in glory. No soldier on service entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enrolled him as a soldier. For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to the intent that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live purely and righteously and godly in this present world. The day would not be long enough were I to attempt to relate all that the Apostle enjoins concerning purity. These things are those concerning which our Lord said to the Apostles, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth. After the crucifixion of Christ, we find in the Acts of the Apostles that one house, that of Philip the Evangelist, produced four virgin daughters, to the end that Caesarea, where the Gentile church had been consecrated in the person of Cornelius the centurion, might afford an illustration of virginity. And whereas our Lord said in the gospel, the law and the prophets were until John, they, because they were virgins, were related to have prophesied even after John, and they could not be bound by the law of the Old Testament, who had shone with the brightness of virginity. Let us pass on to James, who was called the brother of the Lord, a man of such sanctity and righteousness, and distinguished by so rigid and perpetual a virginity, that even Josephus, the Jewish historian, relates that the overthrow of Jerusalem was due to his death. He, the first bishop of the church at Jerusalem, which was composed of Jewish believers, to whom Paul went, accompanied by Titus and Barnabas, says in his epistle, Be not deceived, my beloved brethren, Every good gift and every perfect boon is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no difference, neither shadow that is casting by turning. Of its own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Himself a virgin, he teaches virginity in a mystery. Every perfect gift cometh down from above, where marriage is unknown, and it cometh down, not from any one you please, but from the Father of lights, who says to the apostles, Ye are the light of the world, with whom there is no difference of Jew or Gentile, nor does that shadow, which was the companion of trouble, trouble those who have believed from among the nations. But with his word he begat us, and with the word of truth, because some shadow, image, and likeness of truth went before the law, that we might be the first fruits of his creatures, and as he who was himself the first begotten from the dead has raised all that have died in him, so he who was a virgin consecrated the first fruits of his virgins in his own virgin self. Let us also consider what Peter thinks of the calling of the Gentiles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy begat us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who, by the power of God, are guarded through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, 
where we read of an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away prepared in heaven and reserved for the last time and of the hope of eternal life when they will neither marry nor be given in marriage there in other words the privileges of virginity are described for he shows as much in what follows wherefore girding up the loins of your mind be sober and set your hope perfectly on the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of jesus christ as children of obedience not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in the time of your ignorance but like as he which called you is holy be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living because it is written ye shall be holy for i am holy for we are not redeemed with corruptible things with silver or gold but with the precious blood of the lamb without spot jesus christ that we might purify our souls in obedience to the truth having been begotten again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible through the word of god who liveth and abideth and as living stones let us be built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood offering of spiritual sacrifices through christ our lord for we are an elect race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for god's own possession christ died for us in the flesh let us arm ourselves with the same conversation as did christ for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men but to the will of god for the time past is sufficient for us when we walked in lasciviousness lusts and other vices great and precious are the promises attached to virginity which he has given us that through it we may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world through lust the lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to keep the unrighteous under the punishment under the day of judgment but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of defilement and despise dominion daring self-willed for they as beasts of burden without reason think only of their belly and their lusts railers who shall in their corruption be destroyed and shall receive the reward of iniquity men that count unrighteousness delight spots and blemishes thinking of nothing but their pleasures having eyes full of adultery and insatiable lust deceiving souls not yet strengthened by the love of christ for they utter swelling words and easily ensnare the unlearned with seduction of the flesh promising them liberty while they themselves are the slaves of vice luxury and corruption for of what a man is overcome of the same he is also brought into bondage but if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our saviour jesus christ they are again overcome by that which they before became the last state has become worse with them than the first and it were better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back and forsake the holy commandment delivered unto them and it has happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog hath returned to his own vomit again and the sow that had washed to wallowing in the mire i have hesitated for fear of being tedious to quote the whole passage of the second epistle of peter and have merely shown that the holy spirit in prophecy foretold the teachers of this time and their heresy lastly he more clearly denotes them saying in the last days seducing mockers shall come walking after their own lusts the apostle has described Juvenianus speaking with swelling cheeks and nicely balancing his inflated utterances promising heavenly liberty when he himself is the slave of vice and self-indulgence a dog returning to his vomit for although he boasts of being a monk he has exchanged his dirty tunic bare feet common bread and drink of water for a snowy dress sleek skin honey wine and dainty dishes for the sauces of apicius and pacamus for baths and rubbings and for the cook shops it is not clear that he prefers his belly to christ and thinks his ruddy complexion worth the kingdom of heaven and yet that handsome monk so fat and sleek and of bright appearance who always walks with the air of the bridegroom must either marry our wife if he is to show that virginity and marriage are equal or if he does not marry one it is useless for him to bandy words with us when his acts are on our side 
and John agrees with this almost to the letter. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of this life, which is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world patheth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. A new commandment I have written unto you, which thing is true both in Christ and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light already shineth. And again, beloved now, are we the children of God, and it is not yet made manifest what we shall be. But we know that if he shall be manifested, we shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. And every one that hath this hope purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Herein is our love made perfect. If we have boldness in the day of judgment, that as he is, even so may we be in this world. The epistle of Jude also expresses nearly the same, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Let us read the Apocalypse of John, and we shall there find the Lamb upon Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand of them that were sealed, having his name and the name of his Father written in their foreheads, who sing a new song, and no one can sing that song save they who have been redeemed out of the earth. These are they who have not defiled themselves with women, for they continued virgins. These follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, for they were redeemed from among men, first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, and they are without spot. Out of each tribe, the tribe of Dan, excepted, the place of which is taken by the tribe of Levi, twelve thousand virgins who have been sealed are spoken of as future believers, who have not defiled themselves with women, and that we may not suppose the reference to be to those who know not harlots, he immediately added, for they continued virgins, whereby he shows that all who have not preserved their virginity in comparison of pure and angelic chastity and of our Lord Jesus Christ himself are defiled. These are they who sing a new song which no man can sing except him that is a virgin. These are first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb and are without blemish. If virgins are first fruits, it follows that widows and the continents in marriage come after the first fruits, that is, are in the second and third rank. Nor can a lost people be saved unless it offer such sacrifices of chastity to God and with pure victims reconcile the spotless lamb. It would be endless work to explain the gospel mystery of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. All I say now is that as mere virginity without works does not save, so all works without virginity, purity, continence, chastity are imperfect. And we shall not be hindered in the least from taking this view by the objection of our opponent that our Lord was at Cana of Galilee and joined in the marriage festivals when he turned water into wine. I shall very briefly reply that he who was circumcised on the eighth day and for whom a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons were offered on the day of purification, like others before he suffered, showed his approval of Jewish custom, that he might not seem to give his enemies just cause for putting him to death on the pretext that he destroyed the law and condemned nature. And even this was done for our sakes, for by going once to a marriage he taught that men should marry only once, Moreover, at that time it was possible to injure virginity if marriage were not placed next to it, and the purity of widowhood in the third rank. But now when heretics are condemning wedlock and despise the ordinance of God, we gladly hear anything he may say in praise of marriage. For the church does not condemn marriage, but it makes it subordinate. Nor does she reject it, but regulates it. For she knows, as was said before, that in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earthenware, and that some are to honor and some to dishonor, and that whoever cleanses himself will be a vessel of honor, necessary, prepared for every good work. End of Book 1, Chapters 
36 through 40. Book 1, chapters 41 through 45 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I have given enough and more than enough illustrations from the divine writings of Christian chastity and angelic virginity. But as I understand that our opponent in his commentaries summons us to the tribunal of worldly wisdom, and we are told that views of this kind are never accepted in the world, and that our religion has invented a dogma against nature, I will quickly run through Greek and Roman and foreign history, and will show that virginity ever took the lead of chastity. Fable relates that Atalana, the virgin of Caledonian fame, lived for the chase and dwelt always in the woods. In other words, that she did not set her heart on marriage with its troubles of pregnancy and of sickness, but upon the nobler life of freedom and chastity. Harpalius too, and the Thracian virgin, is described by the famous poet, and so is Camellia, queen of the Volchi, on whom, when she came to his assistance, Turnus had no higher praise which he could bestow than to call her a virgin. O virgin, glory of Italy, and that famous daughter of Leos, the lady of the brazen house, ever a virgin, is related to have freed her country from pestilence by her voluntary death, and the blood of the virgin, Ephrigina is said to have calmed the stormy winds. What need to tell of the syllabuses of Erethri and Cumene and the eight others? For Varro asserts there were ten whose ornament was virginity and divination the reward of their virginity. But if in the Aeolian dialect syllable is represented by Theovole, we must understand that a knowledge of the counsel of God is rightly attributed to virginity alone. We read, too, that Cassandra and Chryseis, prophetess of Apollo and Juno, were virgins, and there were innumerable priestesses of the Tyrrhenian Diana and of Vestra. One of these, Monitana, being suspected of unchastity, was buried alive, which would be, in my opinion, an unjust punishment unless the violation of virginity were considered a serious crime. At all events, how highly the Romans always esteemed virgins is clear from the fact that councils and generals, even in their triumphal chariots and bringing home the spoils of conquered nations, were wont to make way for them to pass. And so did men of all ranks. When Claudia, a vestal virgin, was suspected of unchastity, and a vessel containing the image of Sebel, was aground in the Tiber, it is related that she, to prove her chastity, with her girdle, drew the ship which a thousand men could not move. Yet, as the uncle of Lucian, the poet says, it would have been better if this circumstance had decorated a chastity tried and proved, and had not pleaded in defense of a chastity equivocal. No wonder that we read such things of human beings, when heathen error also invented the virgin goddess Minerva, and Diana, and placed the virgin among the twelve signs of the zodiac, by means of which, as they suppose, the world revolves. It is a proof of the little esteem in which they held marriage that they did not, even among the scorpions, centaurs, crabs, fishes, and capricorn, thrust in a husband and wife. When the thirty tyrants of Athens had slain Phidon at the banquet, they commanded his virgin daughters to come to them naked like harlots, and there upon the ground, red with their father's blood, to act the wanton. For a little while they hid their grief, and then, when they saw the revelers were intoxicated, going out on the plea of easing nature, they embraced one another and threw themselves into a well, that by death they might save their virginity. The virgin daughter of Demodion, chief of the Aeropagites, having heard of the death of her betrothed, Leothenes, who had originated the Lamaean War, slew herself, for she declared that although in body she was a virgin, yet if she were compelled to accept another, she should regard him as her second husband, when she had given her heart to Leosanthes. So close a friendship long existed between Sparta and Messene, that for the furtherance of certain religious rites they even exchanged virgins. Well, on one occasion, when the men of 
Messonnet attempted to outrage fifty Lacedaemonian virgins. Out of so many, not one consented, but they all most gladly died in defense of their chastity. Whence there arose a long and grievous war, and in the long run, Mamertia was destroyed. Aristocles, tyrant of Orchomenos, fell in love with a virgin of Stamphalus, and when, after the death of her father, she took refuge in the temple of Diana and embraced the image of the goddess, and could not be dragged thence by force, she was slain on the spot. Her death caused such intense grief throughout Arcadia that the people took up arms and avenged the virgin's death. Aristomenes of Messene, a just man, at the time when the Lacedaemonians, whom he had conquered, were celebrating by night the festival called the Hyacinthia, carried off from the sportive bands fifteen virgins, and fleeing all night at full speed, got away from the Spartan territory. His companions wished to outrage them, but he admonished them to the best of his power not to do so, and when certain refused obey, he slew them, and restrained the rest by fear. The maidens were afterwards ransomed by their kinsmen, and on seeing Aristomones, condemned for murder, would not return to their country until clasping the knees of the judges they beheld the protector of their chastity acquitted. How shall we sufficiently praise the daughters of Sudaus at Leuctra in Boeotia? It is related in the absence of their father, they hospitably entertained two youths who were passing by, and who, having drunk to excess, violated the virgins in the course of the night. Being unwilling to survive the loss of their virginity, the mains inflicted deadly wounds on one another. Nor would one be right to omit the mention of the Locrian virgins. They were sent to Ilium according to custom, which had lasted for nearly a thousand years, and yet not one gave occasion to any idle tale or filthy rumor of virginity defiled. Could anyone pass over in silence the seven virgins of Miletus, who, when the Gauls spread desolation far and wide, that they might suffer no indignity at the hands of the enemy, escaped disgrace by death, and left to all virgins the lesson of their example, that noble minds care more for chastity than life. Nicanor, having conquered and overthrown Thebes, was himself overcome by a passion for one captive virgin, whose voluntary self-surrender he longed for. A captive maid, he thought, must be only too glad, but he found that virginity is dearer to the pure in heart than a kingdom, when with tears and grief he held her in his arms, slain by her own hand. Greek writers tell also of another Theobian virgin who had been deflowered by a Macedonian foe, and who, hiding her grief for a while, slew the violator of her virginity as he slept, and then killed herself with the sword, so that she would neither live when her chastity was lost, nor die before she had avenged herself. To come to the gymnosophists of India, the opinion is authoritatively handed down that Buddha, the founder of their religion, had his birth through the side of a virgin. We need not wonder at this in the case of barbarians, when cultured Greece supposed that Minerva, at her birth, sprang from the head of Jove, and Father Bacchus from his thigh. Spusippus, also Plato's nephew, and Clearchus in his Eulogy of Plato, and Anaxilids in the second book of his philosophy, relates that Peritiketon, the mother of Plato, was violated by an apparition of Apollo, and they agree in thinking that the Prince of Wisdom was born of a virgin. Timaeus writes that the virgin daughter of Pythagoras was at the head of a band of virgins, and instructed them in chastity. Diodorus, the disciple of Socrates, is said to have had five daughters skilled in dialectics and distinguished for chastity, of whom a full account is given by Philo, the master of Cardenas. And mighty Rome cannot taunt us as though we had invented the story of the birth of our Lord and Savior from a virgin. For the Romans believe that the founders of their city and race were the offspring of the virgin Ilia and of Mars. 
that these allusions to the virgins of the world, brief and hastily gathered from many histories, now suffice. I will now proceed to married women who were reluctant to survive the decease or violent death of their husbands for fear they might be forced into a second marriage, and who entertained a marvelous affection for their only husbands they had. This may teach us that second marriage was repudiated among the heathen. Dido, the sister of Pygmalion, having collected a vast amount of gold and silver, saved to Africa and there built Carthage. And when her hand was sought in marriage by Ebas, king of Liberia, she deferred the marriage for a while until her country was settled. Not long after, having raised a funeral pyre in the memory of her former husband, Sicius, she preferred to burn rather than to marry. Carthage was built by a woman of chastity, and its end was a tribute to the excellence of the virtue. For the wife of Hasdrubal, when the city was captured and set on fire, and she saw that she could not herself escape capture by the Romans, took her little children in either hand and leapt into the burning ruins of her house. What need to tell of the wife of Niceratus, who, not enduring to wrong her husband, inflicted death upon herself, rather than subject herself to the lust of the thirty tyrants whom Lysander had set over conquered Athens. Artemisia, also wife of Mausolus, is related to have been distinguished for chastity, though she was a queen of Caria, and is extolled by great poets and historians. No higher praise is bestowed upon her than that when her husband was dead, she loved him so much that when he was alive and built a tomb so great that even to the present day all costly sepulchres are called after his name mausoleums. Tuta, queen of the Illyrians, owed her long sway over brave warriors and her frequent victories over Rome to her marvelous chastity. The Indians and almost all the barbarians have plurity of wives. It is a law with them that the favorite wife must be burned with her dead husband. The wives, therefore, vie with one another for the husband's love and the highest ambition of the rivals, and the proof of chastity is to be considered worthy of death. So then, she that is victorious, having put on her former dress and ornaments, lies down beside the corpse, embracing and kissing it, and to the glory of chastity despises the flames which are burning beneath her. I suppose that she who dies thus wants no second marriage. The famous Alcibiades, the friend of Socrates, when Athens was conquered, fled to Pharnabasus, who took a bribe from Lysander, the Lacedaemonian leader, and ordered him to be slain. He was strangled, and when his head had been cut off, it was sent to Lysander as proof of the murder. But the rest of the body lay unburied. His concubine, therefore, all alone, in defiance of the command of the cruel enemy, and in the midst of strangers, in the face of peril, gave him due burial, for she was ready to die for the dead man, whom she loved when living. Let matrons, Christian matrons, at all events, imitate the fidelity of concubines, exhibit in their freedom what she in her captivity preserved. Strato, ruler of Sidon, thought of dying by his own hand, that he might not be the sport of the Persians, who were close by and whose alliance he had discarded for the friendship of the king of Egypt. But he drew back in terror, and eyeing the sword which he had seized, awaited in alarm at the approach of the enemy. His wife, knowing that he must be immediately taken, wrested the weapon from his hand and pierced his side. When the body was properly laid out, she lay down upon it in the agony of death, that she might not violate her virgin troth in the embraces of another. Xenophon, in describing the early years of the elder Cyrus, relates that when her husband, Abradatus, was slain, Parthia, who loved him intensely, placed herself beside the mangled body then stabbed herself and let her blood run into her husband's wounds. The queen whom the king, her husband, had shown naked and without her knowledge to his friend, thought she had good cause for slaying the king. She judged that she was not beloved if it was possible for her to be exhibited to another. Rodagun, daughter of Darius, 
after the death of her husband put to death the nurse who was trying to persuade her to marry again alcestis is related in the story to have voluntarily died for admetos and penelope's chastity is the theme of homer's song laodemia's praises are also sung by the poets because when prostelius was slain at troy she refused to survive him End of Book 1, Chapters 41 through 45. Book 1, Chapters 46 through 49 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I may pass on to Roman women, and the first that I shall mention is Lucretia, who would not survive her violated chastity, but blotted out the stain upon her person with her own blood. Duilius, the first Roman who won a naval triumph, took to wife a virgin, Bilia, of such extraordinary chastity that she was an example even to an age which held unchastity to be not merely vicious but monstrous. When he was grown old and feeble, he was once in the course of a quarrel, taunted with having bad breath. In Dudgeon, he betook himself home, and on complaining to his wife that she had never told him of it, so that he might remedy the fault, he received the reply that she would have done so, but that she thought that all men had foul breath as he had. In either case, this chaste and noble woman deserves praise. Whether she was not aware there was anything wrong with her husband, or if she patiently endured, and her husband discovered this unfortunate condition, not by the disgust of his wife, but by the abuse of an enemy. At all events, the woman who marries a second time cannot say this. Marcia, Cato's younger daughter, on being asked after the loss of her husband why she did not marry again, replied that she could not find a man who wanted her more than her money. Her words teach us that men, in choosing their wives, look for riches rather than for chastity, and that many, in marrying, use not their eyes but their fingers. That must be an excellent thing which is won by avarice. When the same lady was mourning the loss of her husband, and the matrons asked what day would terminate her grief, she replied, The same that terminates my life. I imagine that a woman who thus followed her husband in heart and mind had no thought of marrying again. Portia, whom Brutus took to wife, was a virgin. Cato's wife, Marcia, was not a virgin, but Marcia went to and fro between Hortensius and Cato, and was quite content to live without Cato, while Portia could not live without Brutus. For women attach themselves closely to particular men, and to keep to, to one is a strong link in the chain of affection. When a relative urged Ania to marry again, she was of full age and a goodly person. She answered, I shall certainly not do so, for if I find a good man, I have no wish to be in fear of losing him. If a bad one, why must I put up with a bad husband after having had a good one? Portia, the younger, on hearing a certain lady of good character who had a second husband, praised in her house, replied, A chaste and happy matron never marries more than once. Marcella, the elder, on being asked by her mother if she was glad she was married, answered, So much so that I want nothing more. Valeria, the sister of the Messalis, when she lost her husband Servius, would marry no one else. On being asked why not, she said that to her, her husband, Servius, was ever alive. I feel that in giving this list of women, I have said far more than is customary in illustrating the point, and that I might be justly censured by my learned reader. But what am I to do when the women of our time press me with apostolic authority, and before the first husband is buried, repeat from morning to night the precepts which allow a second marriage? Seeing they despise the fidelity which Christian purity dictates, let them at least learn chastity from the heathen. A book on marriage, worth its weight in gold, passes under the name of Theophrastus, 
in it the author asks whether a wise man marries, and after laying down the conditions that the wife must be fair, of good character, and honest parentage, the husband in good health and of ample means, and after saying that under these circumstances a wise man sometimes enters the state of matrimony, he immediately proceeds thus. But all these conditions are seldom satisfied in marriage. A wise man, therefore, must not take a wife. For in the first place, his study of philosophy will be hindered, and it is impossible for anyone to attend to his books and his wife. Matrons want many things, costly dresses, gold, jewels, great outlay, maid servants, all kinds of furniture, litters, and gilded couches. Then come curtain lectures and the live long night. She complains that one lady goes out better dressed than she, that another is looked up by all. I am a poor despised nobody at the ladies' assemblies. Why did you ogle that creature next door? Why were you talking to the maid? What did you bring from the market? I am not allowed to have a single friend or companion. She suspects that her husband's love goes the same way as her hate. There may be in some neighboring city the wisest of teachers, but if we have a wife, we can neither leave her behind nor take the burden with us. To support a poor wife is hard. To put up with a rich one is torture. Notice, too, that in the case of a wife, you cannot pick and choose. You must take her as you find her. If she has a bad temper or is a fool, if she has a blemish or is proud or has bad breath, whatever her fault may be, all this we learn after marriage. Horses, asses, cattle, even slaves of the smallest worth, clothes, kettles, wooden seats, cups, and earthenware pitchers are first tried and then bought. A woman is the only thing that is not shown before she is married, for fear she may not give satisfaction. Our gaze must always be directed to her face, and we must always praise her beauty. If you look at another woman, she thinks that she is out of favor. She must be called my lady. Her birthday must be kept. We must swear by her health and wish that she may survive us. Respect must be paid to the nurse, to the nursemaid, to the father's slave, to the foster child, to the handsome hanger-on, to the curled darling who manages her affairs, and to the eunuch who ministers to the safe indulgence of her lust, names which are only a cloak for adultery. Upon whomsoever she sets her heart, they must have her love, though they want her not. If you give her the management of the whole house, you must yourself be her slave. If you reserve something for yourself, she will not think you are loyal to her, but she will turn to strife and hatred. And unless you quickly take care, she will have the poison ready. If you introduce old women and soothsayers and prophets and vendors of jewels and silken clothing, you imperil her chastity. If you shut the door upon them, she is injured and fancies you suspect her. But what is the good of even a careful guardian when an unchaste wife cannot be watched? and a chaste one ought not to be. For necessity is but a faithless keeper of chastity, and she alone really deserves to be called pure, who is free to sin if she chooses. If a woman be fair, she soon finds lovers. If she be ugly, it is easy to be wanton. It is difficult to guard what many long for. It is annoying to have what no one thinks worth possessing. But the misery of having an ugly wife is less than that of watching a comely one. Nothing is safe for which a whole person sighs and longs. One man entices with his figure, another with his brains, another with his wit, another with his open hand. Somehow or sometime the fortress is captured, which is attacked on all sides. Men marry, indeed, so as to get a manager for the house, to soulless weariness, to banish solitude, but a faithful slave is a far better manager, more submissive to the master, more observant of his ways, than a wife who thinks she proves herself mistress if she acts in opposition to her husband, that is, if she does what pleases her, not what she is commanded. But friends and servants who are under the obligation of benefits received are better able to wait upon us in sickness than a wife who makes us responsible for her tears. 
she will sell you enough to make a deluge for the hope of a legacy, boasts of her anxiety, but drives her sick husband to the distraction of despair. But if she herself is poorly, we must fall sick with her and never leave her bedside. Or if she be a good and agreeable wife, how rare a bird she is, we have to share her groans in childbirth and suffer torture when she is in danger. A wise man can never be alone. He has with him the good men of all time and turns his mind freely wherever he chooses. What is inaccessible to him in person, he can embrace in thought. And if men are scarce, he converses with God. He is never less alone than when alone. Then again, to marry for the sake of children, so that our name may not perish, or that we may have support in old age and leave our property without dispute, is the height of stupidity. For what is it to us when we are leaving the world if another bears our name, when even a son does not all at once take his father's title, and there are countless others who are called by the same name? Or what support in old age is he whom you bring up and who may die before you, or turn out a retrobate. Or, at all events, when he reaches mature age, you may seem to him long in dying. Friends and relatives whom you can judiciously love are better and safer heirs than those whom you must make your heirs whether you like it or not. Indeed, the surest way of having a good heir is to ruin your fortune in a good cause while you live, not to leave the fruit of your labor to be used, you know not how. When Theophratius thus discourses, are there any of us Christians whose conversation is in heaven and who daily say, I long to be dissolved and to be with Christ, whom he does not put to the blush? Shall a joint heir of Christ really long for human heirs? And shall he desire children and delight himself in a long line of descendants, who will perhaps fall into the clutches of Antichrist. When we read that Moses and Samuel preferred other men to their own sons, and did not count as their children those whom they saw to be displeasing to God, when Cicero, after divorcing Tyrrhenia, was requested by Hertius to marry his sister, he set the matter altogether on one side, and said that he could not possibly devote himself to a wife and to philosophy. Meanwhile, that excellent partner, who had herself drunk wisdom at Tully's fountains, married Salust, his enemy, and took her third husband, Messala Corvinius, and thus, as it were, passed through three degrees of eloquence. Socrates had two wives, Santippe and Neron, granddaughter of Aristides, they frequently quarreled, and he was accustomed to banter them for disagreeing about him. He being the ugliest of men, with stub nose, bald forehead, rough-haired, and bandy-legged, at last they planned an attack upon him, and having punished him severely and put him to flight, vexed him for a long time. On one occasion, when he opposed Santippe, who from above was heaping abuse upon him, the termagat soused him with dirty water, and he only wiped his head and said, I knew that a shower must follow such thunder as that. Itella, consort of El Sula, the fortunate, except in the matter of his wife, was openly unchaste, and it was the common talk of Athens, as I learnt in my youthful years, when we soon pick up what is bad. And yet Sula was in the dark, and first got to know the secrets of his household through the abuse of his enemies. Colonel Pompey had an impure wife, Musha, who was surrounded by eunuchs from Pontus and troops of the countrymen of Mithridates. Others thought that he knew all and submitted to it. But a comrade told him during the campaign and the conqueror of the whole world was dismayed at the sad intelligence. Major Cato, the censor, had a wife, Actoria Paula, a woman of low origin, fond of drink, violent, and, who would believe it, haughty to Cato. 
I say this for fear anyone may suppose that in marrying a poor woman he has secured peace. When Philip, king of Macedon, against whom Demosthenes thundered in his Philippics, was entering his bedroom as usual, his wife in a passion shut him out. Finding himself excluded, he held his tongue and consoled himself for the insults by reading a tragic poem. Gorgias, the rhetician, recited his excellent treatise on Concord to the Greeks, then at variance among themselves, at Olympia, whereupon Melantheus, his enemy, observed, Here is a man who teaches us Concord, and yet could not make Concord between himself and his wife and maidservant, three persons in one house. The truth was that his wife envied the beauty of the girl, and drove the purest of men wild with daily quarrels. Old tragedies of Euripides are censures on women. Hence Hermonian says, The counsels of evil women have beguiled me. In the semi-barbarous and remote city, Leptis, it is the custom for a daughter-in-law on the second day to beg the loan of a jar from her mother-in-law. The latter at once denies the request, and we see how true is the remark of Terence, ambiguously expressed on purpose. How is this? Do all mothers-in-law hate their daughters-in-law? We read of a certain Roman noble who, when his friends found fault with him for having divorced a wife, beautiful and chaste and rich, put out his foot and said to them, And the shoe before you looks new and elegant, yet no one but myself knows where it pinches. Herodotus tells us that a woman puts off her modesty with her clothes, and our own comic poet thinks the man fortunate who has never been married. Why should I refer to Pasiphae, Clytemnestra, and Eraphile, the first of whom, the wife of a king and swimming in pleasure, is said to have lusted for a bull, the second to have killed her husband for the sake of an adulterer, the third to have betrayed Amphirus, and to have preferred a gold necklace to the welfare of her husband. In all the bombast of tragedy and overthrow of houses, cities, and kingdoms, it is the wives and concubines who stir up strife. Parents take up arms against their children. Unspeakable banquets are served. And on account of the rape of one wretched woman, Europe and Asia are involved in a ten years' war. We read of some who were divorced the day after they were married, and immediately married again. Both husbands are to blame, both he who is soon dissatisfied, and he who was soon so pleased. Epicurus, the patron of pleasure, though Metrodorus, his disciple, married Leontia, says that a wise man can seldom marry, because marriage has many drawbacks, and as riches, honors, bodily health, and other things which we call indifferent, are neither good nor bad, but stand, as it were, midway, and become good and bad according to the use and issue, so wives stand on the borderline of good and ill. It is, moreover, a serious matter for a wise man to be in doubt whether he is going to marry a good or a bad woman. Chrysippus ridiculously maintains that a wise man should marry, that he may not outrage Jupiter. Gamelius and Genethlius, for upon that principle the Latins would not marry at all, since they have no Jupiter who presides over marriage. But if, as he thinks, the life of men is determined by the names of gods, whoever chooses to sit will offend Jupiter Stator. Aristotle and Plutriarch and Arsenica have written treaties on matrimony, out of which we have already made some extracts, and now add a few more. The love of beauty is the forgetting of reason, and the near neighbor of madness, a foul blot, little in keeping with a sound mind. It confuses counsel, breaks high and generous spirits, draws away men from great thoughts to mean ones. It makes men quarrelous, ill-tempered, foolhardy, cruelly imperious, servile flatterers, good for nothing, at last not even for love itself. 
for although in the intensity of passion it burns like a raging fire it wastes much time through suspicions tears and complaints it begets hatred of itself and at last hates itself the course of love is laid bare in plato's Adrius, from beginning to end and lysias explains all its drawbacks how it is led not by reason but by frenzy and in particular is a harsh goler over lovely wives seneca too relates that he knew an accomplished man who before going out used to tie his wife's garter upon his breast and could not bear to be absent from her for a quarter of an hour and this pair would never take a drink unless husband and wife alternatively put their lips to the cup and they did other things just as absurd in the extravagant outbursts of their warm but blind affection their love was of an honorable birth but it grew out of all proportion and it makes no difference how honorable may have been the cause of the man's insanity and Zistus, in his sentences tells us that he who too ardently loves his own wife is an adulterer it is disgraceful to love another man's wife at all or one's own too much a wise man ought to love his wife with judgment not with passion let a man govern his voluptuous impulses and not rush headlong into intercourse there is nothing blacker than to love a wife as if she were an adulteress men who say they have contracted marriage and are bringing up children for the good of their country and of their race should at least imitate the brutes and not destroy their offspring in the womb nor should they appear in the character of lovers but of husbands in some cases marriage has grown out of adultery and shameful to relate men have tried to teach their wives chastity after having taken their chastity away marriages of that sort are quickly dissolved when lust is satiated the first allurement gone the charm is lost what shall i say says seneca of the poor men who in numbers are bribed to take the name of husband in order to evade the laws promulgated against bachelors how can he who is married under such conditions be a guide to morality teach chastity and maintain the authority of a husband it is the saying of a very learned man that chastity must be preserved in all costs and that when it is lost all virtue falls to the ground this holds the primacy of all virtues in woman this it is that makes up for a wife's poverty enhances her riches redeems her deformity gives grace to her beauty it makes her act in a way worthy of her forefathers whose blood it does not taint with bastard offspring of her children who through it have no need to blush for their mother or to be in doubt about their father and above all of herself since it defends her from external volition no greater calamity connected with captivity than to be the victim of another's lust the councilship sheds luster upon men eloquence gives eternal renown military glory and a triumph immortalize an obscure family many are the spheres ennobled by splendid ability the virtue of women is in a special sense purity it was this that made lucrea the equal of brutus if it did not make her the, his superior since brutus learned from a woman the impossibility of being a slave it was this that made cornelia a fit match for gratius and portia for a second brutus Tenanquil is better known than her husband. His name, like the names of many other kings, is lost in the midst of antiquity. She, through a virtue rare among women, is too deep-rooted in the hearts of the all ages for her memory ever to perish. Let my married sisters copy the examples of Dieno, Cleobulin, Gorgenti, Timoclea, the claudius and cornelius and when they find the apostle conceding second marriage to depraved women they will read that before the light of our religion shone upon the world wives of one husband ever held high rank among matrons and that by their hands the sacred rites of fortuna malibras were performed that a priest or 
Lamen, twice married, was unknown, and that the high priests of Athens to this day emasculate themselves by drinking hemlock, and once they have been drawn in to the pontificate, cease to be men. End of chapters 46 through 49. End of book 1. Book 2, chapters 1 through 5 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The second proposition of Jovinianius is that the baptized cannot be tempted by the devil, and to escape the imputation of folly in saying this, he adds, But if any are tempted, it only shows that they were baptized with water, not with the Spirit as we read in the case of Simon Magus. Hence it is that John says, Whosoever is begotten of God doeth no sin, because his seed abideth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is begotten of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. And at the end of the epistle, Whosoever is begotten of God sinneth not. But this being begotten of God keepeth him, and the evil one toucheth him not. This would be a real difficulty, and one forever incapable of solution, were it not solved by the witness of John himself, who immediately goes on to say, My little children, guard yourself from idols. If every one that is born of God sinneth not, and cannot be tempted by the devil, how is it that he bids them beware of temptation? Again, in the same epistle we read, if we say that we have no sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I suppose that John was baptized and was writing to the baptized. I imagine, too, that all sin is of the devil. Now John confesses himself a sinner and hopes for forgiveness of sins after baptism. My friend Jovinianius says, Touch me not, for I am clean. What then? Does the apostle contradict himself? By no means. In the same passage he gives his reason for thus speaking. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And hereby know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But those who keepeth his word, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, he that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as he walked. My reason for telling you, little children, is that every one who is born of God sinneth not, is that you may not sin, and that you may know that so long as you sin not, you abide in the birth which God has given you. Yea, they who abide in that birth cannot sin. For what communion hath light with darkness, or Christ with Belial? As day is distinct from night, so righteousness and unrighteousness, sin and good works, Christ and Antichrist cannot blend. If we give Christ a lodging place in our hearts, we banish the devil from thence. If we sin and the devil enter through the gate of sin, Christ will immediately withdraw. Hence David, after sinning, says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, that is, the joy which he had lost by sinning. He who saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Christ is called the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In vain do we make our boast in him whose commandments we keep not. To him that knoweth what is good, and doeth it not, it is sin. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so faith apart from works is dead. We must not think it a great matter to know the only God, when even the devils believe and tremble. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Our opponent may choose whichever of the two he likes. We give him his choice. Does he abide in Christ or not? If he abide, 
let him then walk as Christ walked. But if there is rashness in professing to copy the virtues of our Lord, he does not abide in Christ, for he does not walk as did Christ. He did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. And as a lamb is dumb before its shearer, so opened he not his mouth. To him came the prince of this world, and found nothing in him, although he had done no sin. God made him sin for us, for we, according to the epistle of James, all stumble in many ways. And no one is pure from sin. No, not of his life be but a single day. For who will boast that he has a clean heart? Or who will be sure that he is pure from sin? And we are held guilty after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Hence David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And the blessed Job, Though I be righteous, my mouth will speak wickedness. And though I be perfect, I shall be found perverse. If I wash myself with snow water, and make my hands never so clean, yet wilt thou plunge me in the ditch, and my own clothes shall abhor me. But that we may not utterly despair, and think that if we sin after baptism we cannot be saved, he immediately checks the tendency. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He addresses this to baptized believers, and he promises them the Lord as an advocate for their offenses. He does not say, If you fall into sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Christ, and he is the propitiation for your sins. He might then say that he was addressing those whose baptism had been destitute of the true faith. But what he says is this, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for the sins of John and his contemporaries, but for those of the whole world. Now, in the whole world are included apostles and all the faithful, and a clear proof is established that sin after baptism is possible. It is useless for us to have an advocate, Jesus Christ, if sin be impossible. The Apostle Peter, to whom it was said, he that is bathed need not to wash again, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Through fear of a maidservant denied him. Our Lord himself says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I made supplication for thee, that thy faith fail not. And in the same place, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you reply that this was said before the Passion, we certainly say after the Passion in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If we do not sin after baptism, why do we ask that we may be forgiven our sins, which we were already forgiven in baptism? Why do we pray that we may not enter temptation, and that we may be delivered from the evil one if the devil cannot tempt those who are baptized. The case is different if this prayer belongs to catechumens and is not adopted to faithful Christians. Paul, the chosen vessel, chastised his body and brought it into subjection, lest, after preaching to others, he himself should be found a retrobate. And he tells that there was given to him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And to the Corinthians he writes, I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve in his craftiness, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is toward Christ. And elsewhere, but to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For what I also have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, for your sakes I have forgiven it in the person of Christ, that no advantage may be gained over us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his devices. And again, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as man can bear. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make also the way of escape, that ye may be able to endure it. And let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
and to the Galatians, ye were running well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth. And elsewhere, we would fain have come unto you, I, Paul, once and again, and Satan hindered us. And to the married he says, Be together again, that Satan tempts you not because of your incontinency. And again, But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary, the one to the other, that ye may not do the things that ye would. We are a compound of the two, and must endure the strife of the two substances. And to the Ephesians, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Does anyone think that we are safe, and that it is right to fall asleep when once we have been baptized? And so, too, in the epistle to the Hebrews, for as touching those who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then fell away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Surely we cannot deny that they have been baptized who have been illuminated and have tasted the heavenly gifts, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God. But if the baptized cannot sin, how is it now that the apostle says, and have fallen away? Montanus and Novatus would smile at this, for they contend that it is impossible to renew again through repentance those who have crucified to themselves the Son of God. And he put him to an open shame, he therefore corrects this mistake by saying, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and the things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forgive your work and the love which ye showed towards his name, and that ye ministered unto the saints and still do minister. And truly the unrighteousness of God would be great if he merely punished sin and did not welcome good works. I have so spoken, says the Apostle, to withdraw you from your sins, and to make you more careful through fear of despair. But, beloved, I am persuaded better things of you than things that accompany salvation. For it is not accordant with the righteousness of God to forget good works, and the fact that you have ministered and do minister to the saints for his name's sake, and to remember sins only. The Apostle James also, knowing that the baptized can be tempted and fall of their own free choice, says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he hath been approved, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to them that love him. But that we may not think that we are tempted by God, as we read in Genesis, Abraham was, he adds, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God himself cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempteth no man. But each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then the lust, when it has conceived, beareth sin, and the sin, when it is full grown, bringeth forth death. God created us with free will, and we are not forced by necessity either to virtue or to vice. Otherwise, if there be necessity, there is no crown. As in good works, it is God who brings them to perfection, for it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that pitieth, and give us help that we may be able to reach the goal. So in things wicked and sinful, the seeds within us give us the impulse, and these are brought to maturity by the devil. When he sees that we are building upon the foundation of Christ, hay, wood, stubble, then he applies the match. Let us then build gold, silver, costly stones, and he will not venture to tempt us, although even thus there is not sure and safe possession, for the lion lurks in ambush to slay the innocent. Potter's vessels are proved by the furnace, and just men by the trial of tribulation. And in another place it is written, My son, when thou comest to serve the Lord, prepare thyself for temptation. Again, the same James says, Be ye doers of the word, 
and not hearers only. For if any one is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. It is useless to warn them to add works to faith, if they could not sin after baptism. He tells us that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he has become guilty of all. Which of us is without sin? God has shut up all unto disobedience, that he might have mercy upon all. Peter also says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And concerning false teachers, these are springs without water, and mists driven by a storm, for whom the blackness of darkness hath been reserved. For uttering proud words of vanity, they entice in the lusts of the flesh by levaciousness those who had just escaped and have turned back to error. Does not the apostle in these words seem to you to have depicted the new party of ignorance? For, as it were, they open the fountains of knowledge, and yet have no water. They promise a shower of doctrine like prophetic clouds, which have been visited by the truth of God, and are driven back by the storms of devils and vices. They speak great things, and their talk is nothing but pride. But every one is unclean with God, who is lifted up in his own heart. Like those who had just escaped from their sins, they return to their own error, and persuade men to luxury, and to the delights of eating, and the gratification of the flesh. For who is not glad to hear them say, Let us eat and drink and reign for ever? The wise and prudence they call corrupt, but pay more attention to the honey-tongued. John the Apostle, or rather the Savior in the person of John, writes thus to the angel of the church of Ephesus, I know thy works and thy toil and patience, and that thou didst bear for my name's sake, and hast not grown weary. But I have this against thee, that thou didst leave thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee, and I will move thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Similarly, he urges the other churches, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, to repent, and threatens them unless they return to the former works. And in Sardis, he says, he has a few who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with him in white, for they are worthy. But they to whom he says, Remember from whence thou art fallen, and behold the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is, and remember how thou hast received, and didst hear, and keep it, and repent, and so on. Were, of course, believers and baptized, who once stood but fell through sin. I delayed for a little while the production of proofs from the Old Testament, because wherever the Old Testament is against them, they are accustomed to cry out that the law and the prophets were until John. But who does not know that under the other dispensation of God, all the saints of past times were of equal merit with Christians at the present day? As Abraham in days gone by pleased God in wedlock, so virgins now please him in perpetual virginity. He served the law in his own times. Let us now serve the gospel in our times, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. David the Chosen One, the man after God's own heart, who had performed all his pleasure, and who in a certain psalm had said, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, and shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Even he was afterwards tempted by the devil, and repenting of his sins said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. He would have a great sin blotted out by great loving kindness. Solomon, beloved of the Lord, and to whom God had twice revealed himself, because he loved women, forsook the love of God. It is related in the Book of Days that Manassas, the wicked king, was restored after the Babylonish captivity to his former rank. In Josiah, a holy man was slain by the king of Egypt on the plain of Megiddo. 
Joshua also, the son of Josedek, and the high priests, although he was a type of our Savior who bore our sins and united to himself a church of alien birth from among the Gentiles, is nevertheless, according to the letter of Scripture, represented in filthy garments after he attained to the priesthood, and with the devil standing at his right hand, and white raiment is afterwards restored to him. It is needless to tell how Moses and Aaron offended God at the water of strife, and did not enter the land of promise. For the blessed Job relates that even the angels and every creature can sin. Shall mortal man, he says, be just before God? Shall a man be spotless in his works, if he putteth no trust in his servants, and chargeth his angels with folly? How much more them that dwell in houses of clay, amongst whom are we, and made of the same clay too? The life of man is a warfare upon earth. Lucifer fell, who was sending to all the nations, and he who was nurtured in a paradise of delight as one of the twelve precious stones was wounded and went down to hell from the mount of God. Hence the Savior says in the Gospel, I beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. If he fell who stood on so sublime a height, who may not fall? If there are falls in heaven, how much more on earth? And yet, though Lucifer be fallen, the old serpent after his fall, his strength is in his loins, and his great force is in the muscles of his belly. The great trees are overshadowed by him, and he sleepeth beside the reed, the rush, and the sedge. He is king over all things that are in the waters, that is to say, in the seat of pleasure and luxury, of propagation of children, and of the fertilization of the marriage bed. For who can strip off his outer garment? Who can open the doors of his face? Nations fatten upon him, and the tribes of Phoenicia divide him. And lest haply the reader in his secret thought might imagine that those tribes of Phoenicia and the people of Ethiopia only are meant by those to whom the dragon was given for food, we immediately find a reference to those who are crossing the sea of this world and are hastening to reach the haven of salvation. His head stands in the ships of the fishermen like an anvil that cannot be wearied. He counteth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood, and all the gold of the sea under him is as mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He values the sea like a pot of ointment and the blackness of the deep as a captive. He beholdeth everything that is nigh, and my friend Jovinianus thinks he can gain an easy mastery over him. Why speak of holy men and angels, who, being the creatures of God, are of course capable of sin? He dares to tempt the Son of God, and though smitten through and through with our Lord's first and second answer, nevertheless raised his head, and then thrice wounded, withdrew only for a time, and deferred rather than removed the temptation. And we flatter ourselves on the ground of our baptism, which, though it put away the sins of the past, cannot keep us for the time to come, unless the baptized keep their hearts with all diligence. At length we have arrived at the question of food, and are confronted by our third difficulty. All things are created for the use of mortal men. And, as man, a rational animal, in a sense the owner and tenant of the world, is subject to God and worships his creator, so all things living were created either for the food of men, or for clothing, or for tilling the earth, or conveying the fruits thereof, or to be the companions of man. And hence, because they are man's helpers, they have their name, Jumentia. What is man, says David, that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crownest him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Granted, he says, that the ox was created for plowing, the horse for riding, the dog for watching, goats for their milk, sheep for their fleeces. What is the use of swine if we may not eat their flesh? 
of roes, stags, fallow deer, boars, hares, and like such game, of geese, wild and tame, of wild ducks and fig peckers, of woodcocks, of coots or thrushes. Why do hens run about our houses if they were not eaten? All these creatures were created by God for nothing. But what need is there of argument when Scripture clearly teaches that every moving creature, like herbs and vegetables, were given to us for food? And the Apostle cries aloud, All things are clean to the clean, and nothing is to be rejected, if it is to be received with thanksgiving, and tells us that men will come in the last days forbidding to marry and to eat meats which God created for use. The Lord himself was called by the Pharisees a wine-bibber and a glutton, the friend of publicans and sinners, because he did not decline the invitation of Zacchaeus at to dinner and went to the marriage feast. But it is a different matter if you may foolishly contend he went to the dinner intending to fast, and after the manner of deceivers said, I eat this, not that, I do not drink the wine which I created out of water. He did not make water but wine, the type of his blood. After the resurrection, he ate a fish and part of a honeycomb, not sesame nuts and service berries. The apostle Peter did not wait like a Jew for the stars to peep, but went upon the housetop to dine at the sixth hour. Paul in the ship broke bread, not dried figs. When Timothy's stomach was out of order, he advised him to drink wine, not parry. In abstaining from meats, they pleased their own fancy, as though superstitious Gentiles did not observe the rites of abstinence connected with the mother of the gods and with Isis. End of Book 2, Chapters 1 through 5book two chapters six through ten of against jovinianius by saint jerome this librivox recording is in the public domain i will follow in detail the views now expounded and before i come to scripture and show by it that fasting is pleasing to god and chastity accepted by him i will meet philosophic argument with argument and will prove that we are not followers of Empedocles and Pythagoras, who, on account of their doctrine of the transmigration of souls, think nothing which lives and moves should be eaten, and look upon him who fell a fir tree or an oak as equally guilty with the parasite or the poisoner, but that we worship our Creator who made all things for the use of man. And as the ox was created for plowing, the horse for riding, dogs for watching, goats for milk, sheep for their wool, so it was with swine and stags and roes and hares and other animals. But the immediate purpose of their creation was not that they might serve for food, but for other uses of men. For if everything that moves and lives was made for food and prepared for the stomach, let my opponents tell me why elephants, lions, leopards, and wolves were created, why vipers, scorpions, bugs, lice, and fleas, why the vulture, the eagle, the crow, the hawk, why whales, dolphins, seals, and small snails were created? Which of us ever eats the flesh of a lion, a viper, a vulture, a stork, a kite, or the worms that crawl upon our shores? As then these have their proper uses, so may we say that other beasts, fishes, birds, were created not for eating, but for medicine, in short, to how many uses the flesh of vipers, from which we make our antidotes against poison, may be applied, physicians know well. Ivory dust is an ingredient in many remedies. Hyena's gall restores brightness to the eyes, and its dung, that of dogs, cures gangrenous wounds. And it may seem strange to the reader. Galleon asserts in his treatise on simples, that human dung is of service in a multitude of cases. Naturalists say that snakeskin, boiled in oil, gives wonderful relief in earache. What to the uninitiated seems so useless as a bug? Yet suppose a leech to have fastened on the throat. As soon as the odor of a bug is inhaled, the leech is vomited out, and difficulty in urinating is relieved by the same application. As for the fat of pigs, geese, fowls, and pheasants, 
how useful they are is told in all medical works. And if you read these books, you will see there that the vulture has as many curative properties as it has limbs. Peacock's dung allays the inflammation of gout. Cranes, storks, eagle's gall, hawk's blood, the ostrich, frogs, chameleons, swallow's dung, and flesh. In what diseases these are suitable remedies, I could tell if it were my purpose to discuss bodily ailments and their cure. If you think proper, you may read Aristotle and Theophrastes in prose, or Marcellus of Side, and our Flavius, who discourse on these subjects in Hexamer verse. The second Pliny also, and Dioscordes, and others, both naturalists and physicians, who assign to every herb, every stone, every animal, whether reptile, bird, or fish, its own use in the art of which they treat. So then, when you ask me why the pig was created, I immediately reply, as if two boys were disputing, by asking you why were vipers and scorpions. You must not judge that anything from the hand of God is superfluous, because there are many beasts and birds which your palate rejects. But this may perhaps look more like contentiousness and pugnacity than truth. Let me tell you, therefore, that pigs and wild boars and stags and the rest of living creatures were created, that soldiers, athletes, sailors, rhetoricians, miners, and other slaves of hard toil who need physical strength might have food, and also those who carry arms and provisions, who wear themselves out with the work of hand or foot, who ply the oar, who need good lungs to shout and speak, who level mountains and sleep out rain or fair. But our religion does not train boxers, athletes, soldiers, or ditchers, but followers of wisdom, who devote themselves to the worship of God, and know why they were created, and are in the world from which they are impatient to depart. Hence also the apostle says, When I am weak, then I am strong, and though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day, and I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Are all commanded not to have two coats, nor food in their script, money in their purse, a staff in their hand, shoes on the feet, or to sell all they possess and give to the poor, and follow Jesus? Of course not. But the command is for those who wish to be perfect. On the contrary, John the Baptist lays down one rule for the soldiers, another for the publicans. But the Lord says in the gospel, to him who had boasted of having kept the whole law, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come follow me. That he might not seem to lay a heavy burden on unwilling shoulders, he sent us here away with full power to please himself, saying, If thou wilt be perfect. And so I say to you, if you wish to be perfect, it is good not to drink wine and eat flesh. If you wish to be perfect, it is better to enrich your mind than to stuff the body. But if you are an infant and fond of the cooks and their preparations, no one will snatch the dainties out of your mouth. Eat and drink, and if you like... With Israel, rise up and play and sing. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Let him eat and drink who looks for death when he has feasted, who says with Epicurus, There is nothing after death, and death itself is nothing. We believe Paul when he says in tones of thunder, Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God will destroy both them and it. I have quoted these few passages of Scripture to show that we are not one with the philosophers. But who does not know that no universal law of nature regulates the food of all nations, and that each eats those things of which it has an abundance? For instance, the Arabians and the Saracens and all the wild tribes of the desert live on camel's milk and flesh. For the camel is suit to the climate and barren soil of those regions, is easily bred and reared. They think it wicked to eat the flesh of swine. Why? Because pigs which fatten on acorns, chestnuts, roots of ferns, and barley are seldom or never found among them. And if they were found, they would not afford the nourishment of which we spoke just now. 
The exact opposite is the case with the northern peoples. If you were to force them to eat the flesh of asses and camels, they would think it the same as though they were compelled to devour a wolf or a crow. In Pontus and Phyriga, a, a paterfamilias pays a good price for fat white worms with blackish heads, which breed in decayed wood. And as with us, the woodcock and figpecker, the mullet and scar, are reputed delicacies. So with them it is a luxury to eat the xylophagus. Again, because throughout the glowing wastes of the desert clouds, of locusts are found. It is customary with the people of the East and of Libya to feed on locusts. John the Baptist proves the truth of this. Compel the Phyregan, or the native of Pontus, to eat a locust, and he will think it scandalous. Force a Syrian, an African, or Arabian to swallow worms. He will have the same contempt for them as for flies, millipedes, and lizards. Although the Syrians are accustomed to eat land crocodiles, and the Africans even green lizards. In Egypt and Palestine, owing to the scarcity of cattle, no one eats beef or makes the flesh of bulls or oxen or calves a portion of their food. Moreover, in my province, it is considered a crime to eat veal. Accordingly, the Emperor Valens recently promulgated a law throughout the East prohibiting the killing and eating of calves. He had in view the interests of agriculture, and wished to check the bad practice of the commoner sort of people who imitated the Jews in devouring the flesh of calves instead of fowls and suckling pigs. The nomad tribes and the troglodytes and the Scythians and the barbarous Huns with whom we have recently become acquainted eat flesh half raw. Moreover, the Ichthyophagi, a wandering race on the shores of the Red Sea, broil fish on the stones made hot by the sun and subsist on this poor food. The Samaritans and and the Chuadai, the Vandals, and the countless other races delight in the flesh of horses and wolves. Why should I speak of other nations when I myself, a youth on a visit to Gaul, heard that the Adakoti, a British tribe, eat human flesh, and that although they find herds of swine and droves of large or small cattle in the woods, it is their custom to cut off the buttocks of the shepherds and the breasts of their women, and to regard them as the greatest delicacies. The Scots have no wives of their own, as though they read Plato's Republic and took Cato for their leader. No man among them has his own wife, but like beasts they indulge their lust to their heart's content. The Persians, Medes, Indians, and Ethiopians, people on a par with Rome itself, have intercourse with mothers and grandmothers, with daughters and granddaughters. The Massagetae and Derbix think those persons most unhappy who die of sickness, and when parents, kindred, or friends reach old age, they are murdered and devoured. It is thought better that they should be eaten by the people themselves than by the worms. The Tabarini crucify those whom they have loved before when they have grown old. The Hircani throw them out half alive to the birds and dogs. The Caspians leave them dead for the same beasts. The Scythians bury alive with the remnants of the dead those who were beloved of the deceased. The Bacterians throw their old men to dogs which they rear for the very purpose. And when Stasinor, Alexander's general, wished to correct the practice, he almost lost his province. Force an Egyptian to drink sheep's milk, drive if you can, a Pelusio to eat an onion. Almost every city in Egypt venerates its own beasts and monsters, and whatever be the object of worship, that they think inviolable and sacred. Hence it is that their towns also are named after animals. Leonto, Sino, Lyco, Biziris, Emuis, which is being interpreted a he-goat, and to make us understand what sort of gods Egyptians always welcomed, one of their cities was recently called Antios, after Hadrian's favorite. You see clearly, then, that not only in eating, but also in burial, in wedlock, and in every other department of life, each race follows its own practice and particular usages, and takes 
that for the law of nature which is most familiar to it. But suppose all nations alike ate flesh, and let that be everywhere lawful which the place produces. How does it concern us, whose conversation is in heaven, who, as well as Pythagoras and Empedocles, and all lovers of wisdom, are not bound to the circumstances of our birth, but of our new birth, who by abstinence subject our our refractory flesh, eager to follow the allurements of lust, the eating of flesh and drinking of wine, and fullness of stomach, is the seed plot of lust. And so the comic poet says, Venus shivers unless Sirius and Bacchus be with her. Through the five senses, as through open windows, vice has access to the soul. The metropolis and citadel of the mind cannot be taken unless the enemy have previously entered by its doors. The soul is distressed by the disorder they produce, and is led captive by sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. If anyone delights in the sports of the circus or the struggles of athletes, the versatility of actors, the figure of women, and splendid jewels, dress, silver, and gold, and other things of the kind, the liberty of the soul is lost through the windows of the eyes, and the prophet's words are fulfilled. Death is come up into our windows. Again, our sense of hearing is flattered by the tones of various instruments and the modulations of the voice, and whatever enters the ear by the songs of the poets and comedians, by the pleasantries and verses of pantomonic actors, weakens the manly fiber of the mind. Then again, no one but a profligate denies that the profligate and licentious find a delight in sweet odors. Different sorts of incense, fragrant blossom, cufi, onanathi, and musk, which is nothing but the skin of a foreign rat. And who does not know that gluttony is the mother of avarice, and, as it were, fetters the heart and keeps it pressed down upon the earth? For the sake of a temporary gratification of the appetite, land and sea are ransacked, and we toil and sweat our lives through that we may send down our throats honey wine and costly food. The desire to handle other men's persons and the burning lust for women is a passion boarding on insanity. To gratify this sense we languish, grow angry, throw ourselves about with joy, indulge envy, engage in rivalry, are filled with anxiety, and when we have terminated the pleasure with more or less repentance, we once more take fire and want to do that which we again regret doing. Where, then, that which we may call the thin edge of disturbance has entered the citadel of the mind through these doors? What will become of its liberty, its endurance, its thought of God, particularly since the sense of touch can picture to itself even bygone pleasures, and through the recollection of vice forces the soul to take part in them, and after a manner to practice what it does not actually commit. At the call of reasoning, such as this, many philosophers have forsaken the crowded cities and their pleasure gardens in the suburbs with well-watered grounds, shady trees, twittering birds, crystal fountains, murmuring brooks, and many charms for eye and ear, lest through luxury and abundance of riches the firmness of the mind should be enfeebled and its purity debauched. For there is no good in frequently seeing objects which may one day lead to your captivity, or in making trial of things which you would find it hard to do without. Even the Pythagoreans shunned company of this kind, and were wont to dwell in solitary places in the desert. The Platonists also, and the Stoics, lived in the groves and porticos of the temples, that, admonished by the sanctity of their restricted abode, they might think of nothing but virtue. Plato, moreover, himself, when Diogenes trampled on his couches with muddy feet, he being a rich man, chose a house called Academia at some distance from the city, in a spot not only lonely but unhealthy, so that he might have leisure for philosophy. His object was that, by constant anxiety about sickness, the assaults of lust might be defeated, and that his disciples might experience no pleasure but that afforded by the things they learned. 
we have read of some who took out their own eyes lest through sight they might lose contemplation of philosophy hence it was that crates the famous theoban after throwing into the sea a considerable weight of gold exclaimed go to the bottom ye evil lusts i will drown you that you may not drown me but if any one thinks to enjoy keenly meat and drink in excess and at the same time to devote himself to philosophy that is to say to live in luxury and yet not be hampered by the vices attendant on luxury he deceives himself for if it be the case that even when far distant from them we are frequently caught in the snares of nature and are compelled to desire those things of which we have a scant supply what folly it is to think we are free when we are surrounded by the nets of pleasure we think of what we see hear smell taste handle and are led to desire the thing which affords us pleasure that the mind sees and hears and that we can neither hear nor see anything unless our senses are fixed upon the object of sight and hearing is an old saw it is difficult or rather impossible when we are swimming in luxury and pleasure not to think of what we are doing and it is an idle pretense which some men put forward that they can take their fill of pleasure with their faith in purity and mental uprightness unimpaired it is a violation of nature to revel in pleasure and the apostle gives a caution against this very thing when he says she that giveth herself to pleasure is dead while she liveth the bodily senses are like horses madly racing but the soul like a charioteer holds the reins and as horses without a driver go at breakneck speed so the body if it be not governed by the reasonable soul rushes to its own destruction the philosophers make use of another illustration of the relations between soul and body they say the body is a boy the soul his tutor hence the historian tells us that our soul directs our body serves the one we have in common with the gods the other with the beasts so then unless the vices of youth and boyhood are regulated by the wisdom of the tutor every effort and every impulse sets strongly in the direction of wantonness we might lose four of the senses and yet live that is we could do without sight hearing smell and the pleasures of touch but a human cannot subsist without tasting food it follows that reason must be present that we may take food of such kind and in such quantities as will not burden the body or hinder the free movement of the soul for it is the same way with us that we eat and walk and sleep and digest our food and afterwards in the fullness of blood have to bear the spur of lust wine is a mocker strong drink a brawler whosoever has much to do with these is not wise and we should not take such food as is difficult of digestion or such as when eaten will give us reason to complain that we got it and lost it with much effort the preparation of vegetables fruits and pulse is easy and does not require the skill of expensive cooks our bodies are nourished by them with little trouble on our part and if taken in moderation such food is easier to digest and at less cost because it does not stimulate the appetite and therefore is not devoured with much avidity no one has his stomach inflated or overloaded if he eats only one or two dishes and those inexpensive ones such a condition comes of pampering the taste with a variety of meats the smells of the kitchen may induce us to eat but when hunger is satisfied they make us their slaves and scourging gives rise to disease and many persons find relief for the discomfort of gluttony and emetics what they disgrace themselves by putting in was still greater disgrace put out end of book two chapters six through ten book two chapters eleven through fifteen of against juvenianus by saint jerome this LibriVox recording is in the public domain hippocrates in his of forums teaches that stout persons of a coarse habit of body when once they have attained their full growth unless the philathra be quickly relieved by bloodletting develop tendencies to paralysis 
and the worst forms of disease. They must therefore be bled, that there may be room for fresh growth, for it is not the nature of our bodies to continue in one stay, but go either to increase or decrease, and no animal can live which is incapable of growth. When Galen, a very learned man, and a commentator on Hippocrates, says in his exhortation to the practice of medicine, that athletes whose whole life and art consist in stuffing cannot live long nor be healthy, and that their souls enveloped with superfluous blood and fat, and, as it were, covered with mud, have no refined or heavenly thoughts, but are always intent upon gluttonous and voracious feasting. Diogenes maintains that tyrants do not bring about revolutions in cities and foment wars civil or foreign for the sake of a simple diet of vegetables and fruit, but for costly meats and the delicacies of the table. And strange to say, Epicurus, the defender of pleasure, in all his books speaks of nothing but vegetables and fruits. And he says that we ought to live on cheap food because the preparation of sumptuous banquets of flesh involves great care and suffering, and greater pains attend the search for such delicacies than pleasures the consumption of them. Our bodies need only something to eat and drink. Where there is bread and water and the like, nature is satisfied. Whatever more there be, be does not go to meet the wants of life, but are ministers to voracious pleasure. Eating and drinking does not quench the longing for luxuries, but appeases hunger and thirst. Persons who feed on flesh want also gratifications not found in flesh, but they who adopt a simple diet do not look for flesh. Further, we cannot devote ourselves to wisdom if our thoughts are running on a well-laden table, the supply of which requires an excess of work and anxiety. The wants of nature are soon satisfied, cold and hunger can be banished with simple food and clothing. Hence the apostle says, having food and clothing, let us be therewith content. Delicacies and various dishes of the feast are the nurses of avarice. The soul greatly exalts when you are content with little. You have the world beneath your feet. You can exchange all its power, its feasts and its lusts, the objects for which men rake money together for common food and make up for them all with a sackcloth shirt. Take away the luxurious feasting and the gratification of lust, and no one will want riches to be used either in the belly or beneath it. The invalid only regains his health by diminishing and carefully selecting his food, i.e., in medical phrase, by adopting a slender diet. The same food that recovers health can preserve it, for no one can imagine vegetables to be the cause of disease. And if vegetables do not give the strength of Milo of Crotona, a strength supplied and nourished by meat, what need has a wise man and a Christian philosopher of such strength as is required by athletes and soldiers, and which, if he had it, would only stimulate to vice? Let those persons deem meat accordant with health who wish to gratify their lust, and who, sunk in filthy pleasure, are always at heat. But what a Christian wants is health but not superfluous strength, and it ought not to disturb us if we find but few supporters. For the pure and temperate are as rare as good and faithful friends, and virtue is always scarce. Study the temperance of Fabricus or the poverty of Curius, and in your great city you will find few worthy of your imitation. You need not fear that if you do not eat flesh Fowlers and hunters will have learnt their craft in vain. We have read that some who suffered with disease of joints and with gouty humors recovered their health by prescribing delicacies and coming down to a simple board and mean food, for they were then free from the worry of managing a house and from unlimited feasting. Horace makes fun of the longing for food, which when eaten leaves nothing but regret. Scorn pleasure, she but hurts when bought with pain. And when, in the delightful retirement of the country, by way of satirizing voluptuous men, he described himself as plump and fat, his sportive verse ran thus, 
Pay me a visit if you want to laugh. You'll find me fat and sleek, with well-dressed hide, like any pig from Epicurus's sty. But even if our food be the commonest, we must avoid repletion, for nothing is so destructive to the mind as a full belly, fermenting like a wine vat, and giving forth its gases on all sides. What sort of fasting is it? Or what sort of refreshment is there after fasting, when we are blown out with yesterday's dinner, and our stomach is made a factory for the closet? We wish to get credit for protracted abstinence, and all the while we devour so much that a day and nights can scarcely digest it. The proper name to give it is not fasting, but rather debauch and rank indigestion. Dicurchus, in his Book of Antiquities, describing Greece, relates that under Saturn, that is, in the Golden Age, when the ground brought forth all things abundantly, no one ate flesh, but everyone lived on field produce, and fruits which the earth bore of itself. Xenophon, in eight books, narrates the life of Cyrus, king of the Persians, and asserts that they supported life on barley, cress, salt, and black bread. Both the aforesaid Xenophon, Theophratus, and almost all the Greek writers testify to the frugal diet of the Spartans. Cherimon the Stoic, a man of great eloquence, has a treaty on the life of the ancient priests of Egypt, who, he says, laid aside all worldly business and cares, and were ever in the temple, studying nature and regulating causes of the heavenly bodies. They never had intercourse with women. They never, from the time they began to devote themselves to the divine service, set eyes on their kindred and relations, nor even saw their children. They always abstained from flesh and wine on account of the light-headedness and dizziness which a small quantity of food caused, and especially to avoid the stimulation of the lustful appetite engendered by this meat and drink. They seldom ate bread, and they might not load the stomach, but whenever they ate it, they mixed pounded hyssop with all they took, so that the action of its warmth might diminish the weight of the heavier food. They used no oil except vegetables, and then only in small quantities to mitigate the unpalatable taste. What need, he says, to speak of the birds, when they avoided even eggs and milk as flesh? The one, they said, was liquid flesh, the other was blood, with the color changed. Their bed was made of palm leaves, called by them bioe. A sloping footstool laid on the ground served for a pillow, and they could go without food for two or three days. The humors of the body which arise from sedentary habits are dried up by reducing their diet to an extreme point. Josephus, in the second book of the history of the Jewish captivity, and in the eighteenth book of the Antiquities, and the two treaties against Appion, describes three sects of the Jews, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essians. On the last of these, he bestows wondrous praise, because they practice perpetual abstinence from wives, wine, and flesh, and made a second nature of their daily fast. Philo, too, a man of great learning, published a treatise of his own on their mode of life. The Anthes of Sisychus and Asclepides of Cyrus, at the same time when Pygmalion ruled over the East, related that the eating of flesh was unknown. Eubulus, also, who wrote the history of the Mithras, in many volumes, relates that among the Persians there are three kinds of magi, the first of whom, those of greatest learning and eloquence, take no food except meal and vegetables. At Eleusis, it is customary to abstain from fowls and fish and certain fruits. Bardisans, a Babylonian, divides the gymnosophists of India into two classes the one called Brahmins, and the other Samaneans, who are so rigidly self-restrained that they support themselves either with the fruit of trees which grow on the banks of the Ganges, or with common food of rice or flour. And when the king visits them, he is wont to adore them, and thinks the peace of his country depends upon their prayers. Euripides relates that the prophets of Jupiter in Crete, abstain not only from flesh, but also from cooked food. Xenocrates, the philosopher, 
writes that at Athens, out of all the laws of Cryptolemos, only three precepts remain in the temple of Ceres. Respect to parents, reverence for the gods, and abstinence from flesh. Orphos, in his song, utterly denounces the eating of flesh. I might speak of the frugality of Pythagoras, Socrates, and Antithenes to our confusion, but it would be tedious and re would require a work to itself. At all events, this is an antithesis who, after teaching rhetoric with renown on hearing Socrates, is related to have said to his disciples, Go and seek a master, for I have now found one. He immediately sold what he had, divided the proceeds among the people, and kept nothing for himself but a small cloak. Of his poverty and toil, Xenophon, in the symposium, is a witness, and so are his countless treatises, some philosophical, some rhetorical. His most famous follower was the great Diogenes, who was mightier than King Alexander, and that he conquered human nature. For antithesis would not take a single pupil, and when he could not get rid of the persistent Diogenes, he threatened him with a stick if he did not depart. The latter is said to have laid down his head and said, No stick will be hard enough to prevent me from following you. Satyrus, the biographer of illustrious men, relates that Diogenes, to guard himself against the cold, folded his cloak double. His script was his pantry. In one age he carried a stick to support his feeble frame and was commonly called Old Hand to Mouth because to that very hour he begged and received food from anyone. His home was the gateways and city arcades. And when he wriggled into his tub, he would joke about his movable house that adopted itself to the seasons. And when the weather was cold, he used to turn the mouth of the tub towards the south, and summer towards the north, in whatever the direction of the sun might be. That way the palace of Diogenes was turned. He had a wooden dish for drinking, but on one occasion, seeing a boy drinking with the hollow of his hand, he is related to have dashed the cup to the ground, saying that he did not know nature provided a cup. His virtue and self-restraint were proved even by his death. It is said that, now an old man, he was on his way to the Olympic Games, which used to be attended by a great concourse of people from all parts of Greece. Then he was overtaken by fever and laid down upon the bank by the roadside. And when his friends wished to place him on a beast or in a conveyance, he did not assent, but crossing to the shade of a tree said, Go your way, I pray you, and see the games. This night will prove me either conquered or conqueror. If I conquer the fever, I shall go to the games. If the fever conquers me, I shall enter the unseen world. There, through the night, he lay gasping for breath, and did not, as we are told, so much die as banish the fever by death. I have cited the example of only one philosopher, so that our fine, erect, muscular athletes, who hardly make a shadow of a footmark in their swift passage, whose words are in their fists and the reasoning in their heels, who either know nothing of apostolic poverty and the hardness of the cross, or despise it, may at least imitate Gentile moderation. So far I have dealt with the arguments and examples of philosophers. Now I will pass on to the beginning of the human race, that is, to the sphere which belongs to us, I will first point out that Adam received a command in paradise to abstain from one tree, though he might eat the other fruit. The blessedness of paradise could not be consecrated without abstinence from food. So long as he fasted, he remained in paradise. He ate and was cast out. He was no sooner cast out than he married a wife. While he fasted in paradise, he continued a virgin. When he filled himself with food in the earth, he bound himself with the tie of marriage. And yet, though cast out, he did not immediately receive permission to eat flesh, but only the fruits of trees and the produce of the crops and the herbs and vegetables were given him for food, that even when an exile from paradise, he might feed not upon the flesh which was not to be found in paradise, 
but upon grain and fruit like that of paradise but afterwards when god saw that the heart of man from his youth was set on wickedness continually and that his spirit could not remain in them because they were flesh he by the deluge passed sentence on the works of the flesh and taking note of the extreme greediness of men gave them liberty to eat flesh so that while understanding that all things were lawful for them they might not greatly desire that which was allowed lest they should turn a commandment into a cause of transgression and yet even then fasting was in part commanded for seeing that some animals are called clean some unclean and the unclean animals were taken into noah's ark by pairs the clean in uneven numbers and of course the eating of the unclean was forbidden otherwise the term unclean would be its unmeaning fasting was in part consecrated restraints in the use of all was taught by the prohibition of some why did esau lose his birthright was it not on account of food and he could not atone with tears for the impatience of his appetite the people of israel cast out from egypt and on their way to the land of promise the land flowing with milk and honey longed for the flesh of egypt and the melons and garlic saying would that we had died by the hand of the lord in the land of egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and again who shall give us flesh to eat we remember the fish which we did eat in egypt for naught the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic but now our soul is dried away we have not saved this manna to look for to they despised angels food and sighed for the flesh of egypt moses for forty days and forty nights fasted on mount sinai and showed even then that man does not live on bread alone but on every word of god he says to the lord the people is full and maketh idols moses with empty stomach received the law written with the finger of god the people that ate and drank and rose up to play fashioned a golden calf and preferred an egyptian ox to the majesty of the lord the toil of so many days perished through fullness of a single hour moses boldly broke the tables for he knew that drunkards cannot hear the word of god the beloved grew thick waxed fat and became sleek he kicked and forsook the lord which made him and departed from the god of his salvation hence also it is enjoined in the same book of deuteronomy beware lest when thou hast eaten and drunk and hast built goodly houses and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and gold is multiplied then thy heart be lifted up and thou forget the lord thy god in short the people ate and their heart grew thick lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart so the people well fed and fat fleshed could not bear the countenance of moses who fasted for to correctly render the hebrew it was furnished with horns through his converse with god and it was not as some think to show that there is no difference between virginity and marriage but to assert his sympathy with severe fasting that our lord and saviour when he was transfigured on the mount revealed moses and elias with himself in glory although moses and elias were properly types of the law and the prophets as is clearly witnessed by the gospel they spake of his departure which he was about to accomplish at jerusalem for the passion of our lord is declared not by virginity or marriage but by the law and the prophets if however any persons contentiously maintain that by moses is signified marriage by elias virginity let me tell them briefly that moses died and was buried but elias was carried off in a chariot of fire and entered on immortality before he approached death but the second writing of the tables could not be effected without fasting what was lost by drunkenness was regained by abstinence a proof that by fasting we can return to paradise whence through fullness we have been expelled in exodus we read that the battle was fought against amalek while moses prayed and the whole people fasted until the evening joshua the son of nun bade sun and moon stand still and the victorious army prolonged its fast for more than a day 
Saul, as it is written in the first book of Kings, pronounced a curse on him who ate bread before the evening, and until he had avenged himself upon his enemies. So none of his people tasted any food, and all they of the land took food. And so binding was a solemn fast, once it was proclaimed to the Lord that Jonathan, to whom the victory was due, was taken by lots and could not escape the charge of sinning and ignorance. And his father's hand was raised against him, and the prayers of the people scarce availed to save him. Elijah, after the preparation of a forty days' fast, saw God on Mount Horeb, and heard from him the words, What dost thou hear, Elijah? There is much more familiarity in this than in the Where art thou, Adam, of Genesis. The latter was intended to excite the fears of one who had fed and was lost. The former was affectionately addressed to a fasting servant. When the people were assembled in Mizpah, Samuel proclaimed a fast, and so strengthened them, and thus made them prevail against the enemy. The attack of the Assyrians was repulsed, and the might of Sennacherib utterly crushed by the tears and sackcloth of king hezekiah and by his humbling himself with fasting so also the city of nineveh by fasting excited compassion and turned aside the threatening wrath of the lord and sodom and gomorrah might have appeased it had they been willing to repent and through the aid of fasting gained for themselves tears of repentance ahab the most impious of kings by fasting and wearing sackcloth succeeded in escaping the sentence of god and deferring the overthrow of his house to the days of his posterity. Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, by fasting won the gift of a son. At Babylon, the magicians came into peril. Every interpreter of dreams, soothsayer, and diviner was slain. Daniel and the three youths gained a good report by fasting, and although they were fed on pulse, they were fairer and wiser than they who ate the flesh from the king's table. Then it is written that Daniel fasted for three weeks. He ate no pleasant bread, flesh, and wine entered not his mouth. He was not anointed with oil. And the angel came to him, saying, Daniel, thou art worthy of compassion. He who in the eyes of God was worthy of compassion, afterwards was an object of terror to the lions in their den. How fair a thing is that which propitiates God, tames lions, terrifies demons. Habakkuk, although we do not find this in the Hebrew scriptures, was sent to him with a reaper's meal, for by a week's abstinence he had merited so distinguished a server. David, when his son was in danger after his adultery, made confession in ashes and with fasting. He tells us that he ate ashes like bread and mingled his drink with weeping, and that his knees became weak through fasting. Yet he had certainly heard from Nathan the words, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Samson and Samuel drank neither wine nor strong drink, for they were children of promise, and conceived in abstinence and fasting. Aaron and the other priests, when about to enter the temple, refrained from all intoxicating drink for fear they should die. Whence we learn that they die who minister in the church without sobriety, and hence it is a reproach against Israel. Ye gave my Nazarites wine to drink. Jonadab, the son of Rechab, commanded his sons to drink no wine forever. And when Jeremiah offered them wine to drink, and they of their own accord refused it, the Lord spake by the prophet, saying, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and Jonadab the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me for ever. On the threshold of the gospel appears Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the wife of one husband, and a woman who was always fasting. Long continued chastity and persistent fasting welcomed a virgin lord. His forerunner and herald John fed on locusts and wild honey, not on flesh, and the hermits of the desert and the monks in their cells at first used the same substance. But the Lord himself consecrated his baptism by a forty days fast, and he taught us the more violent devils cannot be overcome except by prayer and fasting. 
Cornelius the centurion was found worthy through almsgiving and frequent fasts to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit before baptism. The Apostle Paul, after speaking of hunger and thirst and his other labors, perils from robbers, shipwrecks, loneliness, enumerates frequent fasts, and he advises his disciple Timothy, who had a weak stomach and was subject to many infirmities, to drink wine in moderation. Drink no longer water, he says. The fact that he bids him no longer drink water shows that he had previously drunk water. The apostle would not have allowed this had not frequent infirmities and bodily pain demanded the concession. End of Book 2, Chapters 11 through 15Book 2, Chapters 16 through 20 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Apostle does indeed blame those who forbade marriage and commanded to abstain from food, which God created for use with thanksgiving. But he has in view Marcion and Tatian and the other heretics who inculcate perpetual abstinence to destroy and express their hatred and contempt for the works of the Creator. But we praise every creature of God, and yet prefer leanness to corpulence, absence to luxury, fasting to fullness. He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, and he is eager to his own destruction. And from the days of John the Baptist, who fasted and was a virgin, until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the men of violence take it by force. For we are afraid, lest at the coming of the eternal judge we be caught, as in the days of the flood, and at the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, eating and drinking, and marrying, and giving in marriage. For both the flood and the fire from heaven found fullness, as well as marriage ready for destruction. Nor need we wonder if the apostle commands that everything sold in the market be bought and eaten, since with idolaters and with those who still ate in the temples of the idols, meats offered to idols and such. It passed to the highest abstinence to abstain only from food eaten by the Gentiles. And if he says to the Romans, Let not him that eateth set at naught him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, he does not make fasting and fullness of equal merit, but he is speaking against those believers in Christ who were still Judaizing. And he warns Gentile believers not to offend those by their food who were still weak in faith. In brief, this is clear enough in the sequel. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean of itself, save that to him who counteth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of meat thy brother is grieved, thou walkest no longer in love. Destroy not with thy meat him for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, and that no one may suppose he is referring to fasting and not to Jewish superstition, he immediately explains, One man hath faith to eat all things, but he that is weak eateth herbs. And again, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Yet each man be fully assured in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that eateth eateth unto the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, unto the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For they who were still weak in faith, and thought some meats clean, some unclean, and supposed there was a difference between one day and another, for example, that the Sabbath and the new moons and the Feast of Tabernacles were holier than other days, were commanded to eat herbs which are indifferently partaken of by all. But such as were of stronger faith, believed all meats and all days to be alike. My opponent has dared to maintain that our Lord was called by the Pharisees a wine-bibber and a glutton, and from the fact of his going to marriage feasts and from his not despising the banquets of sinners. I am to infer his wishes respecting ourselves. That Lord, so you suppose, is a glutton who fasted forty days to hallow Christian fasting. 
who calls them blessed that hunger and thirst who says that he has food not that which the disciples surmise but such as would not perish for ever who forbids us to think of the morrow who though he is said to have hungered and thirsted and to have gone frequently to various meals except in celebrating the mystery whereby he represented his passion or in proving the reality of his body is nowhere described as ministering to his appetite who tells of purple-clad dives in hell for his feasting and says that poor lazarus for his abstinence was in abraham's bosom who when we fast bids us anoint our head and wash our face that we fast not to gain glory from men but praise from the lord who did indeed after his resurrection eat part of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb not to allay hunger and to gratify his palate but to show the reality of his own body for whenever he raised any one from the dead he ordered that food should be given him to eat lest the resurrection should be thought a delusion and this is why lazarus after the resurrection is described as being at the feast with our lord we do not deny that fish and other kinds of flesh if we choose may be taken as food but we prefer virginity to marriage so do we esteem fasting and spirituality above meats and full-bloodedness and if peter before dinner went to the supper chamber at the sixth hour a chance fit of hunger does not prejudice fasting for if it were so because our lord at the sixth hour sat weary on the well of samaria and wished to drink almost of necessity whether they so desire or not drink at that time possibly it was the sabbath or the lord's day and he hungered at the sixth hour after two or three days fasting for if i could never believe that the apostle if he had eaten a dinner only one day previous and had been blown out with a great meal would have been hungry by noon next day but if he did dine the day previous and was hungry next day before luncheon i do not think that a man who was so soon hungry ate until he was satisfied again god by the mouth of isaiah says what fast he did not choose in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and afflict the lowly you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness it is not such a fast that i have chosen saith the lord what kind he hath chosen he thus teaches deal thy bread to the hungry and bring the houseless poor into thy house when thou seest the naked cover him and hide not thyself from thine own flesh he did not therefore reject fasting but showed what he would have it to be for that bodily hunger is not pleasing to god which is made null and void by strife and plunder and lust if god does not desire fasting how is it that in leviticus he commands the whole people in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month to fast until the evening and threatens that he who does not afflict his soul shall die and be cut off from his people how is it that the graves of lust where the people fell in their devotion to flesh remain even to this day in the wilderness do we not read that the stupid people gorged themselves with quails until the wrath of god came upon them why was the man of god at whose prophecy the hand of jeroboam withered and who ate contrary to the command of god immediately smitten strange that the lion which left the ass safe and sound should not spare the prophet just risen from his meal he who while he was fasting had wrought miracles no sooner ate a meal than he paid the penalty for the gratification joel also cries aloud sanctify a fast proclaim a time of healing that it might appear that a fast is sanctified by other works and that a holy fast avails for the cure of skin moreover just as true virginity is not prejudiced by the counterfeit professions of the virgins of the devil so neither is true fasting by the periodic fast and perpetual abstinence from certain kinds of food on the part of the worshippers of isis and Sibele, particularly when a fast from bread is made up by feasting on flesh and just as the signs of moses were imitated by the signs of the egyptians which were in reality no signs at all for the rod of moses swallowed up the rods of the magicians so when the devil tries to be 
the rival of God, this does not prove that our religion is superstitious, but that we are negligent, since we refuse to do what even men of the world see clearly to be good. His fourth and last contention is that there are two classes, the sheep and the goats, the just and the unjust, that the just stand on the right and the other on the left, and that to the just the words are spoken, Come ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But that sinners are thus addressed, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. That a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, nor an evil tree good fruit. Hence it is that the Savior says to the Jews, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father it is your will to do. He quotes the parable of the ten virgins, the wise and the foolish, and shows that the five who had no oil remained outside, but that the other five who had gotten for themselves the light of good works went into the marriage with the bridegroom. He goes back to the flood and tells us that they who were righteous like Noah were saved, but that the sinners perished altogether. We are informed that among the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, no difference is made except between the two classes of the good and the bad. The righteous are delivered, the sinners are consumed by the same fire. There is no salvation for those who are released. One destruction for those who stayed behind. Lot's wife is a clear warning that we must not deviate a hair's breadth from right. If, however, he says, you object and ask me why the righteous toils in time of peace or in the midst of persecution, if he is to gain nothing nor have a greater reward, I would assert that he does this, not that he may gain a further reward, but that he may not lose what he has already received. In Egypt also, the ten plagues fell with equal violence upon all that sinned, and the same darkness hung over master and slave, noble and ignoble, the king and the people. Again, at the Red Sea, the righteous all passed over, the sinners were all overwhelmed. Six hundred thousand men, besides those who were unfit for war through age or sex, all alike fell in the desert, and two who were alike in righteousness are alike delivered. For forty years all Israel toiled and died alike. As regards food, an omer of manna was the measure for all ages. The clothes of all alike did not wear out. The hair of all alike did not grow, nor the beard increase. The shoes of all lasted the same time. Their feet grew not hard. The food in their mouths of all had the same taste. They went on their way to one resting place with equal toil and equal reward. All Hebrews had the same Passover, the same Feast of Tabernacles, the same Sabbath, the same new moons. In the seventh, the sabbatical year, all prisoners were released without distinction of persons, and in the year of Jubilee, all debts were forgiven to all debtors, and he who had sold lands returned to the inheritance of his fathers. Then again, as regards the parable of the sower in the gospel, we read that the good ground brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold and on the other hand, that the bad ground admitted of three degrees of sterility. But Juvenianius makes only two classes, the good soil and the bad. And as in the gospel, our Lord promises the apostles a hundredfold, and another sevenfold, for leaving children and wives, and in the world to come eternal life. And the seven and the hundred mean the same thing. So too in the passage before us, the numbers describing the fertility of the soil need not create any difficulty, particularly when the evangelist Mark gives the inverse order, thirty, sixty, and an hundred. The Lord says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. As then there are not varying degrees of Christ's presence in us, so neither are there degrees of our abiding in Christ. Everyone that loveth me will keep my word, and my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that is righteous loves Christ. And if a man thus loves, the Father and the Son come to him and make their abode with him. Now I suppose that when the guest is such as this, 
the host cannot possibly lack anything. And if our Lord says, in my Father's house are many mansions, his meaning is not that there are different mansions in the kingdom of heaven, but he indicates the number of the churches in the whole world. For though the church be sevenfold, she is but one. I go, he says, to prepare a place for you, not places. If this promise is particular to the twelve apostles, then Paul is shut out from that place, and the chosen vessel will be thought superfluous and unworthy. John and James, because they asked more than the others, did not obtain it. And yet their dignity is not diminished, because they were equal to the rest of the apostles. Know ye not that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost? A temple, he says, not temples, in order to show that God dwells in all alike. Neither for these only do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word. As thou, Father, in me, and I in thee are one, so they may be all one in us. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given unto them. I have loved them as thou hast loved me. And as we are, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God, so may they be one people in themselves. That is, like dear children, partakers of the divine nature. Call the church what you will, bride, sister, mother, her assembly is but one, and never lacks husband, brother, or son. Her faith is one, and she is not defiled by a variety of doctrine, nor divided by heresies. She continues a virgin. Whithersoever the Lamb goeth, she follows him. She alone knows the song of Christ. If you tell me, says he, that one star differeth from another star in glory, I reply that one star does differ from another star, that is, spiritual persons differ from carnal. We love all the members alike, and do not prefer the eye to the finger, nor the finger to the eye. But the loss of any one is attended by the sorrow of all the rest. We all alike come into this world, and we all alike depart from it. There is one atom of the earth, and another from heaven. The earthly atom is on the left hand, and will perish. The heavenly atom is on the right hand, and will be saved. He who says to his brother, Thou fool, and Raka, will be in danger of Gehenna, and the murderer and the adulterer will likewise be sent into Gehenna. In times of persecution, some are burnt, some are strangled, some beheaded, some flee, or die within the walls of a prison. The struggle varies in kind, but the victor's crown is won. No difference was made between the son who had never left his father and his brother who was welcomed as a returning penitent. To the laborers of the first, the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh, the same reward of a penny was given, and what may perhaps seem still more strange to you, the first to receive the reward were they who had toiled least in the vineyard. End of Book 2 Chapters 16-20 through 20. Book 2, chapters 21 through 25 of Against Jovinianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Who is there even of God's elect that would not be disturbed at these and similar passages of Holy Scripture, which our crafty opponent, with a perverse ingenuity, twists to the support of his own views? The Apostle John says that many antichrists had come, and to make no difference between John himself and the lowest penitent is the preaching of a real Antichrist. At the same time, I am amazed at the portentous forms which Giovianius, as slippery as a snake, and like another Proteus, so rapidly assumes. In sexual intercourse and full feeding, he is an Epicurean. In the distribution of rewards and punishments, he all at once becomes a Stoic. He exchanges Jerusalem for Citium, and Judea for Cyprus, Christ for Zeno. If we may not depart a hair's breadth from virtue, and all sins are equal, and a man who in a fit of hunger steals a piece of bread is no less guilty than he who slays a man, we must in turn be held guilty of the greatest crimes. The case is different if you say that you have no sin, not even the least. And if, although all the apostles and prophets and all the saints 
as I have maintained in dealing with the second proposition, bewail their sinfulness, you alone boast of your righteousness. But a minute ago you were barefooted. Now you not only wear shoes, but decorate ones. Just now you wore a rough coat and a dirty shirt. You were grimy and haggard, and your hand was horny with toil. Now you are clad in linen and silks, and strut like an exquisite in the fashions of the Atribates and the Laodiceans. Your cheeks are ruddy, your skin is sleek, your hair is smoothed down in front and behind. Your belly protrudes, your shoulders are little mountains, your neck full and so loaded with fat that the half-smothered words can scarce make their escape. Surely in such extremes of dress and mode of life there must be sin on the one side of the door or the other. I will not assert that the sin lies in the food or clothing, but that such fickleness in changing for the worse is almost censurable in itself. And what we censure is far removed from virtue, and what is far removed from virtue becomes the property of vice. And what is proved to be vicious is one with sin. Now sin, according to you, is placed on the left hand and corresponds to the goats. You must therefore return to your old habits if you are to be a sheep on the right hand, or if you perversely repent of your former views and change them for others, whether you like it or not, and although you shave off your beard, you will be reckoned among the goats. But what is the good of calling a one-eyed man old one eye, and of showing the inconstancy of an assailant, when we have to refute a whole series of statements, that the sheep and the goats on the right hand and on the left are the two classes of the righteous and the wicked, I do not deny. But a good tree does not bring forth evil fruit, nor an evil one good fruit, no one doubts. The ten virgins also, wise and foolish, we divide into good and bad. We are not ignorant that the deluge of the righteous were delivered, and sinners overwhelmed with the waters. That at Sodom and Gomorrah the just man was rescued while the sinners were consumed by fire is clear to everyone. We are also aware that Egypt was stricken with the ten plagues, and that Israel was saved. Even little children in our schools sing how the righteous passed through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh with his host was drowned. That six hundred thousand fell in the desert because they were unbelieving, and that two only entered the land of promise is taught by Scripture. And so is the rest of your description of the two classes, good and bad, down to the laborers in the vineyard. But what are we to think of your assertion, that because there is a division into good and bad, the good or the bad, it may be, are not distinguished one from another, and that it makes no difference whether one is a ram in the flock or a poor little sheep, whether the sheep have the first or the second fleece, whether the flock is diseased and covered with the scab, or full of life and vigor, especially when by the authoritative utterances of his own prophet Ezekiel, God clearly points out the difference between flock and flock of his rational sheep, saying, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, and between the rams and the he-goats, and between the fat cattle and the lean, because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder, and pushed all the diseased with your horns until they were scattered abroad, and that we might know what the cattle were, he immediately added, Ye my flock, the flock of my pasture are men. Will Paul and that penitent who had lain with his father's wife be on the equal, because the latter repented and was received into the church, and shall the offender, because he is with him on the right hand, shine with the same glory as the apostle? How is it that tares and wheat grow side by side in the same field until the harvest, that is, the end of the world? What is the significance of the good and bad fish being contained in the gospel net? Why in Noah's ark, the type of the church, are there different animals with different abodes according to their rank? Why standeth the queen upon the Lord's right hand in raiment of wrought gold, in a vesture of gold? Why had Joseph, representing Christ, a coat of many colors? Why does the Apostle say to the Romans, According as God had dealt to each man a measure of faith, for even as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we who are many are one body in Christ, 
and severally members one of another, and having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Or ministry, let us give ourselves to our ministry. Or he that teacheth to his teaching. Or he that exhorteth to his exhorting. He that giveth, let him do it with liberality. He that ruleth with diligence, and so on. And elsewhere, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. To the Corinthians he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And again elsewhere, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let each man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if any man buildeth on the foundation gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall reveal it, because it is revealed in fire, and the fire itself shall prove each man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide which he built thereon, he shall receive reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. If the man whose work is burnt and perishes is to suffer the loss of his labor, while he himself is saved, yet not without proof of fire, it follows that if a man's work remains which he has built upon the foundation, he will be saved without probation by fire, and consequently a difference is established between one degree of salvation and another. Again, in another place he says, Let a man so account of us, as of ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Here, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Would you be assured that between one steward and another there is a great difference? I am not speaking of bad and good, but of good themselves, who stand on the right. Then listen to the sequel. Know ye not that they which minister about the sacrifices eat of the sacrifices, and they which wait upon the altar have their portion with the altar? Even so did the Lord ordain that they which proclaim the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, and I wrote not these things that it may be so done in my case, for it were good for me rather to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. For woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this of mine own will, I have a reward. But if not of mine own will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel without charge, so as not to use the full my right in the gospel. For though I was free from all men, I brought myself under bondage to all, that I might gain the more. You surely cannot say that men commit sin by living by the gospel and partaking of the sacrifices. Of course not. The Lord himself made the rule that they who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But an apostle who does not abuse this freedom, but labors with his hands, that he may not be a burden to anyone, and toils night and day, and ministers to his companions, of course does this, that for his greater toil he may receive a greater reward. Let us hasten to what remains. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministrations, and the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God who worketh all things in all. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit to profit with all. And again, as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of the body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. But he precludes you from saying that the different members of the one body have the same rank. 
for he immediately describes the orders of the church and says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diverse kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But desire earnestly the greater gifts, and a still more excellent way show I unto you. And after discoursing more in detail of the graces of charity, he added, Whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And afterwards we read, But now abideth faith, hope, love. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Follow after love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And again, I would have that you all speak with tongues, but rather that ye should prophesy. And greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. And again, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Where there are different gifts, and one man is greater, another less, and all are called spiritual. They are all certainly sheep, and they stand on the right hand. But there is a difference between one sheep and another. It is humility that leads the Apostle Paul to say, I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not found vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. But the very fact of his thus humbling himself shows the possibility of there being apostles of higher or lower rank, and God is not unjust that he will forget the work of him who is called the chosen vessel of election, and who labored more abundantly than they all or assign equal rewards to unequal deserts. Afterwards we read, As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be now alive, but each in his own order. If each is to rise in his own order, it follows that those who rise are of different degrees of merit. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fishes. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For the one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Like a learned commentator, you have explained this passage by saying that the spiritual differ from the carnal. It follows that in heaven there will be both spiritual and carnal persons, and not only will the sheep climb thither, but your goats also. One star, he says, differeth from another star in glory. This is not the distinction of sheep and goat, but of sheep and sheep, star and star. Lastly, he says, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. But for this you might maintain that the phrase, one star from another star, covers the whole human race. But he introduces the sun and moon, and you cannot possibly reckon them among the goats. So, says he, is also the resurrection of the dead. The just will shine with the brightness of the sun, and those of the next rank will glow with the splendor of the moon. So that one will be a Lucifer, another an Arcturus a third in Orion, another Mazaruth, or some other of the stars whose names are hallowed in the book of Job. For we all, he says, must be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And you cannot say that the mode of our manifestation before the judgment seat of Christ it is such that the good receive good things, and the bad evil things. For he teacheth us in the same epistle, that he who soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully 
shall reap also bountifully. Surely he who sows more and he who sows less are both on the right side, and although they belong to the same class, that of the sower, yet they differ in respect of measure and number. The same Paul, writing to the Ephesians, says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. You observe that it is a varied and manifold wisdom of God which is spoken of as existing in the different ranks of the church. And in the same epistle we read, Unto each one of us was the grace given according to the measure of the grace of Christ. Not that Christ's measure varies, but only that so much of his grace is poured out as we can receive. In vain, therefore, do you multiply instances of sheep and goats, and of the five wise and of the five foolish virgins, of Egyptians and Israelites, and so forth, because retribution is not in the present, but will be in the future. Hence we find that the day of judgment is promised at the end of all things, because the judgment is not now. For it would be absurd to call the last day the day of judgment, if God were judging at the present time. Now we sail the ship, wrestle and fight, that at last we may reach the haven, be crowned in triumph. But you, with no less adroitness, and perversity make the life of this world illustrate that of the world to come although we know full well that here unrighteousness prevails they are righteousness until we go into the sanctuary of god and understand the end of those men the saint does not die one way the sinner another those who sail the same sea have the same calm and storm a violent death is not one thing to the robber another to the martyr Children are not born one way of adultery and prostitution, and another of pure marriage. Certainly our Lord and the robbers incurred the same penalty of crucifixion. If the judgment of this world and of that which is to come be the same, it follows that they who were here crucified side by side will also be esteemed of equal rank hereafter. Paul and they who bound him sailed together, endured the same storm, escaped together to the shore when the ship was broken with the waves. You cannot deny that the prisoner and the keepers were of unequal merit. And what were the circumstances of that same shipwreck of the apostle and the soldiers? The apostle Paul afterwards related a vision and said that they who were with him in the ship had been given to him by the Lord. Are we to suppose that he to whom they were given, and they who were given to him, were of one degree of merit. Ten righteous men can save a sinful city. Lot, together with his daughters, was delivered from the fire. His sons-in-law would also have been saved, had they been willing to leave the city. Now there was surely a great difference between Lot and his sons-in-law. One city out of the five. Zoar was saved, in a place which lay under the same sentence as Sodom and Gomorrah, Edma and Zeboim, was preserved by the prayers of a holy man. Lot and Zoar were of different merits, but both of them escaped the fire. The robbers who, in the absence of David, had laid waste Ziklag and made a prey of the wives and children of the inhabitants were slain on the third day in the field but forty men mounted on camels fled. Will you maintain that there were some difference between those who were slain and those who made good their escape? We read in the Gospel that the Tower of Siloam fell upon eighteen men who perished in the ruins. Certainly our Savior did not regard them as the only sinners, but they were punished to terrify the rest. It was like scourging a pestilent fellow to teach fools wisdom. If all sinners are punished alike, it is unjust for one to be slain, while another is admonished by his comrade's death. You raise the objection that all Israelites had the same measure of manna in Omer, and were alike in respect of dress and hair and beard and shoes, as though we did not all alike partake of the body of Christ. In the Christian mysteries, there is one means of sanctification for the master and the servant the noble and the low-born, for the king and his soldiers. 
and yet that which is one varies according to the merits of those who receive it. Whosoever shall eat or drink unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Does it follow that because Judas drank of the same cup as the rest of the apostles, that he and they are of equal merit? But suppose that we do not choose to receive the sacrament. At all events, we all have the same life, breathe the same air, have the same blood in our veins, are fed on the same food. Moreover, if our vivens are improved by culinary skill and are made more palatable for the, for the consumer, food of this kind does not satisfy nature, but tickles the appetite. We are all alike subject to hunger, all alike suffer with cold. We all alike are shriveled with the frost or melted with the broiling heat. The sun and the moon and all the company of the stars and showers the whole world run their course for us all alike. And as the gospel tells us, the same refreshing rain falls upon all, good and bad, just and unjust. If the present is a picture of the future, then the sun of righteousness will rise upon sinners as well as upon the righteous, upon the wicked and the holy, upon the heathen as well as upon Jews and Christians. Though the scripture says, Unto you that fear the Lord shall the Son of Righteousness arise. If he will rise to those that fear, he will set to the despisers and the false prophets. The sheep which stand on the right hand will be brought into the kingdom of heaven. The goats will be thrust down to hell. The parable does not contrast the sheep one with another, or on the other hand the goats, but merely makes a difference between sheep and goats. The whole truth is not taught in a single passage. We must always bear in mind the exact point of an illustration. For instance, the ten virgins are not examples of the whole human race, but of the careful and the slothful. The former are ever anticipating the advent of the Lord. The latter abandon themselves to idle slumber without a thought of the future judgment. And so at the end of the parable it is said, Watch, for ye know not the day nor the hour. If at the deluge Noah was delivered, and the whole world perished, all men were flesh, and therefore were destroyed. You must either say that the sons of Noah, and Noah, for whose sake they were delivered, were of unequal merit. You must place the accursed Ham in the same rank as his father, because he was delivered with him from the flood. At the passion of Christ, all wavered, all were unprofitable together. There was none that did good, no, not one. Will you therefore dare to say that Peter and the rest of the apostles who fled denied the Savior in the same sense as Caiaphas and the Pharisees and the people who cried out, Crucify him, crucify him? And to say no more about the apostles, do you think that Ananias and Caiaphas and Judas the traitor guilty of no greater crime than Pilate, who was compelled against his will to give sentence against our Lord. The guilt of Judas is proportioned to his former merit, and the greater the guilt, the greater the penalty too. For the mighty shall mightily suffer torment. An evil tree does not bear good fruit, nor a good tree evil fruit. If this be so, tell me how it was that Paul, though he was an evil tree and persecuted the church of Christ, afterwards bore good fruit. And Judas, though he was a good tree and wrought miracles like the other apostles, afterwards turned traitor and brought forth evil fruit. The truth is that a good tree does not bear evil fruit, nor an evil tree good fruit, as long as they continue in their goodness or badness. And if we read that every Hebrew keeps the same Passover, and that in the seventh year every prisoner is set free, and that at Jubilee that is, the fifteenth year, every possession returns to its owner. All this refers not to the present, but to the future. For being in bondage during the six days of this world, on the seventh day, the true and eternal Sabbath, we shall be free. At any rate, if we wish to be free while still in bondage in the world. If, however, we do not desire it, our ear will be bored in token of our disobedience. And together with our wives and children, whom we prefer to liberty, that is, with the flesh and its works, we shall be in perpetual slavery. End of Book 2, Chapters 21 through 25
Book Two, Chapters Twenty Six Through Thirty, of Against Juvenianius by Saint Jerome. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. As for the parable of the sower, which makes both good and bad ground bear a triple crop, and the passage from the Apostle in which Christ, as the foundation, one man builds gold, silver, costly stones, another wood, hay, stubble, the meaning is perfectly clear. We know that in a great house there are different vessels, and to wish to contradict so plain a truth would be sheer impudence. Yet that Jovinianius may not triumph in a lie and quote the instance of the apostles by way of discrediting the hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold, let me inform him that in Matthew and Mark a hundredfold is promised to the apostles who had left all. And I would tell him further that in the Gospel of Luke we find much more, that is, polypleona, and that there is absolutely no instance in the Gospels of a hundred standing for seven, and that he is convicted either of forgery or of ignorance, and that our cause is not prejudiced by the fact that in one gospel the enumeration begins at a hundred and another at thirty, since it is the rule with all scripture, and especially with the older writings, to put the lower number first and so ascend by degrees to the higher. For instance, suppose one to say that so and so lived five and seventy and an hundred years, it does not follow that five and seventy are more than a hundred because they were first mentioned. If you do not, on the side of good, admit the difference between a hundred, sixty, and thirty, neither will you do so on the side of evil. And the seed which fell by the wayside upon the rock and among the thorns will be equally faulty. But if the former three or the latter three on the side of good or on the side of evil respectively are one and the same, it was foolish instead of speaking of two things to enumerate six kinds. And all the more because according to the account of the parable in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Savior has always added, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Where there is no deeper inner meaning, it is useless to draw our attention to the mystic sense. If you give it your opinion that since the Father and the Son make their abode with the faithful, and since Christ is their guest, nothing is lacking, I suppose, however, that Christ's abiding with the Corinthians was one thing, with the Ephesians another. It was one thing, I say, for him to abide with those whom Paul blamed for many sins, another for him to dwell with those to whom the apostle revealed mysteries hidden from the beginning of the world, one thing for him to be in Titus and Timothy, another in Paul. Certainly amongst them that have been born of women, there is not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. But the term greater implies others who are less, and he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You see then that in heaven one is greatest and another is least, and that among the angels and the inv invisible creation there is a manifold and infinite diversity. Why do the apostles say, Lord, increase our faith, if there is one measure for all? And why did our Lord rebuke his disciples, saying, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? In Jeremiah also we read concerning the future kingdom, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. And soon after I will put my law in their inward parts, and in their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them. The context of this passage clearly shows that the prophet is describing the future kingdom, and how can there possibly be in it a least or greatest if all are to be equal? The secret is disclosed in the gospel. Whosoever shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and not do shall be least. The Savior taught us, at the feast to take the lowest place, lest when one greater than us came we should be thrust with disgrace from the higher place. If we cannot fall but only raise ourselves by penance, what is the meaning of the ladder at Bethel, on which the angels come from heaven to earth and descend as well as ascend? Surely while on that ladder they are reckoned among the sheep 
and stand on the right hand. There are angels who descended from heaven, but Jovinianius is sure that they retain their inheritance. But when Jovinianius supposes that the many mansions in our father's house are churches scattered throughout the world, who can refrain from laughing? Since scripture plainly teaches in John's gospel that our Lord was discoursing not of the number of the churches, but of the heavenly mansions and the eternal tabernacles for which the prophet longed. In my father's house, he says, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. The place and the mansions which Christ says he would prepare for the apostles are, of course, in the Father's house, that is, in the kingdom of heaven, not on earth, where for the present he was leading the apostles. But at the same time, regard must be had to the sense of Scripture. I might tell you, he says, that I go to prepare a place for you. If there were not many mansions in my Father's house, that is to say, if each individual did not prepare for himself a mansion through his own works rather than receive it through the bounty of God. The preparation is therefore not mine but yours. This view is supported by the fact that it profited Judas nothing to have a place prepared, since he lost it by his own fault. But we must interpret in the same way what our Lord says to the sons of Zebedee, one of whom wished to sit on his left hand and the other on his right. My cup indeed ye shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for them for whom it hath been prepared of my father. It is not the sons to give. How then is it the fathers to prepare? There are, he says, prepared in heaven many different mansions, destined for many different virtues, and they will be awarded not to persons, but to persons' works. In vain, therefore, do you ask of me what rests with yourselves, a reward which my father has prepared for those whose virtues will entitle them to rise to such dignity. Again, when he says, I will come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He is speaking especially to the apostles, concerning whom it is elsewhere written, that as I and thou, Father, are one, so they also may be one in us. Inasmuch as they have believed, have been perfected, and can say, the Lord is my portion. If, however, there are not many mansions, how is it taught in the Old Testament correspondingly with the New that the chief priest has one rank, the priests another, the Levites another, the doorkeepers another, the sacristans another? How is it that in the book of Ezekiel, where a description is given of the future church and of the heavenly Jerusalem, the priests who have sinned are degraded to the rank of sacristans and doorkeepers. And although they are in the temple of God, that is, on the right hand, they are not among the rams, but among the poorest of the sheep. How again is it that in the river which flows from the temple and replenishes the salt sea and gives new life to everything, we read that there are many kinds of fish, why do we read that in the kingdom of heaven there are archangels, angels, thrones, dominions, powers, cherubim, and seraphim, and every name which is named, not only in this present world, but also that which is to come? A difference of name is meaningless, where there is not difference of rank. An archangel is, of course, an archangel to other inferior angels, and powers and dominions have other spheres over which they exercise authority. This is what we find in heaven and in the administration of God. You must not therefore smile and sneer at us, as is your wont for making a graduated series of emperors, prefects and counts, tribunes and centurions, companies, and all the other steps in the service. It is mere trifling to quote the passage, Know ye not that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost? For it is customary in Holy Scripture to speak of a single object as though it were many, and of many as though it were one. And Jovinianius himself should know that even in a temple there are many divisions, the outer and the inner courts, the vestibules, the holy place, and the holy of holies. There is also in a temple kitchens, pantries, oil cellars, 
and cupboards for the vessels. And so in the temple of our body there are different degrees of merit. God does not dwell in all alike, nor does he impart himself to all in the same degree. A portion of the spirit of Moses was taken and given to the seventy elders. I suppose there is a difference between the abundance of the river and that of the rivulets. Elijah's spirit was given in a double measure to Elisha, and thus double grace wrought greater miracles. Elijah, while living, restored a dead man to life. Elisha, after death, did the same. Elijah invoked famine on the people. Elisha, in a single day, put the enemy's forces in the power of the city which they besieged. No doubt the words, Know ye not that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost, refer to the whole assembly of the faithful, who, joined together, make up the one body of Christ. But the question now is, who in the body is worthy to be the feet of Christ, and who the head? Who is his eye, and who is his hand? A distinction indicated by the two women in the gospel, the penitent and the holy woman, one of whom held his feet and the other his head. Some authorities, however, think there was only one woman, and that she who began at his feet gradually advanced to his head. Jovinianius further urges against us our Lord's words, I pray not for these only, but also for those who shall believe on me through their word, that as I, Father, in thee, and thou in me are one, so they all may be one in us. It reminds us that the whole Christian people is one in God, and as his well-beloved sons are partakers of the divine nature. We have already said, and the truth must now be inculcated, more in detail, that we are not one in the Father and the Son according to nature, but according to grace. For the essence of the human soul and the essence of God are not the same, as the Manichaeans constantly assert. But says our Lord, Thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see, then, that we are privileged to partake of his essence, not in the realm of nature, but of grace. And the reason why we are beloved of the Father is that he has loved the Son, and the members are loved, those namely of the body. For as many as received Christ, to them give he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word was made flesh, that we might pass from the flesh into the word. The word did not cease to be what it had been, nor did the human nature lose that which it was by birth. The glory was increased, the nature was not changed. Do you ask how we are made one body with Christ? Your Creator shall be your instructor. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he that eateth me, he also shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. But the evangelist John, who had drunk in wisdom from the breast of Christ, agrees herewith, and says, Hereby know we that we abide in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his Spirit. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abideth in him, and he in God. If you believe in Christ, as the apostles believed, you shall be made one body with them in Christ. But if it is rash for you to claim for yourself a faith in works like theirs, when you have not the same faith in works, you cannot have the same place. You repeat the words, Bride, Sister, Mother, and affirm that all these titles of the one church and names applied to all believers. The fact goes against you, for if the church admits but one rank and has not many members of one body, what necessity is there for calling her bride, sister, mother? It must be that she is the bride of some, the sister of others, the mother of others. All indeed stand on the right hand, but one stands as the bridegroom, another as a brother, a third as a son. My little children, says the apostle, of whom I am again in travail, until Christ be formed in you. Do you think that the children are being born, and the apostle who is in travail are of equal rank? And the folly of your contention, that we love all the members alike, and do not prefer the eye to the finger, nor the hand to the ear, 
but that if one be lost, all mourn, is proven by the lesson which the Apostle teaches the Corinthians. Some members are more honorable, others excite the sense of shame, and those parts to which shame attaches are clothed with more abundant honor, whereas our comely parts have no need of our care. Do you think that the mouth and the belly, the eyes and the outlets of the body, are to be classed together as of equal merit? The lamp of thy body, he says, is thine eye. If thine eye be blinded, thy whole body is in darkness. If you cut off a finger or the tip of the ear, there is indeed pain, but the loss is not so great, nor is the disfigurement attended by so much pain as it would be were you to take out the eyes, mutilate the nose, or saw through a bone. Some members we can dispense with and yet live, but others life is an impossibility. Some offenses are light, some heavy. It is one thing to owe ten thousand talents, another to owe a farthing. We shall have to give an account of the idle word, no less than of adultery. But it is not the same thing to be put back to the blush, and to be put upon the rack, to grow red in the face, and to ensure lasting torment. Do you think I am merely expressing my own views? Hear what the Apostle John says. He who knows that his brother sinneth a sin not unto death, let him ask, and he shall give him life, even to him that sinneth not unto death. But he that has sinned unto death, who shall pray for him? You observe that if we entreat for smaller offenses, we obtain pardon. If for greater ones, it is difficult to obtain our request, and that there is a great difference between sins. And so with respect to the people of Israel who had sinned a sin unto death, it is said to Jeremiah, Pray not thou for this people, neither entreat for them, and do not withstand me, for I will not hear thee. Moreover, if it be true that we all alike enter the world and all alike leave it, and this is the precedent for the world to come, it follows that whether righteous or sinners, we shall all be equally esteemed by God because the conditions of our birth and death are now the same. And if you contend that there are two atoms, the one of the earth and the other from heaven, and that they who are in the earthly atom stand on the left hand, those who were in the heavenly are on the right hand, before we go further, let me ask you a question concerning two brothers. Was Isu in the earthly atom or in the heavenly? No one doubts that you will reply, he was in the earthly in which was Jacob, without hesitation you will say, in the heavenly. Now then, was he in the heavenly when Christ had not yet come in the flesh, Christ who was called the second Adam from heaven? You must either reckon all before the incarnation of Christ in the old Adam, and even the just in the man from the earth, and then they will be on the left among your goats. Or, if it be impious to give Isaac the same place as Ishmael, Jacob as Esau, the saints as sinners, the last Adam will date from the time when Christ was born of a virgin, and your argument from the two Adams will not benefit your sheep and goats, because we have proved that in the first Adam there were both sheep and goats, and that of those who were in one and the same man, some stood on the right hand of God, others on the left. For from Adam, even until Moses, death reigned over all even over them that had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression. End of Book 2, Chapters 26 through 30 Book 2, Chapters 31 through 35 of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As regards your attempt to show that railings and murder, the use of the expression raka and adultery, the idle word and godlessness, are rewarded with the same punishment, I have already given you my reply, and I will now briefly repeat it. You must either deny that you are a sinner, if you are not to be in danger of Gehenna, or if you are a sinner, you will be sent to hell for even a slight offense. The mouth that lieth says one, kills the soul. I suspect that you, like other men, have occasionally told a lie, for all men are liars. 
that God alone may be true, and that he may be justified in his words, and may prevail when he judges. It follows either that you will not be a man, lest you be found a liar, or if you are a man, and consequently a liar, you will be punished with parricides and adulterers. For you admit no difference between sins, and the gratitude of those whom you raise from the mire and set on high will not equal the rage against you of those whom, for the trifling offenses of daily life, you have thrust into utter darkness. And if it be so that in the persecution one is stifled, another beheaded, another flees, or the fourth dies within the walls of a prison, and one crown of victory awaits various kinds of struggle, the fact tells in our favor. For in martyrdom it is the will which gives occasion to the death that is crowned. My duty is to resist the frenzy of the heathen, and not deny the Lord. It rests with them either to behead or to burn, or to shut up in prison, or enforce various other penalties. But if I escape and die in solitude, there will not at my death be the same crown for me as for them, because the confession of Christ will not have been to me as to them the cause of death. As for your remark that absolutely no difference was made between the brother who had always been with his father, and him who was afterwards welcomed as a penitent, I am willing to add, if you like, that the one drachma which was lost and was found was put with the others, and that the one sheep which the good shepherd, leaving the ninety-nine, sought and brought back, made up the full tale of the hundred. But it is one thing to be a penitent, and with tears sue for pardon, another to be always with the father. And so both the shepherd and the father say by the mouth of Ezekiel to the sheep that was carried back and to the son that was lost, and I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth evermore, because of thy shame. When I have forgiven thee all that thou hast done, that penitents may have their due, it is enough for them to feel shame instead of all other punishments. Hence, in another place it is said to them, Then shall ye remember your evil ways, and all the crimes wherewith ye were defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the wickedness that ye have done. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have done you good for my name's sake, and not according to your evil ways, nor according to your evil doings. The son, moreover, was reproved by his father for envying his brother's deliverance and for being tormented by jealousy while the angels in heaven were rejoicing. The parallel, however, is not to be drawn between the merits of the two sons, one of whom was temperate, the other a prodigal, and those of the whole human race, but the characters depicted are either Jews and Christians or saints and penitents. In the lifetime of Bishop Damascus, I dedicated to him a small treatise upon this parable. And if a penny was given to all the laborers, those of the first, the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh hours, and they came first for the reward who were the last to work in the vineyard, even here the persons described do not belong to one time or one age, but from the beginning of the world to the end of it, there are different calls, and a special meaning attaches to each. Abel and Seth were called at the first hour, Enoch and Noah at the third, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the sixth, Moses and the prophets at the ninth. At the eleventh, the Gentiles to whom the recompense was first given because they believed on the crucified Lord, and inasmuch as it was hard for them to believe, they earned a great reward. Many kings and prophets have desired to see the things that we see and have not seen them. But the one penny does not represent one reward, but one life and one deliverance from Gehenna. And as by the favor of the sovereign, those guilty of various crimes are released from prison, and each one according to his toil and exhortations is in this or that condition of life, so too the penny, as it were, by the favor of our sovereign, is the discharge from prison of all by baptism. Now our work is, according to our different virtues, 
to prepare for ourselves a different future. So far, I have replied to the separate portions of his argument. I shall now address myself to the general question. Our Lord says to his disciples, Whosoever would become great among you, let him be least of all. If we are all to be equal in heaven, in vain do we humble ourselves here that we may be greater there. Of the two debtors who owed, one five hundred pence, the other fifty, he to whom most was forgiven loved most. And so the Savior says, I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven her, for she had loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He who loves little has little forgiven. He will, of course, be of inferior rank. The householder, when he set out, delivered to his servants his goods. To one five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Just as in another gospel it is written that a noble man set out for a far country to receive for himself a kingdom in return, called the servants and gave them each a sum of money with which one gain ten pounds, another five, and they, each according to his ability, and the gain he had made, received ten or five cities. But one who had received a talent or a pound buried it in the ground or tied it up in a napkin and kept it until his master's return. Our first thought is that if, according to the modern Zeno, the righteous do not toil in hope of reward, but to avoid the loss of what they already have, he who buried his pound or talent, that he might not lose it, did no wrong. And the caution of him who kept his money is worthy of more praise than the fruitless toil of those who wore themselves out and yet received no reward for their labor. Then observe that the very talent which was taken from the timid or negligent servant was not given to him who had the smaller profit, but to him who had gained the most, that is, to him who had been placed over ten cities. If difference of rank is not constituted by the difference in number, why did our Lord say, He gave to every one according to his ability? If the gain of five talents and ten talents is the same, why were not ten cities given to him who gained the least, and five to him who gained the most? But that our Lord is not satisfied with what we have, but always desires more, he himself shows by saying, Wherefore didst thou not give my money to the money changers, that so when I came I might have received it with usury? The Apostle Paul understood this, and forgetting those things which were behind, reached forward to those things which were in front. That is, he made daily progress, and did not keep the grace given to him carefully wrapped up in a napkin. But his spirit, like the capital of a keen man of business, was renewed from day to day, and if he was not always growing larger, he thought himself growing less. Six cities of refuge are mentioned in the law, provided for fugitives who were involuntary homicides, and the cities themselves belong to the priests. I should like to ask whether you would put those fugitives among your goats or among our sheep. If they were goats, they would be slain like other homicides and would not enter the cities of God's ministers. If you say they were sheep, they will not possibly be such sheep as can enjoy full liberty and feed without fear of wolves. And it will be plain to you that sheep indeed they are, but wandering sheep, that they are on the right hand, but they do not stand there. They flee until the high priest dies and descending into hell liberates their souls. The Gibeonites met the children of Israel and... Although other nations were slaughtered, they were kept for hewers of wood and drawers of water, and of such value were they in God's eyes that the family of Saul was destroyed for the wrong done to them. Where would you put them? Among the goats? But they were not slain, and they were avenged by the determination of God. Among the sheep? But Holy Scripture says they were not of the same merit as the Israelites. You see then that they do indeed stand on the right hand, but are of a far inferior grade. Jonathan came between David the holy man and Saul, the worst of kings, 
and we can neither place him among the kids because he was worthy of a prophet's love nor amongst the rams lest we make him equal to david and particularly when we know that he was slain he will therefore be among the sheep but low down and just as in the case of david and jonathan you will be bound to recognize differences between sheep and sheep that servant which knew his lord's will and made not ready nor did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes but he that knew not and did things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes and to whomsoever much is given of him much shall be required and to whom they commit much of him will they ask the more lo more or less is committed to different servants and according to the nature of the trust as well as of the sin is the number of stripes inflicted the whole account of the land of judah and of the tribes is typical of the church in heaven let us read joshua the son of nun or the concluding portions of ezekiel and we shall see that the historical division of the land is related by the one finds a counterpart in the spiritual and heavenly promises of the other what is the meaning of the seven and eight steps in the description of the temple or again what significance attaches to the fact that in the psalter after being taught the mystic alphabet by the one hundred and eighteenth psalm we arrive by fifteen steps at the point where we can sing behold now bless the lord all ye servants of the lord ye who stand in the house of the lord in the courts of the house of our god why did two tribes and a half dwell on the other side of jordan a district abounding in cattle while the remaining nine tribes and a half either drove out the old inhabitants from their possessions or dwelt with them why did the tribe of levi receive no portion in the land but have the lord for their portion and how is it that of the priests and levites themselves the high priest alone entered the holy of holies where were the cherubim and the mercy seats why did the other priests wear linen raiment only and not have their clothing of wrought gold blue scarlet purple and fine cloth the priests and the levites of the lower order took care of the oxen and wains those of the higher order carried the ark of the lord on their shoulders if you do away with the gradations of the tabernacle the temple the church if to use a common military phrase all upon the right hand are to be up to the same standard bishops are to no purpose priests in vain deacons useless why do virgins persevere widows toil why do married women practice continence let us all sin and when once we have repented we shall be on the same footing as the apostles but now we have just sighted land the foaming billows have been rolling mountain high our ship has been borne aloft or has been rushed headlong into the depths beneath little by little the havens open to the view of the weary and exhausted sailors we have discussed the married widows and virgins we have preferred virginity to widowhood widowhood to marriage the passage of the apostles in which he treats questions of this kind has been expounded and particular objections have been met we also took a survey of secular literature and inquired what was thought of virgins and what of those who had one husband and by way of contrast we pointed out the cares which sometimes attend wedlock then we passed to the second division in which our opponent denies the possibility of sinning to those who have been baptized with complete faith and we showed that god alone is faultless and every creature is at fault not because all have sinned but because all may sin and those who stand have cause to fear when they see the fall of men like themselves in the third place we came to fasting and is so much as our opponent's argument fell under two heads and he appealed either to philosophy or to holy scripture we also furnished a several reply in the fourth that is in the last section the sheep and goats on the right hand and on the left the righteous and the wicked were distributed into two classes the intention being to show that there is no difference between one just man and another or between one sinner and another to prove the point juvenianius had accumulated countless instances from scripture which apparently favored his view 
and this contention re rebutted both by arguments and illustrations from Scripture, and pulverized Zeno's old opinion no less with common sense than with the words of inspiration. End of Book 2, Chapters 31 through 35book 2 chapters 36 through 38 of against jovinianus by saint jerome this librivox recording is in the public domain i must in conclusion say a few words to our modern epicurious wantonings in his gardens with his favorites of both sexes on your side are the fat and the sleek in their festal attire if i may mock like socrates add if you please all swine and dogs, and since you like flesh so well, vultures too, eagles, hawks, and owls, you shall never be afraid of the host of Aristippus. If ever I see a fine fellow, or a man who is no stranger to the curling irons, with his hair nicely done and his cheeks all aglow, he belongs to your herd, or rather grunts in concert with your pigs. To our flock belong the sad, the pale, the meanly clad, who like strangers in this world, though their tongues are silent, yet speak by their dress and bearing. Woe is me, they say, that my sojourning is prolonged, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar, that is to say, in the darkness of this world, for the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Boast not of having many disciples. The Son of God taught in Judea, and only twelve apostles followed him. I have trodden the winepress alone, he says, and of the peoples there was no man with me. At the Passion he was left alone, and even Peter's fidelity to him wavered. On the other hand, all the people applauded the doctrine of the Pharisees, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. That is, in effect, we follow vice, not virtue. Epicurus, not Christ. Jovinianus, not the Apostle Paul. If many assent to your views, that only indicates voluptuousness, for they do not so much approve of your utterances as favor their own vices. In our crowded thoroughfares, a false prophet may be seen any day, stick in hand, belaboring the fools about him, and knocking out the teeth of those who offend him. And yet he never lacks constant followers. And do you regard it as a mark of great wisdom if you have a following of many pigs, whom you are feeding to make pork for hell. Since you published your views and set the mark of your approval on baths in which the sexes bathe together, the impatience which once threw over burning lust the semblance of a robe of modesty has been laid bare and exposed. What was once hidden is now open to the gaze of all. You have revealed your disciples, such as they are, not made them, one result of your teaching is that sin is no longer even repented of. Your virgins whom, with a depth of wisdom never found before in speech or writing, you have taught the apostles' maxim that it is better to marry than to burn, have turned secret adulterers into acknowledged husbands. It was not the apostle, the chosen vessel, who gave this advice. It was Virgil's widow. She calls it wedlock. Thus she veils her fault. About four hundred years have passed since the preaching of Christ flashed upon the world, and during that time in which his robe has been torn by countless heresies, almost the whole body of error has been derived from the Chalcedonian, Syriac, and Greek languages. Basileides, the master of licentiousness and the grossest sensuality, after the lapse of so many years, and like the second Euphorbus, was changed by transmission into Jovian, so that the Latin tongue might have a heresy of its own. Was there no other province in the whole world to receive the gospel of pleasure, and into which the serpent might insinuate itself, except that which was founded by the teaching of Peter upon the rock of Christ? Idle temples had fallen before the standard of the cross and the severity of the gospel. Now, on the contrary, lust and gluttony endeavor to overthrow the solid structure of the cross. And so God says by Isaiah, O my people, they which bless you cause you to err and trouble the paths of your feet. 
Also by Jeremiah, flee out of the midst of Babylon, and save every man his life, and believe not the false prophets, which say, Peace, peace, and there is no peace, who are always repeating, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Thy prophets have seen for thee false and foolish things. They have not laid bare thine iniquity, that thy might call thee to repentance, who devour God's people like bread. They have not called upon God. Jeremiah announced the captivity and was stoned by the people. Hananiah, the son of Azur, broke the bars of wood for the present, but was preparing bars of iron for the future. False prophets always promise pleasant things and please for a time. Truth is bitter, and they who preach it are filled with bitterness. For with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth the Lord's Passover is kept, and it is eaten with bitter herbs. Admirable are your utterances, and worthy of the ears of the bride of Christ, standing in the midst of her virgins and widows and celibates. Their very name is derived from the fact that they who abstain from intercourse are fit for heaven. This is what you say, fast seldom, marry often. You cannot do the work of marriage unless you take mead and flesh and solid food. For lust strength is required. Flesh is soon spent and invenerated. You need not be afraid of fornication. He who has been once baptized into Christ cannot fall, for he has the consolation of marriage to shake his lust. And if you do fall, repentance will restore you. And you who were hypocrites at baptism may have a firm faith in your repentance. Be not disturbed by the thought of a difference between the righteous and the penitent, and do not imagine that pardon even gives a lower place. Rather believe that it takes away your crown. For there is one reward. He who stands on the right hand shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Through counsels such as these, your swine herds are richer than our shepherds, and the he-goats draw after them many of the other sex. They were as fed horses. They were mad after women. They no sooner see a woman than they nigh after her, and, shame to say, find scriptural authority for the consolation of their incontinence. But the very women, unhappy creatures, though they deserve no pity, who chant the words of their instructor, for what does God require of them but to become mothers, have lost not only their chastity but all sense of shame, and defend their licentious practices with an access of impudence. You have, moreover, in your army many subalterns. You have your guardsmen and your skirmishes at the outposts, the round-bellied, the well-dressed, the exquisites, and the noisy orators, to defend you with tooth and nail. The noble make way for you, the wealthy print kisses on your face, for unless you had come, the drunkard and the glutton could not have entered paradise. All honor to your virtue, or rather your vices. You have in your camp even Amazons with uncovered breasts, bare arms and knees, who challenge the men who come against them to a battle of lust. Your household is a large one, and so in your aviaries not only turtle doves, but hoopoes are fed, which may wing their flight over the whole field of rank debauchery. Pull me to pieces and scatter me to the winds. Tax me with what offenses you. Please, accuse me of luxurious and delicate living. You would like me better if I were guilty, for I should belong to your herd. But I will now address myself to you, great Rome, who, with the confession of Christ, have blotted out the blasphemy written on your forehead. Mighty city, mistress city of the world, city of the apostles' praise, show the meaning of your name. Rome is either strength in Greek or height in Hebrew. Lose not the excellence your name implies. Let virtue lift you up on high. Let not voluptuousness bring you low. By repentance, as the history of Nineveh proves, you may escape the curse wherewith the Savior threatened you in the Apocalypse. Beware of the name of Jovinianius. It is derived from that of an idol. The capital is in ruins. The temples of Jove with their ceremonies have perished. Why should his name and vices flourish now in the midst of you, when even in the time of Numa Pompilius 
even under the sway of kings, your ancestors give a heartier welcome to the self-restraint of Pythagoras than they did under the councils to the debauchery of Epicurus. End of Book 2 End of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome